Sin Publishing and Kim Mulliken bring you Broken. A Vigilante Series, Book Two. This story is being read to you by AI, which has come a long way. It's no replacement for a talented voice actor, but the book is coming to you free as an exclusive on YouTube. Should you prefer a talented voice actor, I encourage you to check out Blood and Fire from the Alpha and Omega series over on Audible. Now, for the story. I hope you enjoy this twisted web I've weaved. Chapter 2 When Miranda had called to tell me about Sylvia McDermott's hair in Mercy's spare room, my investigative mind took over. McDermott's body had never been recovered. Even if she died in the hospital as a result of someone else's actions, Mercy had markers. Jocelyn Nightwell, the acting director, folded her hands on her desk and stared at the top. She sat in silence pondering what I'd told her. Your request to open a case on Mercy Connell is denied. When I moved to voice an objection, the smoky brown eyes of an aging director glared at me. Look, I know you had a case die, but honestly, Murphy, this poor girl has suffered immensely. She's admitted to visiting with Sylvia McDermott in her hospital room. Nurses saw them sitting in bed together talking. This is a simple case of transference. A loose hair probably got stuck to her shirt. And a spare bedroom in a basement is hardly hidden, even if it is tucked away. Don't you think for a moment that perhaps the victim of such an attack would feel the need to hide every now and again? I wanted to scream. Imagine for a moment that we could watch a serial killer rise, that we could study them. Imagine how many deaths we could avoid. Denied. Now get on with catching people who have actually done something wrong. Leave Connell B. Unless and until local authorities suspect her in a violent crime that falls under our jurisdiction, you are to leave this woman alone. Am I clear? Stifling my frustration, I stood and gave her a firm nod. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your time. I could feel Jocelyn's eyes on me as I made my way out of her office. I thought I could sell it to her. She thought I was crazy. It had been worth a shot. Still, I had my eye on Mercy. Unofficially, of course. Sitting at my desk, I flipped through open case files. It was cold cases for me until something broke. My luck had never been this rotten. I'd always caught my man until Michelangelo, and even he evaded me. Maybe I'd lost my touch. My partner, Jack Shaw, came into my office and plopped in the spare chair. Nightwell didn't buy it? I shook my head avoiding eye contact. He hadn't been a fan of my theory, either. Shaw unbuttoned his suit jacket and leaned his elbows on his knees. So, what are you looking at, then? Cold cases. See if anything pops. Still not looking at him, I could tell he was trying hard to make eye contact. About the time I wondered how long he'd stare at me, he rose from the chair and headed toward the door. Well, you can stare at cold cases all you want. I'm headed to Maryland to see if our boy left any evidence this time. Our boy? Shaw? He looked over his shoulder and smiled. Wheels up in 30, unless dusty old cold cases are your new thing. Stopping for a moment and with an even bigger smile, he said, Oh, we're riding in style this time. Air Force Two made a pit stop to refuel and we can hitch a ride to D.C. A man that knows my heart. Closing my laptop, I shoved it in my briefcase and grabbed my overnight bag from the closet. In our line of work, we always had an overnight bag. Air Force Two meant no checking of guns, no long lines and chaotic airports. We'd get through private security with our credentials, pass through Secret Service and board all in under 10 minutes. As much as I hated flying, it was always a perk when we could take federal transportation over commercial. When we arrived at the airport... We were greeted by a Secret Service agent and led to their security. Our credentials were checked in a matter of seconds, and we made our way to the gate. Climbing up the steps, I paused at the top before ducking inside. Agencies were known to have rivalries, and not that I'd ever admit it to anyone, but I always admired Secret Service. The CIA had more cloak and dagger shit, but these guys... These guys would take the bullet. They'd step in front of their protectee every single time without fail. That took balls. You also never saw an out-of-shape agent among them, which wasn't bad on the eyes. Sitting in the equivalent of a high-end recliner, we strapped in just as they closed the doors. 
Unlike flying a commercial airliner, the door was closed and the plane immediately began moving. In less than five minutes, we were getting ready for takeoff. Man, this is the life, Shaw whispered. One of the SS came up and took a knee by us in the aisle. His dark hair was buzzed short. The pin on his lapel told me he was part of the presidential detail. Special Agents Shaw and Morgan, I'm Agent Whitaker. We're happy to give you folks a lift to D.C., but I'd like to remind you that anything you see or hear on this flight is confidential and not to be shared outside of this vessel. Are we clear? Shaw laughed. See no evil. Got it. Whitaker didn't laugh. Crystal clear, sir. Shaw offered in a much more serious tone. The agent spun on his knee and took the seat closest to him, buckling in just as we began picking up speed. We climbed quickly until reaching cruising altitude when everyone began moving around the plane. It was then I realized why the speech. Two men, spitting images of the president and vice president, were both on the plane. Their body doubles. It had to be since both weren't supposed to be in the same place at the same time for security measures. Uh, so now that we've got some time, give me what you know. Shaw unlatched his seatbelt and turned slightly to face me. Victim is male, 45. Local parents suspected him of being a child molester. The cyber crimes unit in Maryland said they'd been watching him on the dark web. He was into child porn, maybe even producing it, but they could never pinpoint his location. Our boy found him, it seems, and went back to work after his extended vacation. Posed? In only the way Michelangelo can pose a corpse. Shaw's brows twisted. That part always seemed to get to him. He filled me in on all the intel he could gather from local authorities. Cheryl Arthur, the medical examiner, was expecting us. The body was transported to the morgue, the scene preserved. Once we landed in D.C., we grabbed an SUV from the D.C. office and headed to Maryland. They loaded him on a board and brought him in. I've never seen anything like it. The Harford County Medical Examiner led us to the room. The victim was on a table, still posing. Eyes had already washed out and the body was leaking fluids. You'll send me the results of toxicology? I asked as I handed her my card. Of course. All of the wounds are post-mortem, but I gather that's your killer's standard M.O. from reading what your partner sent. Shaw nodded as he tried to hold his breath. The M.E. closed her eyes. Look, I know this is your department, but can I give you my opinion? Ma'am? I'm willing to listen to anything you have to say, no matter how large or how insignificant. We will follow every lead. Shaw gagged and covered the lower half of his face with his hand. Sorry, it's the smell. She waved it off. There isn't any violence in the actual killing. Have your people considered that? There's enough violence in the aftermath, I answered. True, but my second PhD was in criminal psychology. What I'm seeing here isn't violent. The assailant kills quickly and without mess. There's a mess with creating this image, and it's meant to be gruesome. But posing them like this is meant to humiliate them. I'd say your killer doesn't actually enjoy the killing at all. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't watch. I'm testing for passive methods like cyanide, though it's so hard to detect. She cleared her throat. These bodies are violated, but not sexually. It might be reverse psychology, but I'd bet my license that your killer has been sexually molested, and that might be the motive here. I stepped closer to the body, looking at the wires wrapped around the fingers. He definitely takes his time. He? Cheryl asked. Why he? Most of the victims are larger men. Most women wouldn't be able to maneuver that much dead weight around. The profile also said it was most likely a male, between the ages of 30 and 40. The profilers were generally right on the money. I mean, no disrespect, but this killing, this has a woman's touch all over it. Shaw finally removed his hand from his mouth. You're the first one with a hypothesis. We're listening. Poor Shaw's face was green. Cheryl turned her back to us and walked over to the wall and pulled out three drawers. Look at these three bodies. What can you tell me? Two women and one man lay in cooling drawers. None had any visible marks. All three were gray and dead. What are you trying to show us? I asked. These two women, suicides. The first, pills. The second? She flipped the sheet down to show wrists that had been sewn shut. 
cut her wrists in the tub to prevent making a mess in the house. The man was killed by his wife, allegedly, of course, with poison. Women are neat killers. They neatly kill themselves and others, even when emotional. That's not always the case, of course. Take Lizzie Borden, for example. She was violent and messy, but was emotionally tied to the victims and their alleged abuse. We've seen women kill in very grotesque ways. Emotional reactions. But the everyday deaths, these are traits. You're too used to violent crimes, respectfully. As I said, this is only my opinion. Take it for what it's worth, but you should broaden your search. Cheryl Arthur closed the drawers and looked at the floor. Shaw stepped forward and extended his hand. Thank you for your input. We really do rely on people like you to help solve these cases. It's not impossible that we've gotten tunnel vision. Shaw was always good with people. What we need in the worst way is forensic evidence. Our killer has been very clean, leaving no DNA evidence whatsoever, not so much as a hair. So if you find anything, no matter how small, please let us know. I want to put this person behind bars so the killing stops. She shook her head. Well, he or she is exposing themselves to a lot of pathogens. Our victim here looks like he has gonorrhea. The testicles are swollen and there are sores in his throat. She opened her file and looked at the page on top. Cyanide is dangerous stuff. If the killer is using it, they are exposing themselves as well. It can be inhaled, soaked in through the skin, or ingested. Playing with cyanide is playing with fire. My partner had his hand on his chin this time in concentration. No one has mentioned cyanide before. Isn't it difficult to detect? Cheryl smiled at him and nodded. Very good. Most people don't know, but it burns up in the body quickly. According to what you sent me, your victims are found more than a day after death. It would explain why cause of death has been so hard to determine for the other examiners. That was Richard Kuklinski's favorite method of death. He said it was quick, quiet, and made less of a mess. I made a mental note to look up his old file. Certain psychosis can be passed on to children. Was it possible his offspring was following in their father or grandfather's footsteps? The M.E. agreed to send all photos and evidence to us. Shaw and I went to the crime scene, a mid-sized house at the edge of a neighborhood. We questioned neighbors, and no one saw or heard anything. None of them were sad he was gone either, as there were allegations of him luring children to his house. Inside the house, deep in the basement, was a room with a bed. While there were no dressers or other items usually found inside a bedroom, there was studio lighting and a tripod set up. The camera and any evidence had already been collected by police. We ventured up to the main bedroom where the body was found. The scene familiar to us had to have shocked the locals. Wires were still attached to the wall, ceiling, and headboard where the body was anchored in its unnatural pose. I shook my head. They cut the wires. They didn't even bother to pull the nails which potentially contain evidence. Shaw patted my shoulder. The place is being guarded, Murph. I'm sure their CSI team will be back. I looked at the uniform who was our escort. Call them. Tell them we found some evidence. He rolled his eyes as he called it in. Shaw looked around, moving items with his gloved hands. While I looked closely at the bed, the bed where Michelangelo had to have crawled around, I caught a glimpse of Shaw staring closely at the wall. Hey, Murph. Bring your eyes over here. What you got? I asked as I approached. Seems our boy is a little rusty. He turned to me and smiled as he pointed to the nail driven into the wall. That's not just fibers. That's a chunk of glove. I could feel my eyes widen. Merry Christmas to us. When CSI arrived, we showed them the nail. They carefully pulled it and bagged it along with the small chunk of glove. Then they pulled the others, carefully bagging and tagging all of them. Leaning into my partner, I whispered, Please, please remind them of chain of custody. He nodded and wandered over to the team, chatting them up. This is a real break for us. First real forensic evidence. We were so relieved when the central office told us how diligent you all are with chain of custody. It's a real load off our backs. It's so much harder in smaller towns where law enforcement doesn't receive the kind of training you do. His winning smile and demeanor won them over. We're just doing our job, one of them said. It's nice to get some recognition. Thanks, man.
The other smiled and went to double-checking all of the evidence bags. Happily, I called Nightwell to give her an update. Excellent work. I look forward to speaking with you once forensics gives you their analysis. See you back in Milwaukee. With that, she ended the call. For her to give any compliment was a real feat. Maybe she was just relieved there was any break at all in this case. Five years and counting we'd been trying to nail Michelangelo. Five years of torment, two acting directors, and a lot of missed sleep. Hopefully, we could make some headway. Shaw found us a hotel for the night and began trying to find us a flight home while I drove to the small bed and breakfast he booked. I could not have been happier how my day ended. For chapter 3 Freddy had left the very next morning, as she suspected. While he was always himself around her, it was like he couldn't wait to get away. She knew it had to be hard for him, never knowing her mental state. That was okay. He earned the right to be nervous, and given that she told him her plans, she wouldn't want to stick around if it were her, either. She'd made a deal with the devil before she left Chicago. She remembered a client who was as dirty as they came, but always managed to keep clean hands, Tommy Mitrione. He sounded surprised to hear from her, but agreed to a private meeting. A sane person would have been nervous. A normal person would have been scared. She was just determined. They met at his office where he kicked out his gun-toting goons. He sat at a desk like he was running some legitimate business and leaned forward, stroking his red beard. It's good to see you doing so well, Mercy. Jones was worried sick about you. A million questions ran through her mind, but her curiosity why Bill would have confided in a client would have to wait. With a smile and a nod, she only said, Thank you. Which leaves me wondering what you wanted to discuss with me. Protection, maybe? A piece? No. I don't need any help in that department. What I'm here to ask is if you could be my middleman. I need someone who knows how to keep his mouth shut, and we both know you're the business-minded guy for the job. Other than some sweaty palms, she was calm and collected. Drugs? He asked as he scowled. I'm not getting my lawyer's paralegal drugs, Mercy. That's just bad business. I don't need drugs. I need work, wet work, but I'm only interested... Oh, I'm he interrupted. You're shitting me. What do you know about... Hang on, how do I know you're not wired? This she was prepared for. She'd run over every single scenario in her head, and she had the best answer. She stood from the chair and lifted her shirt, exposing herself to him. Only a thin veil of silk bra concealed what was below. Then she lowered her shirt, unbuttoned her pants, and dropped them. No wires, no bullshit. Can I continue? She asked as she pulled her pants up. He leaned back in his chair and stared at her hard as he clenched his jaw. Again, what do you know about wet work? Six grueling months of training in hand-to-hand -hand combat, weapons training, and tracking. Mitrione laughed for a moment. When she didn't smile, didn't budge, he called in one of his men. The guy was about 220 pounds and about six foot tall. Joey, pull out your gun. The goon did as asked, pulling his sig out of its holster. Switch the safety off and aim it at Ms. Connell here, but don't shoot her. Yet. Mercy remained calm and in her seat. Really? Tommy leaned forward again, resting his elbows on the desk. Disarm him and I'll do your dirty work for you. And if I hurt him? Joey and Tommy both laughed. Mercy shrugged. It's an honest question, sir. I'm assuming there's a price for him. Yeah? I mean, he is of some value. Are you going to get pissed at me if he's hurt? He stopped laughing. You got balls, girl. I'm just trying to decide if you're crazy. But no, I doubt you could do any damage, but if you do, I'll get over it. Joe, you worried? Nah, sir. I'm fine. Slowly, she stood from her chair and faced him. The gun was about three inches from her chest. She grabbed the gun, wedging her finger under the trigger so he couldn't fire, and twisted it out while shoving his chin upward with her other hand and sweeping her ankle behind his knee. Instantly, he dropped to the ground. She had the gun in her hand, clicking the safety on as she wedged his arm behind him, forcing his face to the floor. With her knee in the small of his back, his arm twisted straight behind him, she aimed the gun at the back of his head. 
The whole exchange took two and a half seconds. She knew this because Rose timed her multiple times in practice. Holy fucking shit. Tommy's hands were on his head. You learned that in six months? That was month one. Now that you know I'm serious, can I let your guy up? He nodded. She dropped the clip out of the gun, unchambered the round, and lifted her weight off of Joey's lumbar. When he got to his knees, she handed him the gun and calmly reclaimed her seat. Tommy waved him out of the room. When the door closed, he folded his hands in front of him. She folded her hands in her lap. As I was saying, I'm only interested in taking a certain kind of case. Can you find those for me? Well, darling, I need you to be more specific. Revenge killing mostly, but I only want the dirt bags. None of your dirt bags, of course. Rapists, pedophiles, abusers, the type that always get away with it. If there's a bounty, then it's mine. If that's not clear enough, I want to get paid for killing bad guys. I'm not interested in bumping off someone's spouse for insurance, revenge over affairs, or shit like that. Preferably outside of the state. She had his attention. She could almost smell the smoke as the wheels inside his brain churned. I get 20% of anything I find, and 10% of anything you find on your own. We tend to work in cash, but some of the bounties can get quite large. I'm assuming a smart girl like yourself knows a little something about Swiss bank accounts. Of course. And I want to know where you acquired your skills. I cannot fulfill that request. <clears throat> if those are your conditions, I'll have to find someone else. He once again leaned back in his chair and stroked his beard. You can't or won't tell me. Oh, I can tell you. But the people who trained me are a whole lot better at this than I am. They'll kill me, then they'll kill you. They don't want this out there. Secrecy is survival. But even if that weren't the case, they took me in, sir. They didn't have to do that. They trusted me. I'll take their identities and locations with me to the grave, and before you ask, I am prepared to be tortured for such information. So let's not even broach that subject. Now, 20% is fair. But why the 10 on the backside? Because I'm the bad guy, dear. Your 10% fee to me is to keep our partnership going even if you venture out on your own. That's how I work with everyone. You need me, now. You may not after a while. Then there goes my income. He turned in his chair and grabbed two rocks glasses and a decanter of yellow liquid. He poured two drinks, just barely a finger in depth. He slid one glass to her and picked the other up for himself. This is usually the part where I remind the person in that chair that I'm the boss. She smiled at him and tried to ignore the whooshing sound in her ears. Her other personality was jumping for joy and wanted out. She fought to keep her contained. It was important to integrate, and she couldn't allow one side to take over. But you understand in this dynamic, we're each the boss. You handle your end, I'll handle mine. I'm not taking cases I don't want. Like I said... Usually that's where this conversation goes. But I'll tell you what, little lady. I'm actually interested in seeing this to fruition. I like your passion. Hell, I've always fancied you, truth be told. You've always treated me with respect. So I'm going to give that back to you now. Do we have a deal? She leaned forward, tapped her glass to his. Deal. The fire burned down her throat and warmed her belly. It wasn't until she was back in her old Honda that she gasped for air. But that was then. The Honda was traded in for a Jeep Patriot 4 Erx 4. Mercy now lived in Alabama. With her network set up and the burner phone charged, she sent a message to Tommy. We're live. She started the day driving the casserole dishes back to her neighbors and thanking them. When she reached the Jennings property, she spotted the wife sitting in her wheelchair on the porch. She carried the heavy dish with her. Good morning, Mrs. Jennings. I brought your dish back. She smiled. Oh, honey, can you just put it in the kitchen for me? It's hard getting over the threshold. Mercy reluctantly entered the stranger's home. It was clear almost immediately that the elderly couple was having a hard time caring for their property. Clean dishes had piled up everywhere. The house was clean, just cluttered. Mrs. Jennings, she said as she headed back toward the door. I have an idea. The old woman turned her wheelchair. Well, it seems to me that a woman stuck in a chair would have a hard time reaching the upper cabinets. Can I help you move some things around in your kitchen to make it easier? 
Her eyes widened. Move things in what way, dear? Well, we could put your everyday dishes in the bottom cabinets. The things you rarely use could go in the upper cabinets. That way you have some room in your kitchen. It has to have you barking mad to have so much clutter. Her hand shook as she reached out. You would help? Mercy smiled and took her hands. I'd be happy to, but only if it's okay. Tears streamed down her face. It's so hard keeping a nice home in this chair, Gamay. Now don't you go and cry on me, or I'll start to cry too. Now let's go see if we can make this kitchen work for you. She pushed the woman slowly into the kitchen and parked her chair at the entrance. She opened the first cabinet and began pulling out large bowls and things that looked like they were from the 50s. Then she cleared one of the top cabinets, wiping each clean before moving the dishes between them. See, we can use the top shelf of the lower cabinet so it's easy to reach without you falling from your chair. Your husband can help you get the less frequently used things from the top when needed. She showed her where everything was going and hoped she'd remember. After two hours, the whole kitchen was cleaned and reorganized. You're such a sweet girl, thank you. Mrs. Jennings began to cry again. They're happy tears, don't worry, but my house was never cluttered before. Mercy felt a lump in her throat. Well, if they're happy tears, you just let them roll on down that pretty face. May I hug you? She held her arms out and embraced Mercy. You're a good girl, thank you. The feeling of total elation blanketed her as she climbed in her jeep and pulled away. Looking at her map, she found the property of the McCoy family and giggled, wondering if the Hatfields lived close by. When they dropped off the casserole, they claimed they lived up the road, as all the others had. Up the road was a five-mile jaunt. She pulled in and looked around. The old farmhouse was in need of some paint and repairs, but was kept clutter-free. Pulling the dish marked McCoy from the box, she opened her door and started walking toward the house. Paul McCoy opened the door and greeted her with a shotgun. I surrender, she said with a laugh. Betty, the new girl is here. He yelled into the house as he lowered his gun. Sorry, darling. We weren't expecting no company. Oh, that's all right, she said as she waved her hand. I just wanted to be sure I returned your dish before I forgot which one belonged to who. It's such a pretty dish. I'm sure your wife wants it back. Betty McCoy came to the door drying her hands on a dish towel. Oh, heavens, you ate the whole thing already. Mercy offered her a soft smile. No, ma'am, but I wanted to be sure I brought your dish back to you before it got damaged, or I forgot who it belonged to. Everyone has been so nice, I had five casseroles and three pies to eat. She tucked a loose strand of blonde hair behind her ear and grabbed the dish. Would you like to come in for some tea? While it wasn't on her list of desires, today was about making friends with the locals. That sounds nice. Thank you. As she followed the couple in, she noticed toys and books about the house. The home was a little outdated, but clean. Once they reached the kitchen, Betty filled the glasses with iced tea and offered her a seat on the back porch. Mercy sipped the tea and looked out over the back porch. The swing set looked old and withered. How old are your kids? Betty smiled as she looked at her yard. Well, Katie is 18. She's going to school in Tennessee. Bobby is 12, but that boy is an old soul, I tell you. Paul Jr. is only six. He was a surprise, but we're delighted to have him. He's smart and outgoing like Katty. You got kids? No, ma'am. I was pregnant once, though. She had no idea why she'd made that confession, so she looked down at her tea to gather herself. Betty was quiet for a moment. No matter. You're young enough. Kids ain't for everyone either. It'll knock the wind right out of you. She smiled. And forget sleep. Don't get sleep with a house full of children running around. For the first time, words had evaded her. Honey, I'm sorry for asking. The fine lines next to her eyes became more pronounced. No, I'm sorry. I haven't thought much about losing that baby. It just sort of hit me. I don't know why I told you that. Betty leaned forward in her chair. Happens to me all the time. People just tell me things. Is that why you moved down here? She shook her head. Chicago is a very violent city. I was looking for some peace and quiet. 
Now, now I understand. Don't you worry about a thing. We look after each other in these parts and don't tolerate nonsense. Hell, we still keep our doors unlocked and a shotgun in our truck. You fool around down here, you'll get an ass full of lid. Mercy laughed as Betty winked at her. So I found the perfect place? I think it's what you city folk call an oxymoron. See, Katie is giving me vocabulary lessons. Says she wants her mama to sound smart. Anyway, we stick to ourselves, but we also are neighborly. Make sense? Mind our own business, but help when you can. That's how it is and always has been. She knew this already, which is why she chose the South. Sounds lovely. I was worried people would think I was waltzing in here and tossing my weight around when I filed for the grant to bring you internet access. I just needed it to earn my living, but thought it could benefit everyone. The chair creaked as Betty leaned back. Well, girl, that's the kind of meddling we'll tolerate any day of the week. You got the federal damn government to pony up the dough to get that fiber cable up here. Now my kids got help with their homework. I can see my sister's face on the chat thing. She lives up in Wyoming, and I haven't seen her in almost ten years. That helped a lot of folks out. Gave jobs to our utility workers. That ain't gonna earn you enemies. The fiber optic cable is state-of-the-art technology. It won't be outdated for a long time. I'm just glad to help. And I thank you for the tea, but I have to go check on my girls. Her brows furrowed and she crossed her arms over her chest. Thought you didn't have kids. Mercy gave her a shrug and a smile. My dogs are my kids, I guess. Betty laughed. That they are. Noisy, messy, and full of beans. It was good to see you. Feel free to stop at the bar in town and I'll buy you a drink. The bar? Which bar? What's it by? Honey, it's the only bar in the square. Red door. Can't miss it. Says Betty's in red letters. With a wink, she walked around the front of the house to find Paul looking at her Jeep. You like this thing? Paul asked as he kicked the tire. Mercy slowed her pace as she approached. American made all-wheel drive and good on gas. There's room for my dogs in the back, too. So far, I like it. Traded in an old Honda for it. Best decision I ever made. Paul put his hands on his hips. It's small like a car. But I see you got you receiving in the back. I can tow about 2,000 with it. Nothing big, firewood, a small camper. Suits me just fine. Jeep makes bigger SUVs, but I didn't really need anything bigger. He walked around and peeked in the back window. Well, you can fit a deer or two back here, so it'd work for me. Don't really need the truck if I got me a 4x4. Four four. Mercy opened the door. Look at this. You can make it a two-wheel drive by turning this knob here, and it'll save you on gas and tires. No kidding? Nope. When it rains, I turn on the other two wheels to get through the mud. Works great. Men were so much harder to reach than women. A simple kind gesture went a long way with women. Men needed favors, connections. That was hard to do while being a young, unmarried woman. They've come a long way with crossovers, too. Dodge and Ford have their own versions of small SUVs and crossovers with the same features. Unless you need that truck bed, you can size down and still have room for the kids. Hey, I'm holding you up. Thanks for the peek inside. He turned and headed toward the house. Mercy climbed in and backed out of the driveway. She managed to return all of the dishes by dinner time and made her way home. After reheating some leftovers, she decided to see Betty at her bar, perhaps make friends with more locals. The more they saw her, the more she'd be part of the community. She put on a pair of jeans and sneakers, a baggy shirt, and tied her hair back. She didn't want to look like the town skank. After mapping out her route, she headed to town. It took twenty minutes to get from her house to a small town square. There was Betty's bar, just as it had been described. When she opened the red door, she was a little surprised to see a 50s diner-inspired bar. Betty was behind the bar wiping it down. Her hair was tied in a high ponytail, and her uniform was a pink-fitted t-shirt with black lapels. In the center of her chest was a large black B. Mercy, what'll you have? Is that a real soda fountain? Betty grinned as she patted the top. Sure is. This is little Betty, my prized possession. I'll have anything you can make me from that? Hmm, city slicker doesn't come in and order a martini to be fancy, or a beer to fit in. 
She goes full-blown teenager and wants a fountain soda. Yep, I like you. She squirted syrup in the bottom of a glass, then filled it with Coke and floated a maraschino cherry on top. There you go, a cherry Coke. And if you want the adult version, I'll just splash some Dizzerano in there. After Mercy gave her a playful nod, Betty dropped a shot glass full of liquor into the drink. When Mercy took a sip, she was shocked not to taste alcohol. That's dangerous. Who is this? A man about 40 with salt and pepper hair sat next to Mercy. She's too smart for you, Wayne. Betty slid a glass of draft beer to him. Best just look the other way. She winked at Mercy. Paul came from the back carrying plates of food. When she realized they worked together, it warmed her heart. How nice to be able to spend the time together. But who watched the kids? So you're the Yankee everyone is talking about. It was a man's voice behind her, and it didn't sound friendly. Mercy plastered a smile on her face, gritted her teeth, and spun in her chair. Yankees are from New York. Well, this ain't New York, and we don't take kindly to Yankees stealing our property. Bert, just leave the girl alone. It was Wayne trying to defend her honor, as if she needed it. Bert, is it? Well, Bert, what exactly do you think I stole? That property don't belong to you. You can't just come in and buy up people's things. His voice was raised. His face reddened. I bought something for sale. I don't see how that's stealing. Paul grabbed the guy by the collar. Time to go home, Bert. You know we don't tolerate harassing the guests. He pointed at her as Paul hauled him away. City girl, I ain't done with you. Not by a long shot. Mercy turned in her chair, feeling defeated. She didn't want or need any enemies. Don't mind him, doll. His family was trying to buy that place, and you beat him to it is all. He's an idiot that thinks there's treasure there. She couldn't help herself and let out a giggle. Treasure? Wayne rolled his eyes. Yeah, he's just an idiot. Trying to shake the nasty feeling the guy had given her, she tried to enjoy her drink. Betty was preoccupied with guests. What was she thinking? This was a bad idea. Are you... Mercy? A young woman stood next to her, holding a tablet computer. Yeah. Thanks to you, I've enrolled in classes online. I couldn't afford to move away to college, but now I can take classes from home. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Finally, a friendly face. This just came in the mail today. I start at the beginning of the month. I can't tell you what this means. I can study and do my online classes while my little girl sleeps. I don't have to leave her with anyone while I drive a hundred miles to the community college. I just... I can't tell you how this is going to change our lives. She sniffed and looked down at her tablet. Thank you a million times. Others came over and started shaking her hand and introducing themselves. A woman told her to come to the garden center and pick out heirloom tomato plants on the house. Another invited her to a bakery for fresh bread. So what made you move here? She shrugged. Peace and quiet. Chicago has gotten so bad, you know? I heard on the news. There's a lot of crime there. Betty chimed in. Mercy nodded and smiled at her warm, friendly face. She was feeling welcomed again. After a second drink, she figured she'd better get home, so she left a hefty tip and headed out to her jeep. Get off me, a woman screamed. It was the woman who had the tablet, who was getting ready for school. Come on, baby. A larger man was holding on to her, trying to force her into a car. The woman tried to get free and started to yell. When she did, he punched her in the face. She began to fall and he caught her. He started to put her in the car. Hey, stop! Mercy yelled as she ran toward him. Mind your own business! I gotta get her home! She was now within striking distance and noticed something peculiar about the car. It had no passenger seat. Ted fucking Bundy's copycat killer? It had been all over the news lately. I don't think so. Mercy kicked the door closed. Mr. Charming dropped the young woman hard on the concrete. You want some of this? When he swung on her, she blocked the punch, locking his arm between her arm and her ribcage, and spun, 
slamming him into the adjacent car. When he hit, she kidney-punched him, weakening his knees and, for the final blow, an elbow to the spine between the shoulder blades. When he went face down on the concrete, she secured his arm behind his back and put all of her weight on his lumbar. A couple came out of the bar. Hey, hey, you, call the police. The woman turned and ran into the bar. Betty came running out. Mercy, what on earth? I got him. Just check on the girl. He knocked her out and dropped her hard to the ground. The police came. To her shock, she was tackled and cuffed. She didn't resist. Now listen here, Betty screamed. She just saved that girl. A moment later, an actual station wagon ambulance pulled up to the scene. Mercy could not believe her eyes. Hey, you, paramedic, over here, Mercy yelled. We have to help her, he said, keeping his back to her. She took a hard punch directly under the chin. When he dropped her, she hit the concrete forehead first. She might have damage to the prefrontal cortex. Check her pupils. Let us do our job, he yelled. Then he checked her pupils. The sheriff picked Mercy up off the curb, her hands still cuffed behind her back. Let's go. Go? What did I do wrong? You assaulted that man. You're going down to the station. Paul and Betty rushed them, both yelling at the top of their lungs about Mercy's heroism. I said we'll sort this out down at the station. Step back. When they stepped out of the way, she was loaded into the back of the squad car. Shit! 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 Pondering her situation, she remained calm and quiet in the squad car. So who are you? The cop asked. Mercy Connell. Not your name, smartass. I mean, how do you know how to fight a full-grown man like that? His steely eyes leered at her through the rear view. Chicago is a rough place, sir. I took some self-defense classes, but still couldn't handle it, so I moved. She stared back at him. He wasn't going to shake her, but she did wonder what kind of backwater justice system she was now in. He looked away. The people inside said you did some ninja shit on that guy. She couldn't help but laugh. That's what it looked like the first time I saw it, too. It's just Aikido, which is using someone's attack and inertia against them. I could show you if you'd like. Like in a sparring ring or something, not being a smarty pants back here. The officer chuckled to himself. Look, ma'am, you're a stranger here, or we'd have just let you go back there. We'll go down to the station, take your statement, and get this cleared up. No need to panic. Panic? She was calm. This had to be a game. Thank you, officer. When they reached the station, he was less than gentle getting her out of the car. But once inside, things seemed to be handled better. They fingerprinted her and took mug shots. Damn it. How about that phone call? Betty and Paul rushed in, demanding to see Mercy. She couldn't help but get a good smile at how volatile both of them were. How about that phone call? Mercy yelled. Betty ran over to her. Who do you need to call, dear? Um, you don't happen to have a smartphone, do you? Just got one last month. Betty reached in her purse and pulled it out. Okay, FaceTime, dial this number. Mercy closed her eyes and recalled the number off a card she hadn't seen in months. Special Agent Murphy Morgan, who is this? The cop snatched the phone out of Betty's hand and closed the app. The phone rang immediately. He answered. Sergeant Callahan. Sergeant, there are very few people with my private number. Care to tell me who just rang? His face turned beet red. Do you know this woman? He turned the camera to face Mercy. She waved. Hi, Special Agent. Mercy, what the hell? You used your one phone call to contact the FBI? He growled. Who are you? Hey, do you have anyone who likes to think they're Ted Bundy on your list? Mercy grinned as she spoke. What are you doing in jail? These assholes arrested her for saving a girl, Betty yelled. Mercy had to get to the point. Male, white, dark hair, blue eyes, drives an old El Camino. The passenger seat was removed. He tried to shove a girl inside. Hold, please. Typing could be heard over the speakerphone. There have been several missing persons cases in the South. Describe the victim. Early 20s, blonde hair, blue eyes, petite. Sergeant, this is now under federal jurisdiction. The Violent Crimes Unit will send the appropriate paperwork. Please keep the man detained in the most secure location you can.
Solitary if you have it. Please release Ms. Connell under my care. Mercy, go straight home. I'll be there in the morning. Murphy didn't wait for arguments. She ended the call. Lady? The sergeant said again. Who the hell are you? She cleared her throat. I was a rape victim in a serial rape case. I almost didn't survive. Special Agent Murphy Morgan tracked the guy down and got him to confess. Because I was surrounded by people who cared, I got the help I needed and got the hell out of Chicago. I'm no one special. I'm just determined to survive. That's all. When she looked at Betty, she saw tears streaming down her face. The officer unlocked the cell. But I was also a paralegal. Since I was not booked on any crime, I'd like to watch you destroy my fingerprints and mugshot. When he hesitated, she continued. We can do this through the court, or you can take my word for it. I know the statute, and you had no right to take me through the booking process. I didn't assault anyone, and every witness there stood up for me. He sighed and waved for her to follow him. She watched as the fingerprints were shredded and her image was deleted from the camera's storage. Satisfied, she turned to a very stunned-looking Betty and Paul. Can I get a lift? Betty wrapped her arm around Mercy's back and walked her out of the station, Paul behind them. She turned and leered at the officers standing there. Arrest the girl who saved someone. You should be ashamed. When they reached Paul's truck, Betty took the center sitting between Paul and Mercy. Thank you so much for the ride. As Paul sped off, Betty looked at her. You okay? I'm fine. Is that true about the rape? Yes, ma'am. I suffered brain damage, broken bones, a collapsed lung. I almost didn't make it. But that's exactly how I know that FBI agent, I swear. What sort of man does that to another human? Paul slammed his fist against the steering wheel. Piece of shit! Language! Betty scolded. Sorry, Mama, but can you imagine our Katie Bear? Makes me sick. Betty turned her attention back to Mercy. You came here because of that? Mercy shook her head. I went through an excruciating trial. The jury did right and put him away for a long time. But he made a deal to narc on his cellmate, and now he'll be out in a year or two. I just couldn't live there knowing he was wandering around the city. Paul muttered something about politics. I tried to be a good person. I adopted rescue animals, fostered some, volunteered at the children's wing of the hospital. Still, karma didn't see fit to keep me safe. So I figured that part was up to me. I learned how to shoot. I learned how to fight. And I moved as far away from the violence as I could. Real tears were hot on her cheeks. It wasn't an act. Calling the FBI was calling them to her hiding spot. This was not part of the plan. Her head hurt. When they pulled up to the bar, Mercy hopped out and thanked them for everything. I can't believe you came to help me. That was very sweet. Betty shook her finger at Mercy. That's the sort of butting in we like. Remember, just consider us nosy neighbors. She winked and closed the door. Mercy climbed in her Jeep and rushed home. Bertha was eager to get out. Mabel had her head hung low and crept past her. When she went into the living room, she discovered why. Mabel had been locked in too long. She couldn't hold it. After cleaning and sanitizing the tile floor, she let the dogs back in and loved on Mabel to let her know it was okay. It's time to install the dog door. I'm sorry you've been cooped up all day. Exhausted. Mercy looked at the dog door. She pulled it out of the package, put the template up to the wooden door, and traced the line. She unpacked the saw, still in the original box, and began cutting. It took an hour and several adjustments, but the dog door was installed, and she felt proud for figuring out how to do it alone. She had two very alert, very powerful dogs. It was time not to be scared anymore. They could handle themselves, and so could she. She was safe. Chapter 4 Shaw and I stopped at the police station first. The car had been towed to some farm with cars down the road. But when we looked at the map, down the road was 20 miles away. She demanded we destroy her fingerprints and mugshot. Shaw laughed. I just shook my head. Why were you booking her to begin with? The officer shrugged. A stranger, 
assaults a man outside of a bar and you ask a question like that? She didn't assault him. She performed a citizen's arrest on a man who was trying to kidnap a woman. You might want to brush up on your constitutional law. Now, where's our serial killer? We were led to an interrogation room where a very banged-up William Jason Levy was cuffed to a table. His dark hair was slicked back. His jaw, rough with five o'clock shadow, was bruised. We introduced ourselves. He refused to speak. That's fine. You should lawyer up. Shaw tapped the table and we left the room. We drove the 20 miles with our team to the car in question. Forensic evidence was gathered. Duct tape, black bags, a bloody tire iron, and all sorts of hair was gathered. This was the end of the line for this particular killer. Shaw pulled at his collar. Why is it always so damned humid in the South? Let's go see our girl. Inside the SUV, I cranked the air for my partner and followed the GPS. Mercy Connell, who I was told to stay away from, had called me, solving a five-year mystery. The last time this guy struck was in Louisiana. Only one woman escaped him, and she mentioned the El Camino with no passenger seat. But she never saw his face. There were several bodies in the South that were linked to him, and now we had the car and the man. Murphy! Shaw yelled. We're never going to find this place. Call her. I relented and dialed the phone. Just go back three miles and turn right. The road only goes right. Follow that down until you see an orange mailbox. That's my driveway. A loud scream echoed in the background. Oh my God, stop. Oh, no. Mercy, Mercy, are you okay? I shouted into the phone. Girls, oh, nasty. I'm, I'm fine. I'll see you when you get here. What was that? Shaw asked as I tossed the phone down. Sounded like torture. I stepped on the gas and sped toward her. I found the road, then a few minutes later, the orange mailbox. When we pulled in, I spotted two dogs running in the front yard, white faces covered in blood. Mercy ran out of the house, gagging, holding a garbage bag. What the hell is going on here? She opened the lid and tossed in the bag, gagging again. They dragged a raccoon in the house and killed it. Oh, Jesus, it's disgusting. There are guts everywhere. She coughed and bent over. Sorry, I think I'm going to puke. This I could help with. Stand up straight, go on, do it. When she stood, I looked her in the eye. Breathe deep through the nose, then out through the mouth. She did as I asked. Thanks. I opened the bag inside the can. They'd torn the critter in two. Well, that's nasty. Shut it, please shut it. Closing the lid, I caught Shaw laughing at me. I already knew what he was laughing at. Mercy was no serial killer if she couldn't handle a little blood. So much for my theory. We followed her into the house. Mercy locked the dogs outside. I'm terribly sorry, but I gotta clean this up first. It did look like a crime scene. Blood and guts were sprayed along the wall with a pile of entrails on the floor. Bloody dog prints ran in every direction. Where's your bathtub? Shaw asked. She pointed toward a door. I'll run a bath for the dogs. Murphy, you're good with guts, so I'll leave you to it. He grinned and headed to the bathroom. Mercy had her hands on her head. God, I don't even know where to start. I couldn't help but laugh. Grab a trash can, some spray cleaner, and all the paper towels you have. We spent the next hour cleaning up the mess. Shaw had bravely bathed both the dogs and now stunk like wet dog himself. They love the bath, he announced. They're attention whores, Mercy said with a chuckle. So now I'm sure you have questions. Shaw plopped down on the couch. Sure. Let's start with why you called us. The woman actually grinned. You're the only FBI agents I know. My partner really liked this woman, which was evident in his cheesy grin. Lucky you were there. Right place, right time. What nightmare. I was just trying to get to know my new neighbors. They run the bar. That was her phone we used to call you. Anyway. When I went to leave, I heard the girl telling him to let her go. He was trying so hard to get her in the car. When she tried to free herself, he knocked her out, punched straight to the chin. Her head snapped back, and she was out like a light. When I approached him, he let her fall to the ground. I subdued him and yelled for someone to call the police. Next thing I know, they're arresting me. But I saw inside the car in the missing seat. I remembered a documentary I watched about Ted Bundy, and you came to mind immediately. This girl... Mercy, that was dangerous. You could have been hurt.
She was hurt, Murphy. I just couldn't stand there and do nothing. Who knows what he had planned? I'm sure it wasn't good. She fell against the back of the couch. I came here for peace and quiet. A serial rapist or sadist or whatever ruined my life. What's the chances of having a run-in with a serial killer? I mean, really? I know I didn't break any mirrors. My partner moved seats and took a place next to her. Protocol says we are supposed to tell citizens not to take these things on, to let law enforcement handle it. We're supposed to tell you these things, but what I really want to tell you is that you did well, Mercy. A fine job, really. You kept cool under tense circumstances. You called for help. You called for help again when the local law didn't do their job. Very level-headed and quick thinking. She was relaxed, comfortable talking with us. I had to know something. Mercy, I'd like to ask you something unrelated to this case. Sure, anything. She sat up and looked me straight in the eye. We found your hidden room in the basement in Sylvia McDermott's hair. The crazy woman burst into laughter. Hidden room? Was the door camouflaged or something? Well, no, but you lived alone. I think this job is going to your head. It was a spare room. I used it in the summer a lot because it is cooler down there. And I'm sure you could have found a lot of Sylvia's hair on me and my things. We hugged a lot. I laid in her hospital bed with her and talked for a long time. The antivirals make your hair thin sometimes. So she was losing it en masse. Interesting that she recognized Ted Bundy's characteristics immediately and was emulating them now. He always laughed, charmed. Finding a dead woman's hair in your house should make you nervous, even if you're innocent. It shouldn't be a cause for laughter. Thank you for being so easy going about this. They're still looking for her body, and well, all we can do is follow every lead. Shaw bought my act, so did she. Inside, I was shaking my head. This woman was going to snap, and there was nothing I could do to stop it except keep tabs on her, which went against direct orders. But here we had an invitation. <laughs> Shaw leaned back, throwing his arm around the back of the couch. This is a really great house. It's so open. I owe Jacob Lemery for finding it. I bought it on tax sale. Forty grand. Can you believe it? Do you want to see the rest of the house? This woman invited law enforcement in constantly. She'd let Chicago PD have the run of the house in Chicago. She even gave them a key. Normal people would never do that. It was like she was daring us. I'll take that tour. Shaw hopped up off the couch. If she was going to let me snoop, then snoop I would. She led us to the kitchen, which we could already see. I love it. It's so big. My fridge and freezer are full from my neighbor's casseroles. I swear I won't have to cook for a year. We went back through the living room and past the bathroom where Shaw had bathed the dogs. Peeking inside, Mercy and I cringed simultaneously at the mess Shaw left from cleaning the dogs. We went around the corner and upstairs to the master bedroom. She had a new four-poster bed with steps so the dogs could climb up, presumably. She showed us her enormous walk-in closet. Looks pitiful. I'm not one much for clothes shopping. There was a smaller bathroom, but equally as nice with a bear claw tub and marble countertops. This place was a steal at only 40 grand. When we went back down the stairs and around the other side of the divider wall, we saw her office. Dictation played aloud as the computer spit out typing on the monitor. What's that? Mercy happily plopped down in the office chair and started pointing to different features. Dictation. It's how I'm making money these days. The dictation plays through software. Then I sit down and go over it with a fine-toothed comb. It will often put gibberish in if it can't understand the attorney. So I listen to the chunk of audio again and try to decipher it. I use the other monitor to look up case law, legal terms, and so on. Then when it has been heavily edited, I package it back up into a Word document and email it back to the attorney. They pay me electronically so it works well for telecommuting. I spotted a server sitting in the corner housed in a metal cabinet. That requires a server? God, yes, audio files take up a lot of room. I have to have backup and redundancy. Most of the agreements state I'll keep a copy on file for 12 months. That's a lot of data. It has to be super secure too, so it can't be easily hacked. Not that anyone but you and my computer tech guy knows it even exists. If you look behind you at the door, you'll notice it's a fire door. This is also a safe room. Cost me a fortune, but this whole house could burn down and everything in here would be safe. 
She opened a closet to show she had water and MREs or meals ready to eat. I'm ready for the zombie apocalypse, too. She let out a giggle and closed the door. Shaking my head, I couldn't help but huff out a laugh. You have quite the setup. You're not going to be one of those crazy cat lady hermits, are you? Keep her talking. Make her comfortable. Be her friend. She shrugged at me. If the shoe fits. Except, I'll be the crazy dog lady. Can't really blame me, though. Look at the world out there. It's ugly. Shaw put his hand at the top of his collarbone. It's not so bad. And that's coming from someone who's seen the worst of the worst. There's beauty out there, too. Don't miss out on it. Do some traveling. See the Grand Canyon, Panama Canal, the Keys, Mount Rushmore, things like that. Really? The one thing this job has or allows is the travel. Murph and I have been all over the country. She does the driving, so I get to look around. I don't regret one second of staring out the window. On that note, I'm going to get my nostalgic partner out of here. We have a detainee to question. I grabbed Shaw by the coat and gave him a tug. By mercy, he called out over his shoulder. I waved to her as we walked past the dogs who looked all too proud of themselves for the mess they- Chapter 5 Mercy had her first file from Tommy. The hit was on a man. After serving a year for child molestation, he'd been released, committed the same crime, and only served 18 months for his second offense. He was out, and a child was missing. The parents were offering me a whopping 50 grand, minus Tommy's cut, of course, and a $50,000 bonus if she found their son, dead or alive. She had photos, an address of the suspect, and the people paying the bounty. Mercy checked the local police department files. They'd interviewed the man, and he seemed innocent to them. There was no sign of the boy. After a month, the cops weren't hanging around the family anymore. The feds were called in for the missing kid, but they too had come up empty-handed. With the FBI hot on their new serial killer case, she hit the road. The Jennings had agreed to keep an eye on her place as she drove to Kentucky. First, she stalked the parents. The files didn't lie. No law enforcement could be seen around them. Their eyes were puffy. They never seemed to sleep and barely ate. The case seemed legitimate enough. She drove 50 miles to the suspect's house and set up shop. She climbed a tree and watched through her night vision goggles. A single man was moving about the house. He ate dinner, then watched TV. While he was doing nothing but sitting there, she would in at her field of vision, sweeping from side to side. She could see small animals moving about in the woods. Precisely at nine o'clock, the garage light came on, and he entered. But he didn't seem to exit, and looking through the windows didn't reveal any movement. She'd planned on taking him out from a distance, but this warranted closer investigation. She secured her equipment at the bottom of the tree and pulled her black face mask down. Her heart fluttered as she crept up to the garage. Carefully, she peeked inside. A workbench was pulled away from the wall, and it revealed a door. That was it. That was where he was keeping the kid. She took a deep breath and steadied herself. She was trained and had field experience with Rose, but this was her first solo mission. Should she wait until he left, break in and rescue the kid? How could she just sit there while horrendous things took place inside? No, waiting was not an option. She spotted an entry door at the back of the garage and walked around the garage. Testing the knob, she was surprised to find it unlocked and slowly pushed it open in case there was an alarm. There was. It was silent, but the lights flickered, and when she looked at the door jam, she saw the magnetic strip. Thinking quickly, she pushed the door open and stepped back outside. She heard the sound of footsteps ascending. Making sure not to lean her weight against the siding, she waited until she saw his shadow. The swishing sound that had troubled her before now comforted her, reminding her what she was. When the gun crossed the threshold, she grabbed it, yanked the guy toward her, and elbowed him in the nose. When his head snapped back, he dropped the gun. In that second, she kicked his knee, dropping him like a 200-pound sack of potatoes, kneeing him in the lumbar for added measure. She grabbed the gun, dropped out the clip, and disposed of the round inside. Tossing the gun away from them, she quickly reached in her side pouch 
and grabbed zip ties. Six seconds had passed so slowly it seemed like an hour. With her weight on his lumbar, she yanked his wrist back. When he tried to fight, she hit a very particular spot at the top of the shoulder that held a bundle of nerves that ran down the arm, rendering it temporarily useless. With the arm disabled, she yanked it and slid the zip tie around it, pulling it tight. He yelled out as she fought him for the other arm. She'd had enough trying to wrestle the piece of shit, pulled out her sidearm, and fired a shot into his shoulder. His scream was louder than the silenced bullet. With his arms bound and the man in shock from being shot, she bound his feet. Let's see what's going on downstairs, shall we? With all her might, she dragged him to the stairs and shoved him down them, following close behind with her gun drawn. The man was crying on the floor. His shoulder looked dislocated from his tumble down the stairs. When she reached the last stair and swept the room, her heart felt as if it stopped beating. Three small children were chained to the wall, each of them covered in bruises. There was old brown carpeting on the floor that was filthy. A bed was against the wall with no sheets, no pillows, the room was dimly lit, with only two lamps. It stunk like mold, mildew, and piss. Is he alone? She asked. They all nodded. Shut the fuck up! He barked at them. I'll take care of you once she's finished! Mercy kicked him hard in the stomach. The man vomited on the floor. You're sure there's no one else here? She asked again. The first child, a little girl about eight, sniffed. Timmy is in the other room, but he hasn't cried since yesterday. Her brown hair was a knotted mess, her dirty face streaked with tears. Mercy wanted to cry. Okay, I'm going to make sure we're safe and alone, then I'm going to untie you. But I need you to be brave. Can you do that? The boy in the middle began shaking. His black hair covered his eyes. He looked to be about ten. His knee was swollen and bruised. All she wanted was to hold him, tell him it was okay. But she had to keep her wits about her. Stepping over the bound man she only knew as Alfred, she walked to the only other door and opened it. A boy lay on a mattress on the floor. He looked as if he'd been starved to death. It was Timmy McAllister, the boy she was hired to find. She felt for a pulse. There was one, but it was weak. Alfred could be heard sobbing. Whatever pain he was in wasn't enough. Mercy untied the boy from the wall and scooped him up. He grunted and winced. Starvation was a cruel way to die. She carried him into the room with the other children and laid him on the bed. All three children who were chained gasped. What's wrong? The brave little girl's bottom lip protruded. Are you going to hurt him? The bed. It was used for... She wanted to vomit. Oh, oh no, honey. I'm here to get you kids home to your parents and make sure he pays for what he did. She looked down at the boy on the mattress. He's so bony I just needed a soft space to put him, but we'll get him out of here. Deal? The little girl nodded. Okay, brave girl. She glanced over to be sure Alfred wasn't going anywhere. What's your name? She shook her head and looked at the floor. You don't remember. I'm not allowed, she cried. Says who? Him? Alfred started spewing profanities. Mercy had had enough. She went into the room where she found Timmy and tore a piece of sheet that looked to be stained in urine, went back into the room and stuffed it in his mouth. That ought to do it. The three chained up kids looked shocked. He's going to be so mad, the middle boy said. The third only giggled. Mercy knelt down again. Now what should I call you? Charlotte, she said with a sniff. My mommy called me Charlotte. And you, brave boy, what's your name? His voice cracked. He cleared his throat and tried again. Buddy Avery, I live at 1202 Forest Lane. My mom's name is Judith. My dad's name is Harry. She scooted over to the third boy. And you, what do I call you? Scotty. Okay, Charlotte, Buddy, Avery, and Scotty. Do any of you know where this bad guy keeps the keys? Buddy lifted his chin. In his pocket, unless it's bedtime. Then he takes his pants off and puts the keys in the safe. Safe? She looked around the room. 
Under the rug, Charlotte offered. The whole floor was a giant rug. Guys, where are the keys now? Charlotte argued with him to make him mad. When he's mad, he goes away for a while, so they're still in his pocket. Scotty sniffed. It was my turn and... and... Mercy tilted her head. Shh, it's okay. She turned and looked at Alfred, who was shooting daggers at her. Gross! Charlotte giggled. Mercy walked over and kicked Alfred onto his back. He screamed through the piss-saturated sheet. She spotted the bulge on the right side and dug in, grabbing the keys. After a few tries, she managed to find the right key and freed the kids. I'm right behind you. You go up the stairs. I'll carry Timmy. The kids all stared at Alfred, seemingly too terrified to walk past him. Hang on. She grabbed him by the shirt and dragged him out of the way. Geez, you're a lard ass. Eat a salad once in a while. The kids giggled and ran up the stairs. She scooped up Timmy in her arms and with the gun still in her hand aimed at Al, shot him in the thigh so if he did manage to get out of the zip ties, he couldn't climb the stairs. When she reached the top of the steps, she closed the door and noticed a heavy-duty lock. Charlotte, dear, would you be so kind as to lock the door? She asked as she swung the keys around. Yes, ma'am. Charlotte fumbled for a bit, but managed to find the right key and turned the lock. Let's go inside. The house hadn't been cleared, and it was a risk, but she had to try. When they entered the house, she found it to be neat and clean. She put Timmy on the couch and covered him with a blanket that was draped along the back. When's the last time you kids ate? They all shrugged. She had to get them help. Fast. This she hadn't planned on. What's your name? Charlotte asked her. This would be what the cops called her. And why are you dressed like a cat burglar? Scotty asked. Let's get you guys some food, then I'll answer all your questions. She dug around in the kitchen and found soup. She quickly heated it on the stove, scooping out some broth for Timmy. The kids sat at the table eating while she tried to get some broth into Timmy McAllister. Just a sip, please, she begged. The boy did as she asked, but winced in pain after he swallowed. I know it hurts, honey. Your tummy hasn't had anything in a long time, but we need to get your strength up. Charlotte patted over in her bare feet. Here I can help. She was so little, but had mothered the boys already. It's okay, you go eat. I gave him my dinner last night. I know how to get him to do it. She held out her hands. Please? Mercy relented, handing the coffee cup to the little girl. Your mommy needs you to drink this. The boy sipped and cried. Good. I'll tell your mommy how good you were. Charlotte patted his knee. One more sip and we can stop. Buddy sat next to Mercy. So, answer our questions. Mercy took a deep breath and waved Scotty over to sit with the kids. She took a knee in front of them. What I'm doing here is actually illegal. Even though he's a very bad man, I broke a lot of laws to come save you. So I can't tell you my real name. I'm dressed like this so he didn't see me coming. So you can't see my face. Charlotte giggled. God, kids are resilient. You look like Catwoman, so I'm just going to call you Cat, okay? She grabbed Mercy's gloved hand. Are you going to take us home now? Mercy held her breath, then let it out. I'm going to look around. I need you three to watch him. Try to get some more food in him. Please do what I ask so I can make sure you get home safe and this creep never hurts anyone again. They all nodded. She quickly located the bedroom and pulled out clean socks and long sweatshirts. She carried them out to the living room, giving them to the kids. I'm sorry, they're his, but at least it's clothes. They thanked her. She went back to searching. It didn't take long for her to find what she was looking for. She recalled seeing boxes in the living room. She opened one. It was full of bills. She emptied it on the floor, carried the box into the bedroom, and put everything inside. She found a marker in a kitchen drawer and carried it to the living room. She handed the marker to Buddy. Write evidence in big letters across the top. She instructed him, hoping he would comply. She didn't need a sample of her handwriting at the crime scene. Buddy did what she asked. 
The sun was starting to rise. She had to get out and fast. Okay, kids, here's what we need to do. I have to get out of here. Wait until the clock says 4.05, then dial 911. The police should be here soon. Give them the keys and tell them the bad guys downstairs. Make sure they get the box. She took a knee and a deep breath. I'm going to tell you a secret, but you cannot tell anyone else. This is all I want from you. Okay? The three kids promised. Timmy only groaned. Someone very bad did something to me like that jerk did to you. So I know a few things about how your life is going to be after you go home. Doctors will want to take samples. They will want to look at your private parts. You're going to feel horrible all over again. The police and therapists will make you talk about what happened. No matter how bad it sucks, you have to tell them. You have to remember everything you can. But don't embellish. That means make it better or worse than it was. Stick to the facts. Then after all that is over, when you have time alone, this bad stuff, well, you'll think about it, even though you don't want to. Sometimes it's like a movie that plays in your head. Try to distract yourself. Do something. Read. Color. Play basketball. Whatever it is that makes you happy. Do that. Don't do drugs. Do good in school. Take self-defense classes so you can feel safe. But most of all, be good to people. Be a good person. Know that this doesn't define you. You are not this nightmare. Okay? Charlotte started crying. What about the nightmares? Do they go away? Mercy sighed. Yes, but it takes a very long time. Thank you, Kat. She looked at them all. I'm sorry, I have to go now. Remember, dial 911. As she began walking out the door, she turned to them and held her hand up like a cat claw. You're all perfect, remember that. She left them with smiles on their dirty, worn little faces. After locating her gear, she ran to the hiding spot where she kept her Jeep, pulling the branches off, then roaring the engine to life. She had 60 seconds until the kids called 911. <laughs> she sped off in the opposite direction of the police station. She didn't kill the man, but she did save the four kids and left a mountain of evidence. He should go away for a long time. Timmy McAllister was alive, barely, but he was alive. After half an hour, she pulled into an empty rest area, pulled off her gear, and stowed it where the spare tire was supposed to be. She pulled her hair into a ponytail, high on her head, and put on sunglasses. The drive home was going to be pleasant. Chapter 6 Would you look at that? Shaw said as he stared at his laptop. Stock prices? I know, my 401k took a beating. I rolled my eyes and went back to reading the toxicology report from Maryland. Shaw laughed. Catwoman rescues four from pedophile. That's the headline. What? Send me the link. I waited until the instant messenger popped up on my screen and followed the link. One girl and three boys were rescued Saturday night by a woman they fondly called Catwoman. Sources close to the investigation say the four children refused to give any other details other than the moniker. What police found inside the East Side residence was nothing short of a nightmare, sources say. Chains, pornography, sexual assault, and starvation was part of the daily lives of these four before their rescue by the mysterious woman. The suspect, Alfred Ramirez, was found with two gunshot wounds, bound and gagged in his dungeon. The four children have been reunited with their families. When asked for a public statement, the family simply wanted to thank the woman who saved their children and ask for privacy as their little ones try to heal from the ordeal. Sheriff John Taylor had this to say, while we're happy to have these children reunited with their families and the suspect behind bars, we want to remind folks that vigilante justice is dangerous. Please let us do our jobs. If you find something suspicious, contact the authorities. Not all heroes wear capes. We here at the Herald would like to thank Catwoman for her bravery and kindness to the victims in this matter. This was not good. We'd seen an uptick in vigilante killings in the last five years, Michelangelo being at the top of our list. When things like this happen, the common citizen feels empowered to take matters into their own hands. That left a mess for local law enforcement and the local courts to sort out. I went back to studying the toxicology reports. The victim had no traces of any poison, just medication for treatment of sexually transmitted infections. Cause of death was still unknown, but I felt the M.E. was right. Cyanide would have been the perfect tool for the job, but difficult to obtain. 
The glove piece was Kevlar. Traces of neoprene were found as well. No DNA evidence could be detected, but still, it was our first real lead. There was a wait time to find out who manufactured the Kevlar glove, but I could wait. I'd waited long enough. My private cell phone rang. It was Miranda Bosley, the head of the Chicago Special Victims Unit. Miranda, nice to hear from you. Good to hear your voice, Murphy. I was wondering. She paused for far too long. If you wouldn't be interested in joining me when I question Sylvia McDermott's mother. I glanced at my partner, who was still enthralled in reading the news. Can I call you back? I, uh, I guess. She hung up. After slipping out of the office, I went outside. The air was still quite cold in Milwaukee, so I found a corner out of the wind and called Miranda. Sorry, I just needed some privacy. What's going on? Miranda cleared her throat. I have an unpopular theory. Go on, I'm listening. McDermott's mother seems to be handling her death very, very well. I could feel myself grinning. You know, SVU might not be the right department for you. Miranda laughed. How well is she handling it? I couldn't wait to hear Miranda's theory. Better than any mother I've seen that's lost a child. So, well, in fact, that she's yet to cash a $50,000 life insurance check. I don't know about you, but 50 grand would do a lot to ease my burdens, even though it wouldn't bring back my child. The wind whipped and I pulled my jacket up around my neck. I can be there tomorrow, but I'll only have a few hours. That's all I need to shake the trees, meet you at my office, and Murphy? Yeah? Thanks, everyone else has told me to leave this alone, but my gut tells me something is off. Now you know how I feel. I teased as I ended the call. Thankful to be back inside the building and warm, I took time to go to the restroom and gather myself before going back to the office. Shaw was still staring at his computer. I think I'm taking the day off tomorrow, I announced. Sure, whatever. I tossed a paperclip at him. Have you looked at the toxicology report? Three times. There's nothing there. He turned his laptop toward me. But did you see this? Three articles from across the country. All murders. The victims with long, violent rap sheets. That's a big coincidence. Yes, it is. Murphy. Shaw's eyes widened. I think someone called open season on the bad guys. The mail clerk stopped outside my office and handed Shaw and me our mail. I flipped through the envelopes until I spotted something odd. There was one address to me that was marked for special delivery. There was no return address. Do they still screen our mail? I asked Shaw. He looked up from his mail. Just the stuff to the public address. Why? I placed the letter on my desk, reached in my door, and grabbed the white fabric gloves. Carefully, I cut the top open and, using tweezers, pulled the letter out, carefully unfolding it. Special Agent Murphy Morgan and her trusty sidekick, Agent Shaw. Yes, I know you're special, too. So it is with great sorrow that I haven't had you on my heel. It's time for a change, you see. I left you one last piece of art in Maryland. One final goodbye. I would say I'm sorry for not leaving you more in the way of evidence, but I couldn't have you retiring my very prolific career. It's not that I didn't leave you clues. I left you plenty, spelled it out for you even. But there are more bad guys out there who need to be stopped. You and I both know I can do what you cannot. I have no red tape, no rules. You are a formidable opponent, Agent. You found my very secluded hiding spot in Louisiana. Imagine my surprise when I return to find my memoirs gone. I'd love nothing more than to chat over coffee and discover your appreciation for my art. Really, I would. But the winds have shifted, and so have I. With admiration and respect, Michelangelo. He slipped. There's evidence here. Get it in a bag now. Shaw's hands shook as he spoke. Mine were shaking, too. It was the adrenaline rush. I pulled an evidence bag out of my briefcase and placed the letter and envelope inside. I filled out the slip and attached it, handing it to Shaw. Take it. I can't move. When he rushed out of the room, I leaned against the desk with my forearms. Shaw's joke, I'm special, too. He used it every time he introduced himself to local cops. Michelangelo had been standing there once, had heard him use that line. Maybe more than once. God damn it, he'd been right there. Right there. 
probably laughing his ass off watching us investigate his crime scene. I'd seen his face. Her face. So many faces ran through my mind, but I never paid attention. My eyes were on the surroundings, the scene, not the flatfoots around me. I'd probably been rude. Shaw had been nice. Surprised Michelangelo hadn't come for me personally. Then again, I wasn't on the menu, only the bad guys. Were the recent shootings his new method? I sat at Shaw's desk looking at his laptop. I called each precinct and inquired about the case. Forensics didn't have time to do their thing yet, but all three were long-range kills. Distance from the blood, distance from the carnage, ease of escape. This wasn't Michelangelo's taste, but that was a stretch. Still, the M.O. was the same. When Shaw returned, I got up from his chair and filled him in. Shaw leaned back in his chair and pulled his ankle up on his knee. So, it might have been the same shooter? Perhaps. That would give us jurisdiction. We have to get these cops working together. I told them all to log it onto Vicap, not to waste time. We'll see. He smiled. Still taking tomorrow off? With a heavy sigh, I nodded. A friend needs some help. You, Murphy, I don't need to know if Jesse needs his axle greased. He scrunched up his face. Grow up, it's not him. Anyway, you can hold down the fort. I doubt there will be anything earth-shattering in the next 24 hours that you can't handle. I closed my laptop and headed out. Where are you going? It's only 11. Shaw, I haven't been home in a few days. I'm going to get a shower and some sleep. I work round the clock. There's not a man nor woman in the bureau who can complain if I go home early. Not rightfully so, anyway. I'll work from home tonight. With that, I left the building, sent a message to Jesse, and headed... Chapter 7 Are you fucking kidding me, little girl? You had a job to do? Tommy Matrone screamed at Mercy on the phone. Mercy bit her lip. I made a judgment call. That is not how this works. She could almost feel him seething through the phone. You're not paid to think. You're paid to perform one simple task. She could hear things slamming in the background. I should have made 20 out of this, but I only made 10 for you saving the kid. 10. That's half. Take the other half out of my cut. I don't care. She hung up on him and fell into her office chair. She thought she did good. She gathered the evidence and wrapped it up neatly for the cops. He couldn't lie his way out of videos and photos of himself having sex with children. Then, she remembered Willie and his shitty deal that would free him from his sentence. She'd made a terrible mistake. The burner phone rang again. Did you really instruct me to take another ten out of your share? Yes, just stop screaming. She pleaded. I'm sorry, Tommy. I know you have a reputation to maintain. There were a few moments of silence over the phone. Well, if you're willing to square up with me, then I have another job for you. I'll send the 30 over to you with the new file. This one pays big, but you gotta perform, girl. Get in, get it done, get out. That's how this works. She squeezed her eyes closed. So soon? You don't want it. I got other guys. He sounded irritated again. Nah, I just thought you were going to stay mad, that's all. She swallowed hard. For whatever reason, she didn't want this particular criminal angry with her. He chuckled. You put the money back in my pocket, so we're good. Now you want it? Yes, she said without hesitation. She wanted to prove herself to him. Good, you'll have it shortly. With that, he hung up. She opened her private server and waited. When the private messenger Freddy set up opened, Mercy read the file. The guy had killed a woman 20 years ago in a jealous rage. He confessed to the crime and was recently released. The family wanted revenge. She'd get 80,000. Tommy would get his 20. This one was closer. Birmingham. She didn't even need to pack. Everything was still in the Jeep. Her regular cell rang. An unfamiliar Chicago number appeared. Hello? Don't say a word. It was a woman on the other end of the line. I just want you to know the police are asking about my daughter. The call went dead. What the hell? 
she typed the phone number into her skip trace software. The call came from none other than Nina McDermott, Sylvia's mother. Fuck. She logged onto the Chicago PD server, then made her way into Miranda Bosley's files. There was a file for McDermott. Miranda was poking around into Sylvia's death. She and Special Agent Murphy Morgan questioned Nina about the life insurance and who could have possibly taken Sylvia's body. Murphy was becoming as irritating as a hemorrhoid. She didn't have time for this right now. She pushed it out of her mind and looked at Tommy's file, committing the face and the man to memory. Tonight, she'd spend time with her girls. Tomorrow, she'd head to Birmingham for recon. Tired of reheated leftovers, she made a large salad and sat at the table. She needed a hobby, something to take up some time. She needed something to occupy her mind. You could go back to reading. She lifted her eyes to see Sylvia staring back at her, or was it her reflection? It had been so eerie how much they looked alike. You slept like a baby last night. No nightmares. Her reflection was right. Saving those children made her rest, made Willie's violence absent from her slumber. She slept ten full hours. Ten, not two, not four, or the occasional five. She slept for ten glorious hours. Try gardening. I'm sure the neighbors would give you tips. Gardening was a great idea. She got up from the table, went to the cabinet, and pulled out the bottle of Paxil. She stared at it. It was supposed to help, but all it really did was give her blurry vision, dry mouth, and insomnia. She put it back in the cabinet and braced herself against the countertop. She was elated now, and she was freaking out. Oftentimes, she'd see her specter playing with the dogs, folding laundry, and when she'd snap out of it, the laundry would be folded, the dogs would be exhausted. It had to be the dissociative identity disorder. She knew this, but thought she'd had it kicked. She thought she'd integrated. Fuck Willie, and the damage he did to her brain. She was not going to crumble. She went to her computer, clicked on her private message window, and rang Freddy. Mercy, he said as his face popped up on the screen. Everything okay? Just needed to see a familiar face is all. I love living here, but... That's fine. I took today off, actually. How are things? She filled him in on the serial killer she helped catch, and how things were going with her neighbors. A notification popped up that 30000 was deposited into her Swiss bank account. Good news, I hope? She nodded. Just a deposit. Freddy smiled on the monitor. You should get some exercise, Mercy. Keep up that muscle tone. You were looking very healthy last time I saw you. The dogs began barking. Someone's here, I gotta run. Call any time, he said, before she closed the chat. She ran downstairs. It was the woman from the bar that mentioned the garden store. Mercy opened the door. Hi. Hello, dear. I guess that with everything going on, you didn't have time to come down to the store, so I brought you some things. The woman was in her late forties. Her hair was wound into a bun with loose strands hanging out everywhere. She walked to the back of her old Ford and dropped the gate. Mercy hustled toward her. These are heirloom tomatoes. You just save some seeds. Dry them on paper towels and store them in a baggie until next year. I swear they taste like candy. She handed her three plants. Mercy bit her lip. What's wrong, dear? I... I... Oh, child! The woman patted her back. Whatever it is, it's okay. Tears began to sting her eyes. So much is wrong. First, I don't remember your name, which makes me feel awful. Second, I want to put a garden in. But I lived in Chicago my whole life. I don't even know where to put the thing, let alone what to do with it. What do I grow? How do I know when it's ready? Oh, child, being here all alone has to be so hard. She grabbed Mercy and hugged her. First, the name is Helen. Everyone calls me Aunt Helen. You can too. Next, I own a garden store. I can teach you everything you want to know. You just plant them. Make sure they get some water and let God's earth do the rest. Helen looked up at the trees and around the yard. Put them down and follow me. They plotted a garden in the sunniest spot, 
marking everything out with rocks and sticks. I'll bring a tiller over and we'll get this ground turned for you. Mercy snickered. I have one in the shed. Helen put her hands on her hips. How is it you got a tiller but don't know about gardening? Don't laugh. Helen shook her finger at Mercy. Now if it's funny, I'm going to laugh. Spit it out, girl. The guy at Home Depot said if I was moving to the country, I'd need one. So I bought it. It hasn't even seen a drop of gas. She squeezed her lips together as she looked at Mercy, then finally let out a belly laugh. Oh, you poor thing. He saw a sucker. Mercy shrugged. Not a sucker. See, I have a garden to plant. Lord have mercy, child. Let's go get her fired up. After an hour, they had the garden tilled, and Helen was helping her put the tomatoes in. Keep them watered. Watch the forecast. If it's going to rain, then don't water them. The rain has nitrogen, which plants love. Add coffee grounds around the base. The worms love them. They'll poop around the plant, and you'll get some good fruit off the plant. If you're smart, you'll put some fish guts in the ground around the plants. Fish guts are really great fertilizer. Well, that's repulsive. Helen patted her arm. You eat the fish. The plants eat the guts. Seems a good relationship to me. Nothing goes to waste. Now the other thing you gotta do is start a compost heap. Stop in at the store. I got a pamphlet that tells you how to do it really easy. Mercy put her hands together. I have some work to do tomorrow, but after that I'll be in to stock up and get my education. Thank you so much, Helen. Aunt Helen. I can see why everyone calls you that. You're like an ant that comes to the rescue. The sunlight hit Helen's eyes and Mercy gasped. What? Helen asked, eyes widened. You have the prettiest green eyes I've ever seen. They sparkle. Helen swatted at her. It's a little late to butter me up. The work is done. They took a break with some lemonade, Mercy thanking her for the help. When Helen left, Mercy showered and played with the dogs. Tomorrow? Tomorrow she would start her second job. She'd get it right this time. It wasn't as if she couldn't find another middle man, but Tommy kept his rate low, and it was the devil she knew. That night she did her online research, reading the court records on the murder trial. The guy went off in a jealous rage and murdered his girlfriend. He stabbed her multiple times, and if that wasn't bad enough, set her body ablaze. In the middle of the trial, the man had a change of heart and cut a deal with the prosecutor. When he was awarded parole, the family went crazy. His prison file didn't indicate much other than he made his mark early so he wouldn't get screwed with, then became a model prisoner. She knew she couldn't decide for herself if he was reformed. This was the job she chose. If she failed again, Tommy would kick her to the curb. The next morning, she set off for Birmingham. Tommy's file said the man was staying with his elderly parents while he looked for a job. A man exited the small house, about the same age as her mark. His hair was cut short. He looked over his shoulder before climbing in the old Buick Regal. She stayed back at least a block and followed him to a gym. She sat in her Jeep and waited. Five minutes later, the guy walked out with a small brown paper bag. She followed him to the other side of Birmingham and drove past him as he climbed out, paper bag in hand. Looking around, she spotted a building with a parking lot and pulled in. From her spot, she watched as her mark stood on the corner. Cars stopped. He approached. Money and baggies changed hands. Drug dealing was quick money. It was also very dangerous. She watched him for hours until her bladder demanded a break, then went to a McDonald's grabbing a tea and using the ladies' room. Fearful she'd lose him, she rushed back to the location just in time to see the man climbing back in his old regal. The man stopped back at the gym, probably to drop off money, then went straight home. Mercy drove an hour away and grabbed a hotel room under an alias. After a few hours of sleep, she showered, put on a false nose and chin, grabbed her gear, and headed back to Birmingham. The regal wasn't parked outside the home. It was no matter. She knew where he'd be eventually. Parking six blocks away, she grabbed her case, put the lanyard over her head, and pulled her head through the baseball cap. As she ascended the fire escape of a building several blocks away, a woman yelled at her. 
What are you doing out there? Safety inspector, ma'am? She said as she flashed the fake badge on her lanyard. I gotta check out all of the fire escapes for insurance. The woman nodded. About damn time someone gave a shit. You be careful. Yes, ma'am. The fire escape was a bit rusted and wobbly. She reached the roof and found a spot, checked the door on the rooftop to be sure no one could exit, wedging a piece of steel in the jam, and set up. She opened her case and assembled her Remington 308. Then she waited for the train nearby. The moment it roared by, she took aim, took one deep breath in, and pulled the trigger. The guy fell flat on his face as the bullet tore through his heart and lungs. Quickly, she disassembled the rifle, pulled the clipboard out of the case, and put the gun in. On the clipboard was a page she'd previously marked up that looked as official as they came. She descended the fire escape, and the woman stopped her again. Pretty bad, huh? Mercy gave her a nod. Several violations. I'd consider moving if I were you, but I'll be filing my report in the morning. She never looked the woman in the eye as she continued calmly descending. She walked quickly the six blocks and got in the jeep, pulling off the hat and lanyard. She'd just killed a man in broad daylight. Obeying the speed limit, she drove in the opposite direction and straight out of Birmingham. She'd done it. The man couldn't have survived. Soon as she was in a more rural area, she tore the nose and chin off, tucking them in her bag. When she felt it was safe, she stopped at a restaurant, disposing of the evidence in the bathroom trash and grabbed a soda to go. It wasn't until she pulled in her driveway she felt safe. Saving the kids was one thing. Shooting a man in cold blood was another. The slight paranoia that she'd be followed had her heart racing. She stood outside her Jeep and listened. The nice thing about living in the middle of nowhere is that you can hear cars a mile away. Satisfied no one was coming, she grabbed the case containing her sniper rifle and rushed in the house. She sent her confirmation off to Tommy and collapsed on- Chapter 8 There had been a shooting in Birmingham. All deaths of known criminals were now being filtered through the Bureau. There were so many. Most were criminals killing other criminals over shady deals, car accidents, and the like. Still, the deaths that were suspicious, those were given their own subfile under our vigilante file, and the subs were building. I'm not sure what to do with this, Shaw said. There's more than one killer, that much is for sure. You can't kill two people at the same time 500 miles away. I watched as he shuffled files as he shook his head. I'm going down to cybercrimes, see if they can search the dark web. These people have to be communicating somehow. This had become perplexing. Vigilante crime had risen 30%. The latest, a murderer out on parole, selling drugs on a corner, was shot in broad daylight by a long-range sniper rifle. Medical examiner on the case stated he was probably dead instantly. Michelangelo's departing gift, a letter, had turned up common paper found anywhere, common ink for a HP printer, and no fingerprints. Distilled nursery water was used to seal the envelope, rendering it completely useless. The glove sample was made by a company called Magid in Illinois, but was distributed in so many places it might as well have been Walmart brand. Dead end after dead end was making me wonder what I was doing. Why couldn't I catch a break? Killers made mistakes, always. No matter how skilled, how cunning, or how smart they eventually did something that got them caught. The only remaining question was how many people had to die before that happened. Thoughts of mercy still plagued my mind. The Ted Bundy copycat had stacked up 20 bodies, and had she not intervened that night, there would be more. This girl had all kinds of luck, good and bad. But that sort of thing could make people snap. Birmingham was awfully close to Clay, Alabama, but mercy was a paralegal. She may have learned some self-defense, but sharpshooting was a skill that took years to hone. Maybe she was right. Maybe this job was going to my head, and either way, I was ass-deep in case files that were being handled by local police with FBI oversight, the most unpopular arrangement. They hated reporting to us, hated the oversight. But we had a common goal. When six o'clock rolled around, I went home and collapsed in Jesse's arms. For the first time, I talked about work, about my frustration, and possible meltdown. He actively listened, but didn't meddle. Do you know why the kid was so successful with this BS in Chicago? 
The kid, a mobster's son who turned the business upside down with vigilante killing. The kid who emulated Michelangelo and wound up one of his portraits. No, I really don't. That was so hard to admit. We were supposed to be the specialists, the ones who know, who predicted behavior. Jesse patted my thigh with one hand while squeezing me around the shoulders with his free arm. Because the witnesses who could have helped the cops didn't want to. They wanted the victims to die because they were evil people who always evaded the system. That's probably what's going on here. Possible witnesses are playing stupid because the victims are the worst of the worst. Rapists, pedophiles, murderers. I put my head on his shoulder. I don't know how to stop this. He kissed my forehead. Find the snake and cut off its head. What the hell was that supposed to mean? I pulled away and looked at him. Excuse me? Jesse's throaty laugh always made me smile. This time it did not. Murph, they're organized, right? Well, I was in organized crime. When the leader is taken out, the others scurry like ants. They fight for leadership. That fight is going to get loud and messy. That's all fine and well, but finding the snake is what is so damned hard. I mean, Christ, we've been tracking one killer for years. I can't imagine trying to find a phantom no one even know exists. This is why we shouldn't talk about work. He has no idea what's involved. No one did. With all the intel you have at the Bureau and your behavioral analysts, you can't come up with a handful of candidates with the skills to pull this off? Shaw had taken the lead on this since I'd been so frustrated with our other case. My partner is all over it. Honestly, I didn't even ask where he was with it today. I guess I'm just... Spent? Murph, other than our vacation, you've done nothing but push. You do research when there's nothing left to research. You fly all over the country, get very little sleep or rest of any kind. Your body can only take so much, and so can your mind. He quickly stood from the couch. I have an idea. You're off tomorrow, right? I nodded. Technically, yes. He knew what I meant. While I was technically off, I usually worked. I was a workaholic to the core. Kick off those shoes. I'll be back to get you in a second. I watched him walk away, leaning over the arm of the couch to see where he was going. He walked to the back deck. Then I heard it, the familiar thud of the hot tub cover coming off. Ad when he came back, he handed me a towel and a book and using his finger flagged me on. Go on, go. I'll bring you something to drink. Looking down at the book, I couldn't help but laugh. Making Waves by Tana Fensky. You're into romantic comedy now? He crossed his arms over his chest. The lady I put the wheelchair ramp in for gave it to me for you, smartass. But yes, I read it. It's hilarious and has pirates in it. No more judging me. Go. He laughed and swatted at my ass as I headed down the hall. I stripped down and eased into the hot water, then turned on the jets. I hadn't read a book in ages. A romantic comedy was unexpected, but probably needed more than anything at the moment. So I cracked it open and started to read. I was a few pages in when Jesse joined me with a book of his own and two margaritas. We drank in silence as we both enjoyed our books. By page 57, I was in stitches. Told you it was funny, he said with a wink. We stayed in the tub for 30 minutes. I pulled on the most comfortable pajamas I owned and curled up on the couch. For three hours, I was immersed in a fantasy world. I didn't think about the vigilante killings. I didn't think about Mercy, not even Michelangelo. I just escaped, and it was lovely. After two drinks and eye strain, I was ready for bed. The night ended curled up in Jesse's arms, my mind free from burden. I loved this man. I should do something about that. The sun was barely up as Jesse woke me with a cup of coffee. What's going on? Why are you dressed like that? Jesse was wearing old carpenter khaki pants and a t-shirt. We're going fishing. Get up. Fishing? No, sleeping. I laid down and pulled the blanket over my head. No, he said with a chuckle. You can take a nap later. They're biting now. Come on, Murph. Trust me. He pulled me to the sitting position. Where's my gun? I whined. Jesse laughed at me and put his hands on his hips. The DNR doesn't take kindly to that sort of fishing. It was for you, I said as I squinted at him. 
You have ten minutes to put some clothes on and get your hair in a cap. Then I'm loading your cute little ass in the truck. Under duress, I swung my legs over the side of the bed. Not knowing how to dress, I put on something closely resembling what he was wearing and trudged to the bathroom. A few minutes later, I managed to make it to the kitchen. I stared at him begrudgingly. Okay, Mr. Angler, I'm up, I'm dressed, but you still might have to carry me to the truck. He scooped up two thermoses and grabbed my hand. Come on, love. This is what you need, trust me. I kept my mug of coffee in my hand, taking it with me and drinking it as we made our way to the dock. He took care of loading everything into his fishing boat. All I had to do was put on a life vest and get in. Still, I wasn't happy. I could still be in bed. I rarely slept in, but did enjoy the chance when I had it. He took us to a little cove and dropped anchor, handed me a pole with a worm. Cast it toward the shore and slowly reel it in. I knew how to fish. He knew I knew how to fish. Maybe it was the zombie-like demeanor that made him think I'd gone brain dead, but I failed to see how fishing would solve anything. The lake was still. The sun had barely peeked into the horizon and everything quiet. Aside from a few birds starting to wake, only the sound of our reels could be heard. It was absolutely serene. It was then I understood why he pulled me out of bed. Tranquility wasn't part of my life. It was all stress, tension, and violence. The familiar flutter pulling on my nylon line made my heart leap. I waited, pausing the reeling motion when a strong tug told me it was time to set the hook. The end of my pole bent, causing my lips to spread into a wide smile. It was a good-sized fish putting up a fight. When I got it up to the boat, Jesse grabbed the net and scooped up the catch. A crappy the size of a dinner plate flopped around inside. I reached in the net and grabbed the fish by the bottom lip, freeing it from the hook. There it was in my hand, life. I could toss it in the cooler, fillet it out, and have a meal. But if I tossed it back in the lake, it could live another day. It could feed someone who needed it or make more fish. Leaning over the boat, I eased the fish back in the water. Jesse said nothing. He smiled, reclaimed his seat, and cast out his line. We fished that spot for a while until we pulled up anchor and relocated to another alcove. We didn't talk. We just enjoyed the time, the peace, the quiet, silently celebrating each catch and setting them free. His soul ran deeper than I knew, and somehow it managed to connect to mine. When we returned to the boat dock, I wrapped my arms around him and rested my head in his chest. Thank you. I whispered. After squeezing me back and kissing the top of my head, he handed me the poles to carry. Suddenly, I had an idea, one that, while unorthodox, was still somewhat ethical. I couldn't be two places at once, but that didn't mean I couldn't have a second set of eyes. Chapter 9 Paul Winstead and his partner Mary Folly had gotten themselves into a shitload of trouble after botching an investigation. The captain had suspected they were having an affair, and when they'd tainted evidence and let a detainee escape while they had a tryst, he knew his suspicions were validated. They'd been separated and assigned new partners. When the captain told them they'd be keeping an eye out on a single woman over in Clay, he knew it was only further punishment. To make matters worse, he had to call in reports to an FBI agent up in Wisconsin. Really, could his life get any worse? There was nothing more boring than a stakeout of a woman who lived in the woods. They waited until dark, pulled his cruiser to the end of the driveway, and looked through binoculars. The woman was talking to the floor, at least that's what Paul saw. Then she went to the door and opened it, letting two large pit bulls out. But these were the largest pit bulls he'd ever seen, and they had huge heads, too. The dog sniffed around, peed several times, then went back inside. Now he knew who she was talking to. What a pitiful woman, talking to dogs. They watched as she walked upstairs, then a light came on. They couldn't see anything from that angle, so Paul leaned his seat back and sent a message to the number he was given. Woman alone in the house with two dogs. Yep, this was a shit job. I'm a rookie, so I get why I'm out here, Jack Lawson, the green-eyed rookie, said. But what did you do to get this detail? Paul rolled his eyes. The kid had been good at staying quiet, thus far. 
It's not a detail. That's security work. She's a suspect. We're just supposed to watch her. Watch her do what? Anything shady. Just keep your eyes peeled for anything suspicious. They went back the next night, and the next night after that. The third night, he grew tired of watching this woman do nothing, so he pulled out his cell phone and started playing a game. Jack looked at Paul, shrugged his shoulders, and leaned his seat back. Paul said nothing, even as his new partner started to quietly snore. This was the mother of all shit jobs. When Mercy checked her trail cameras that morning, she noticed a squad car sitting just inside her driveway. She went back two days. It was there each night. She was being stalked. Again. Lava flowed through her veins. Blind rage encased every cell in her body. They had no reason to watch her. She was not going to stand for this. It didn't take long for Mercy to formulate a plan, and as the sun set, she waited. When it was dark, she and the dogs left out the back door and walked the trail thirty yards before cutting off in the new trail she cut that morning, circling behind the cop car. When they were close, she bent down and whispered, Watch them. The dogs both let out a low growl. She loved every moment of it. She'd trained them, and now it was time to watch them go to work. Guard. Both dogs crept up to the car, then leapt to the windows, barking like mad. She saw both of the officers inside jump back. She quickly called the girls off as she approached. They jumped out of the car and drew their weapons. Bertha and Mabel sat quietly on each side of Mercy as she stood there with her arms crossed over her chest. Good evening, officers. Her heart raced with excitement. She'd caught them sleeping. They both holstered their weapons. Good evening, the driver said. Big dogs you got there. Biggest pit bulls I ever saw. She allowed herself to finally smile. They're not pit bulls. They're American bulldogs. Care to tell me why you've been parking out here for a few days? Surely you must be bored by now. Orders, ma'am, the driver spoke again. His partner was shaking. Adrenaline still soaring from Mabel scaring the shit out of him. While she wanted to scream at them, she did the mercy thing to do. Well, you might as well come in and grab some coffee. Look around if you'd like. I got nothing to hide. The driver bowed his head slightly. I'm afraid you have the wrong idea, ma'am. You recently helped apprehend a violent killer. We were told to look after you while he's standing trial in case something bad happens. He nearly escaped custody and seems to be very angry with you. FBI ordered us to look after you until they're satisfied you're safe. It was bullshit, and she knew it. She'd already followed the case, and he was in a maximum security prison. He attended trial via closed circuit camera due to a health issue, which she also believed to be bullshit. Well, it'd still be easier to keep an eye on me from inside, don't you think? Come on, I'll put on some fresh coffee. You two are clearly tired. She started walking toward them, or to her driveway rather, when they both took a step back and simultaneously put their hands back on their weapons. Oh, don't shoot my girls. They won't bother you. Come along now. Feel free to pull up closer to the house. She reveled in the fact that they looked at each other confused. Neither knew how to proceed. Sit in a car alone with each other or enjoy coffee with a decent-looking woman. The choice seemed obvious. Leaving the door open, she walked into the kitchen and started a pot of coffee. When they entered, the younger officer closed the door behind them. Feel free to look around. I'm not asking for a warrant or anything. But if it makes you feel better, please be my guest. Coffee will be ready in a moment. If living in the South had taught her anything, it was that a little hospitality went a long way. Something she already knew, but practiced it in spades now. The older officer performed another head bow. That won't be necessary, ma'am. Unless you feel you're in danger, then we can secure the premises for you. Mercy smiled. I'm fine. The girls here protect me and my neighbor Joe just gifted me a shotgun. The younger officer's eyes widened. Do you know how to shoot a gun? I do now. Joe showed me how to hold it so I don't hurt myself. He lectured me heavily on gun safety, too. Oh, the gun is under the couch over there if you need to see it or anything. 
I figured it was the best hiding spot I had. She pulled out a coffee cake and plated a piece for each of them. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know either of your names. The young guy with the green eyes spoke first. Jack Lawson, ma'am. Paul Winstead. The other finally said with a nod. Mind if I take the ammo out of the gun while we're here? She tried not to grit her teeth as she shrugged. You do whatever you want, hun. If it makes you feel better, then go on and empty it out. I don't really need it with two armed guards, do I? He gave her a smile, then walked over to the couch, knelt down, and pulled it out. Damn, that's a nice shotgun. You really shouldn't keep it on the tile floor, though. It'll get condensation and rust. Just put some hooks on the wall like a display. He opened it, took the bullets out, placing them on the table. Then he carried the gun over to the kitchen table and set it down. He was separating the gun from the ammo. Mercy wasn't stupid. Officer Lawson looked at the gun. That's an expensive gun. Why'd your neighbor give it to you? She began filling mugs with coffee. It was his daughter I saved from that serial killer. He was grateful. That much was true. His eyes were filled with tears as he hugged her. He'd already lost his wife in a car accident, and his daughter was all he had left. He gave her the gun, the shooting and safety lessons she didn't need, and a metal box full of bullets. Just in case. She was a terrible shot on purpose, figuring it would add to her cover story should she need one. She managed to get close enough to the target to do enough damage that Joe ended the lesson telling her to practice. The officers gladly took their coffee to the living room and ate the coffee cake. I tell you, that agent has become obsessed with me. She really didn't need to make you guys look after me. That's just a waste of tax dollars. Mercy sipped at her coffee and put on a stress-out face for the officers. She's already been here herself. What more does she want? Officer Winstead set his empty plate on the coffee table and looked up at her. I was wondering what her interest is in you. Mercy pouted for their benefit and put down her mug. I may as well tell you, this is a small town and there's already talk. Back in Chicago, I was the victim of a violent attack. I was raped, beaten, and left for dead. Officer Lawson looked down. I'm awfully sorry to hear that, ma'am. After six weeks in a coma, a punctured lung, some brain damage, and rods and pins in my leg, I finally went home. That's when Special Agent Murphy Morgan came waltzing into my life. She's been chasing that Michelangelo killer for years and needed the work, I guess. Anyway, she said my case fell under her jurisdiction. The guy who did it was handed a long sentence but ended up making a deal with the feds to inform on his cellmate. But the agent just keeps coming back. I mean, I've always cooperated with law enforcement. Heck, even when I went to the cabin to get away from everything, I gave them a key, told them they could come and go as they pleased. Lawson's eyes squinted. Why would the police need to scour a victim's house? Oh, that. Well, another victim of the same man. Hang on, let me back up. So, there was the guy that hurt me, but there was a mastermind who was getting sickos to do the same thing to other women. He's the one she was after. He was into that abuse porn, you know? She shook her head. Telling the story was so hard, even when it was to her advantage. Scat? Jesus, I'm sorry, ma'am. You were saying? Winstead leaned in, resting his elbows on his knees. My last dog was murdered during my attack, but we spent a lot of time volunteering at the hospital there, the children's wing. So, there was a nurse who was also a victim. She worked in that hospital. I spent some time with her, you know, in support because I knew how she felt. But she wasn't so lucky. She didn't make it. To make matters worse, some freak stole her dead body, so the case is still open. And since that FBI agent can't catch her serial killer, this is all she has to focus on. I've been so nice. I invited her in even when I caught her skulking around outside the cabin in Michigan. I've let her and her partner look around my house. I don't know what else I can do. She sniffed for added measure. I mean, I can't cooperate any more than I am, but I just want to be left alone. Look at me. I live alone in the woods with two dogs. Lawson shook his head. Chicago, Michigan, Alabama. She's chased you all over the country. Mercy nodded. And all I've done is managed to survive a horrible experience. It's like she won't let me move on. I've never hurt anyone. I just want to heal. She put her head in her hands. 
I'm a law-abiding citizen, a paralegal for Pete's sake. I shouldn't have to go through this. Winstead stood from his seat. Lawson followed his lead. I'm sorry to have bothered you, ma'am. You have a peaceful night, you hear? He reached in his shirt pocket and pulled out a card. If you ever need anything, you just call. She took the card and nodded. You're so nice, thank you. When the two officers pulled out of her driveway, she danced a victory dance. Fuck you, Murphy. Chapter 10 Sitting at my desk looking over the information my partner needed to gather, I was trying to decide which of these characters could train so many people to kill efficiently. My bureau cell phone rang. It was the captain of the state police in Alabama. I was eager to hear what they'd seen. We're not stalking this girl for you any longer, Agent Morgan. She's not a threat to anyone. And if you have some weird obsession with a rape victim, take it up on your own. We have better ways to spend our resources. Excuse me? His voice cracked. This girl has no sheet. She's never been convicted of anything. And from what I hear, she's lucky to be alive and sane. She's harmless, and you're wasting our time. I closed my eyes. I knew this was a risk. Harmless? Did you know she beat a man and stabbed him with a knife? He was quiet on the other end of the line for a moment. According to the report on file in Chicago, she and her friend were attacked outside her home. She defended them with a baseball bat and stabbed the man with the knife she took from him. That sounds an awful lot like self-defense to me, not to mention the Chicago Police Department who were actually there. Damn, he was prepared for the call. There has been evidence... Is there an open investigation at the Bureau on Mercy Connell? Shit, he had me. I'll take your silence as a resounding no. Good day, ma'am. The phone beeped in my ear as he hung up. Thankfully, Shaw hadn't been in the office to witness my frustration and humiliation. He wouldn't have approved in the first place. Like everyone else, he saw Mercy as a sweet, innocent little victim. But I saw it in her... I saw it in her eyes. She was going to snap. I'd almost been convinced otherwise, but the hair was proof enough to keep digging. She'd spent a full six months at that cabin in Michigan, at least I presumed because she was there when I drove past. She didn't work. She just stayed in the cabin with those dogs. Then she picked up and moved all the way to Alabama, in the middle of the woods where no one could see what she was up to. Agent Morgan. The intercom in my office blasted Jocelyn Nightwell's voice into the air. Yes, I called out. Please come to my office. Yes, ma'am. I closed my laptop and headed down the hall toward the acting director's office, hoping it was good news. We could really use a break in this vigilante case. When I stepped into her doorway, she looked anything but pleased. Her graying hair pulled back into a French twist and dark-rimmed reading glasses resting at the end of her nose, she looked like an angry librarian. When her eyes flashed up at me, they narrowed. Close the door. After closing the door, I stepped toward her desk. Sit. Once seated, she closed the lid to her laptop and folded her hands on her desk. In 30 years, no one has ever accused me of failing to communicate. Do you think I'm difficult to understand? Ma'am? I gulped. She pulled her glasses off and tossed them on the table. Do I mumble, do I stutter, or otherwise emulate some speech impediment to which I'm unaware? No, ma'am. Damn, I wasn't the only one to receive a call. So when I said to stay away from the Connell girl and that it was a direct order, I was clear? Yes, ma'am. No. No. No, this could not be happening. She narrowed her eyes at me again. So you admit that you knowingly and deliberately violated a direct order? Regretfully, yes, ma'am. Nightwell leaned back in her office chair and stared at me. Murphy, I expect this from the guys, a rookie maybe, but you're one of the better agents. Until today, your record was impeccable. Now you leave me with a difficult decision. My record? Wait. I, uh, I'd really like not to have this in my file. Perhaps there's another way. Her brows lifted. I'm listening. The first offense is usually three days without pay. I would like to take three personal days to take time to think about my priorities. And you'll stay away from the Connell girl. Yes, I agreed. And that wasn't a question, you understand? That is still a standing order. 
Never in my career had I wanted to cry at work. At this very moment, I was having a difficult time keeping it together. There was a lump in my throat. My stomach rolled. My hands shook. That is abundantly clear, ma'am. And you'll see the staff shrink. There's some reason you're obsessed with this girl, Murphy. And it's not healthy. You have real criminals out there, and you're so distracted with this victim. You're forgetting about the guys we're supposed to be making miserable. Leave this girl alone now, do you understand? The next time, I'm not going to accept personal time in therapy. I'm going to reprimand you. Jocelyn Nightwell was not known for being light-handed. It had been my record and my respect for her up until now that had earned me this one pass. I knew it. She knew it. For what it's worth, I really thought I was following a sound lead. My gut is never wrong, and... Her face began to turn red, presumably with anger. I clamped my mouth shut for a moment. What I mean to say is that I apologize for my error in judgment. I intend to show you that I still have value to the Bureau and to you, ma'am. I left her office feeling like the kid who got caught peeking at Christmas presents. Still fighting tears, I went straight to my office to gather my things. Murph? Shaw walked in and closed the door. What is it? I couldn't look at him. I'm taking a few days off. What? Why? What happened? Are you okay? Shaw grabbed my wrist. We'd been partners for a long time, and physical contact was not something we practiced. Either I take the time off voluntarily, or get handed admin leave. I'm going voluntarily. I closed my briefcase and snapped the latches. Stop. What the hell happened? You'd never get admin leave. There has to be some mistake. He released my wrist. Look at me. When I looked up, he saw the guilt in my eyes. Murph! He gasped. What did you do? Look, Shaw. I violated a direct order. Now just let me get out of here. Shaw stepped in front of the door. Not a chance, Morgan. We've been partners for years. Now you sit down right now and tell me what the hell is going on. I deserve to know what you did. I don't have to sit down, Mercy, okay? It was Mercy. With a huff, he grabbed the doorknob and jerked the door open. Yes, you need a few days off. And he turned his head away, ashamed of me. Maybe everyone else was right, and this one time I was wrong. Mercy was, in fact, a victim of a horrendous crime, and I was chasing her around on nothing other than gut instinct. It wasn't fair, nor was it lawful. I was wrong. I was never wrong before, and I hated the way this felt. I hated Shaw looking away from me in shame. Still, I bolted out the door and made record time getting to the parking garage. How would I explain this to Jesse? Would he have the same reaction as Shaw? Would he turn away from me, too? Chapter 11 Two Glorious Days Without Nightmares Mercy wondered what kind of paradox she was to suffer from violent nightmares daily unless she took a life. Each time she took some dirt bag off the streets, she slept like a baby. The first night, she slept twelve hours straight, waking dry as a bone. The second night, she slept ten hours, had euphoric dreams, and woke happy and rested. The third night, she was fine after six hours, but after getting up to use the restroom and returning to bed, she was plagued with violence in her dreams. Violence and pain. She woke, stripped the bed, and hit the shower, angry that her reprieve didn't last longer. She'd left the dog door open for the girls since she was sleeping more than six hours. But now, she knew her nights would grow shorter. Who wants to go to bed when that's what you have to look forward to? After her shower, some breakfast, and time with the girls, she hit the office to edit some work so she could have that steady, legitimate income. She worked for nine hours, only taking quick breaks to grab food, drink, or use the bathroom. Other than that, she sat at her computer and plowed through files, sending them off one by one. Freddie's system was working so well for her, she was getting the work done of four legal secretaries. When her cell rang, it startled her. She didn't recognize the number but she did recognize the area code, Milwaukee. Hello? A male voice spoke. Miss Connell, it's Jack Shaw. She cringed, then put on a fake smile, hoping it oozed through the phone. Ain't Shaw, how are you? I'm very well, Mercy. 
I was wondering the same about you. How are you holding up? Holding up? The man chuckled on the other end. Come on, Mercy. You've been through an awful lot, had people interfering in your life. That's got to be stressful. He was too nice, but he was that way in person. She actually liked him. It has been, but I just buried myself in work. I'm lucky enough to have several clients now, so that keeps me busy. I hope you don't mind, but I sent a package to you. It should arrive today. Glancing at the clock, she knew the mail had been delivered. I'll go check. She hurried down the stairs and spotted a box on her porch. Looking at the dogs, she rolled her eyes. You're both fired. I'm sorry, he said on the other end of the phone. My lazy dogs didn't bother to even bark when the package was delivered. She giggled. So much for guard dogs, huh? Jack Shaw laughed. They're probably just used to the mailman. I wouldn't let it bother me. She tore the seal open and pulled back the cardboard. Inside the box was dog treats and toys. Mr. Shaw. I know how much they mean to you, and they were so beautiful and well-behaved I thought they could use some spoiling. Below the stuffed animals was a bottle of wine. I didn't think you were supposed to mail alcohol. And their mom could use some spoiling, too. He cleared his throat. We're trained to notice things. I noticed you had a particular fondness for that brand. I hope it's okay. Real tears stung her eyes. You didn't have to do this. I'm afraid I did. I wanted to. I'm in awe of your strength and determination. I'd like to think if my sister survived, she'd be just like you. His sister? Had she been through the same ordeal? I'm so touched. She clutched the wine to her chest. Thank you. I was going to send a card, but I'd rather say it straight to you. I honestly wish you the best, Mercy. Starting over can be a challenge, but I suspect with that personality, you'll be among friends soon. Goodbye. His voice had shaken at the end before he hung up. She felt the toys for wires. After Murphy's obsession with her, she wasn't taking any chances. Nothing but stuffing could be felt, so she tossed them to the dogs, looked at the treats, which were organic and grain-free. She went into the kitchen and put them in the cabinet, placing the wine in the wine rack. When she returned to her office, she looked up Jack Shaw on her private computer. It took some digging, but she found what she was looking for, and what had happened to his sister. Oh, that's horrible. There's too many of us, her reflection replied. Not wanting to give in to her illness, she ignored it, refusing to respond. Her burner buzzed in her pocket. Tommy had another job. This one was different. Humiliation. No killing. Make up your mind, she complained. When she opened the file that he sent through the private link, she almost declined. This was up close and personal. If she screwed up, she'd be exposed. She decided to contact her mentor on her private computer to place a voice call to Rose's last known number. How's my progeny? Rose said as she answered. She hated asking for help, and her relationship with Rose was odd at best. I have a job I'm not sure if I should do. I could use some guidance. After a moment of silence, she continued. So, I thought now would be a great time for you to visit. My house is like a retreat anyway, so take a vacation day and come see me. I'll make some dinner. Done, Rose said with a laugh. If you're feeding me, I'm there. I'm in Atlanta, so I can be there by tonight. Tonight? Why was she so close? Sounds good. Need directions. Laughter echoed in her speakers. As if I didn't put a trace on the GPS on your phone, Mercy. I always know where you are and what you've been up to. God, this woman is terrifying. Thanks. See you tonight. She ended the call and put her head in her hands. Back to hiding. She stared at her reflection again, the specter that hovered always. It was weird, seeing yourself outside your own body. She considered the medicine again. Maybe she should take it. The reflection entered the door to the basement. Mercy actually heard the footsteps. She was definitely losing her mind. She went to the basement door and slowly crept down the steps. When she reached the bottom, she felt confused disoriented. 
There she stood, staring at herself. You're freaking out again, the specter said. No, I'm not. At least you're talking to me. She shrugged at Mercy and sat on a leather sofa Mercy didn't remember buying. Looking around the room was eerie. There was a bar, a large screen television, and she could see a bed through an open door. You stay down here? I mean, we stay down here? Mercy, for fuck's sake. Would you take the medication already? I never know who I'm talking to anymore. When the bedroom door slammed, Mercy ran up the stairs and slammed the door to the basement. Her hands shook. The sound of rushing water invaded her ears once again. What the absolute fuck is going on with me? Rose was on her way. She could not afford a breakdown. The one thing Mercy was good at was keeping records and receipts. She ran up to her office, ripped the top off her storage box, and went back to her shopping spree for her house. She grabbed the file, threw it on her desk, and started rifling through the file. Her heart felt as if it stopped when she found the receipts. Not for one couch, but two. Then another receipt for a 50-inch flat-screen television, the one in the basement, two beds, two sets of dressers, clothing from stores she didn't even like. She was broken inside. It had to be the brain damage. She didn't have time for a meltdown. Rose was coming. She had two hours at best. Tossing everything in the box, she grabbed her car keys, loaded the dogs in her Jeep, and headed to the grocery store. The dogs were happy in the back, looking out the windows. Mercy tapped on the steering wheel, trying to get it together. Rose was coming. She was breaking inside. She saw herself. But how was that even possible? You can't slam doors from twenty feet away. She pulled up outside the wind dixie then rolled the windows down and headed into the store. You're just going to leave the dogs in there like that? A woman yelled at her. Mercy froze in her tracks. The windows are down. She'd never leave them in a hot car. Was this woman crazy? The woman put her hands on her hips. Those dogs can jump out of that truck and bite someone. She looked back at her Jeep, then at the woman. They're trained to guard the truck, so I'd stay away from it. With that, she left the exasperated woman standing there and rushed into the store. She grabbed steaks, some items for salad, and a loaf of French bread. After paying for her purchase, she rushed out of the store to find a small group standing, staring at her Jeep. The dogs were going crazy. What are you doing? She yelled. A man was standing with his arms crossed over his chest. You just going to leave your dogs in the car? The first woman who'd yelled at her was standing with her hands on her hips again, lips pursed, troublemaking asshole that she was. As I explained to her, the windows are down so it doesn't get too hot in there for them. They're very well trained. They won't exit the Jeep unless I tell them to. She stepped toward her Jeep, but the man stepped in her way. I ain't done with you. His breath stunk of beer and cigarettes. Mercy smiled up at him. That's good to hear. Mind if I put these groceries down so you can talk to me? He squinted at her as he stepped aside. She opened the back to her Jeep and put her bags inside. Both the girls still were barking when she calmly said, Sit. The girls sat and quit barking, though they were growling. She left the door opened and turned back to the man. You were saying? He uncrossed his arms and stuck his finger in her face. It ain't right to have them big dogs loose in a public place. Someone could have been hurt, the troublemaking asshole shouted. Mercy sat on the bumper and crossed her feet. Well, no one was hurt. My girls did as they were supposed to. They stayed in the Jeep and they weren't barking until you folks decided to gather. Now they're quiet. So now what? It's irresponsible, she screamed. She'd had enough. Well, I have a guest coming, so I'm going to go home, make some dinner, and forget about this. She stood from her bumper. Now hang on there, sweetheart. The man shoved her back down. Something in Mercy snapped. Grabbing the man by the wrist, she wrenched his arm behind his back while sweeping his knees out from under him. The sound his knees made when they hit the blacktop was a mixture of a thud and a crack. Guard, she ordered. The girls jumped out of the jeep and stood next to her, growling at the small crowd. The troublemaker screeched, 
A woman next to her pulled out Mace and aimed it at Mercy. Using the man's arm, she spun him in front of the aerosol. He screamed and covered his eyes with his free hand as it hit his face. She let go of him and kicked the spray out of the woman's hand. The troublemaker was fumbling in her purse, and when she produced a thirty-eight, Mercy made double time disarming her. She twisted the gun out of the woman's wrist, flipped it open, and emptied the bullets on the ground. Shoot me or my dogs, I swear to Christ, lady, it'll be the last thing you do. Now I'm getting in my car and going home. This was so unnecessary. She looked at the other two women standing there. They hadn't said anything, but the shock on their face told her they were just bystanders. Load up, she yelled at the dogs. When they were inside the jeep, she backed up slowly, keeping her eyes on them. Next time, mind your own goddamned business. She hopped in her jeep and roared the engine to life. Her heart slammed as she sped out of the wind, Dixie. She just couldn't catch a break. What the hell was wrong with those people? Before she was even home, her cell phone rang. Miss Connell? Yes? This is Brian Anderson, the manager at Winn-Dixie. Fuck. Yes? He cleared his throat. I understand you were accosted outside our store? How on earth did you know it was me and how did you get my number so fast? She was going to jail. She just knew it. Brian Anderson gave a soft laugh on the other end of the line. Ma'am, your shopper's card is connected to your info. All we had to do was match security tape to the timestamp on the receipt. Anyway, the management at Winn-Dixie would like to apologize for what you experienced in our parking lot. This wasn't real. She was hallucinating. Um, it's okay. I handled it. Yes. Another chuckle. You did. Those three have been causing a raucous in our lot this last month. They corner someone, harass them, and while the victim is arguing with one person, the others steal their purse or groceries. It's quite a scam they've been running. But thanks to you, they were slowed down long enough that our security detained them until the police could arrive. Police. Shit. More questions. I really just want to be left alone, Mr. Anderson. Tears stung her eyes. She had the worst luck on the planet. That's understandable, ma'am. But the management at Winn-Dixie has put a $100 gift certificate on your account for your assistance in apprehending these criminals who have been running this scam on our customers. Without people like you standing up for yourselves, people like this always get away with their bullying and theft. Have a good day, ma'am. Um, thank you. She tossed her cell on the seat next to her as she pulled into her drive. Sitting on the trunk of a Monte Carlo was Rose. Thought you were standing me up? She hopped off the trunk and walked toward Mercy's Jeep. I, uh, went to grab a few things for dinner and ran into some trouble. She let the dogs out of the back who barked quickly at Rose before peeing all over everything they could find in the yard. Wow, Mabel has gotten huge. Rose watched the dogs and smiled. But yeah, trouble has a way of finding us, doesn't it? Her dark, spiky hair didn't move as she shook her head. You handled it? Mercy pulled the bags out of the back. Yes, but it made you wait. For that, I'm sorry. They walked into the house and Mercy went to work, chopping vegetables and heating a grill pan. Rose sat on a bar stool and watched. So tell me, how'd you deal with the kids? Her hands froze in mid-cut of a cucumber. What? Rose grinned and leaned on the counter, resting her chin in her palm. They called you Catwoman, but wouldn't say anything else. Just Catwoman saved us. How'd you pull that one off? She nearly asked how Rose knew it was her, but the answer was obvious. The woman was following her every move, which was unnerving. I just kept talking to them. They were so scared, so cold, it made me ill. But I kept it together, kept them participating. But I kept my face covered with one of those black ski masks. No, how? How did you get them to keep your secret? They literally gave the cops nothing when it came to you. Nothing. Not even eye color. Which one of them had to notice? Mercy stared at her for a moment while she considered the question. Then she resumed cutting the cucumber. Kids are like dogs. Or maybe dogs are like kids. You just gotta talk to them. Besides, they thought no one was coming for them. They thought they'd die. I saved them. Kids get it. She put the heel of her boot on the chair next to her butt and rested her elbow on top. It drove Mercy crazy the way this woman moved, acted, sat.
It was like dealing with a teenager that refused to be housebroken. So why didn't you snuff him out? Why let him live? I figured with all that evidence, he'd go to jail where he can experience rape from the other side. She cleared her throat. But I'm going to keep tabs on the situation. She didn't invite Rose to her house for an inquisition. So how is the art world treating you? I've been busy planning something new while making a little side cash. Bagged two dirt balls last week alone. Got an embezzler on the books as well as another nasty pedophile. She cleared her throat. Heard you called the feds on a serial killer. Heard that, did you? What was this? Tit for tat? She placed the steaks on the grill pan, trying to figure out how to have a normal conversation with this abnormal woman. It was more like I spotted a way out of a shitty situation. I called in the Fed who won't leave me alone. I figured if she could use me, I could use her. It worked. I'm free. A killer is behind bars. She began setting the table while the steaks cooked. With the table set, she walked around the dogs who were enthused by the smell and loitering in the area. She flipped the stakes and looked at Rose. Thank you for coming all the way over here to see me. I need the company and the guidance. Rose stared at the countertop. She ran her fingers through her spiky hair. Honestly, Mercy, I don't know how to do this very well. I've been alone for so long. Being with people is a challenge. In that moment, Mercy saw her, truly saw her. She was lonely, flawed, emotional. Rose may be a stone-cold killer, sure, but she was damaged in a way most would never understand. Really, just, just be you, whatever that is. I'll be me. Together, we'll figure it out. Just keep your feet off my damned furniture. It's driving me crazy. Mercy laughed and threw a dinner roll at her. Besides, I'm pretty much a loner, too, except for the girls here. As long as I feed them and don't hurt them, they'll stick around. Rose shook her head. You're not a loner. You're just choosy. She pulled the steaks off the grill pan and glanced at Rose. How in the hell do you come to that conclusion? That SVU cop liked you. She hung around for a while. That cute hacker, he's got it bad. The neighbors, they would do anything for you. The secretary at that law office, she considers you a friend. Sylvia trusts you with her very existence. Then Rose's words became muffled. Whatever she said next, Mercy's brain shut out. The sensation of being slammed against something hard knocked the wind out of Mercy. She dropped the plate on the counter and held on to the edge. Her heart felt as if it were going to rip out of her chest in a violent attempt at escape. Rose? The walls started to cave. Everything started to go black. Oh, no, you don't. The last thing Mercy saw was Rose's boots on the counter as she jumped. Chapter 12 Jesse, my saving grace. He didn't judge me, nor did he admonish me. Instead, he held me as I sulked. He encouraged me to stay busy, organizing nearly every minute of my time off. I was afforded one hour a day of free time while he made business calls and answered emails. I used that time to catch up on the news. The media was having a field day with the killings. There were articles on everything from serial killers to which states had open carry laws. That's all we needed was a bunch of nervous armed citizens. Little did they know most of the victims had lost their right to even own a gun due to felony convictions. I knew the profiles already. I knew who was responsible. Vigilante killing is special. There's a paradox at the heart of vigilantism. These people actually feel they're doing a service, acting as a de facto branch of law enforcement. Vigilantes feel they're upholding the social moral code, even though they're acting outside of the very law which is indicative of that moral code. Usually middle-aged white males practice vigilantism, but there hadn't been enough studies for that to be conclusive. Not every killer fit neatly in the box either. There were men and women, both white and minority, that have committed serial murder and vigilante acts. The box often narrowed the scope, but the M.E. in Marilyn's words kept playing in my head. Women are neat killers. The hits were clean. They were quick, from a distance, and often no one saw anything suspicious. It was time we stopped looking for men and started widening our search for women particularly women suffering from PTSD from abuse. And I'll be damned if Mercy Connell doesn't fit that description to a T. The article on the page was about two murders in Atlanta, Georgia, within hours of each other. Hours that Mercy Connell was under the watchful eye of a private investigator I hired to watch her. 
Technically, he was a bounty hunter. Technically, this was paid from my personal bank account. But the guy was good. Former special forces. Clean record. Flawless, in fact. So I called him up. I'm looking for our girl's whereabouts yesterday between the hours of two until eight. She heard pages flipping. She was at home. You saw her? Yes, ma'am. The vehicle was in the drive and she was in the garden. Damn. Tuesday, between the hours of five until nine. The prior killing. Where had she been then? Home. Ma'am, she rarely leaves home. I can tell why you're concerned about her. She's often seen talking to herself, muttering. She talks to thin air, reacts to things I cannot see. She's a bit special. Mercy was cracking. Excellent. Thank you. Two more weeks as agreed. Yes, I'll watch the crazy person for two more weeks. Easiest job I've ever had. I tried not to get excited. Mercy cracking meant she'd hurt someone. But I knew the signs. I knew. It was my job to spot it. That quality that only serial killers possess. I'd seen it so many times before, not only in my own experience, but in the countless interviews I watched. You're up to no good. Jesse said with his arms crossed over his chest. I may have cheated and checked on a case. I offered an innocent shrug and a smile for good measure. He climbed on the couch behind me and began massaging my shoulders. You have to let her go, Murphy. Your career is too important. Too late. I know. Have you heard from your partner? It was a slap in the face, Shaw not returning my messages. No. The thought of losing Shaw as a partner had gutted me. I trusted the man with my life. I couldn't do what I did without him. He had a keen investigative mind and a certain charm that set people at easy. He was an asset, and I may have lost him. He will forgive you, Murphy. A knock at the door startled me. When I stood from the couch and looked to the door, I saw Jack Shaw standing on my porch. Jesus, are you psychic? Jesse only smiled at me in return. Answer the door. When I opened the door, Jack couldn't look me in the eye. It hurt. Murph. Shaw, come in, I said as I held the door open wider. Jack. Jesse said as he stood. Nice to see you again, Jesse. Mind if have a chat with my partner? He nodded in my direction, still failing to look at me. Jesse shook Jack's hand and headed to his office, closing the door behind him. I sat on the couch and waited for the tongue lashing that I knew was coming. Do you want to be my partner? The question nearly knocked the wind out of me. Yes, Jack. I want to continue to be your partner. His head bobbed up and down. Then he stood in silence for a moment. Finally, he took a seat in the lazy boy. When his eyes met mine, I felt like a child that had come home late for curfew. I'm working this case alone, Murphy. I'm working it alone because you are flat out stalking a woman who suffered a horrendous injustice. If that's not bad enough, it was our branch of the government that stripped her of her justice and cut her attacker a deal. Then you go and make her miserable. You stalk her. You fucking chase after this woman who is fighting so hard to keep it together. He reached inside his jacket and pulled out photos. They were of Mercy's broken and battered naked body. He threw them on the table. This is what you're doing to her over and over again. If you don't stop, then I will ask for us to be separated. I can't stand you for what you've done. Shaw has a personal and emotional tie to this sort of crime. His family had suffered through it. For him, this was personal. Jack, I... No, do not jack me, Murphy. His face reddened. He was glaring at me, but at least he was looking at me. I wanted to cry. FBI agent or not, Jack was family and it was killing me to see him like this. He put his finger on top of the photos. This, he said as he pounded his finger on top the photos, happened to her. While you have become obsessed with her, this person in the photos right here, I've been working around the clock on this new case. God damn it, Murphy. I have a partner for a reason. I'm sorry. Sorry? You're sorry. See the Murphy Morgan I know. She might bend the rules, manipulate the system a bit to get a confession, or a piece of the puzzle to save a life, but she still stays within the rules. You violated a direct order and for what? To make a woman crack so you can watch? 
What kind of person does that, Murph? What kind of person are you? Moisture pooled at the bottom of his lids. His bottom lip quivered. I'd never seen Jack this emotional. I hoped never to see it again. Because if this, he said as he pointed at the photos one last time, is who you are, then I want nothing more to do with you. Shame. Guilt. Nausea. I made a mistake. I hated how impish I felt, how childish I sounded. That is how my sister looked. So, when you offend her, you hurt her, you hurt me. Do you get that? I nodded. Loud and clear. Now, he said as he stood from the chair, people are getting murdered. Sylvia McDermott's mother is missing. I'll be at the office at four. I expect to see the old Murphy Morgan there, not some self-absorbed, obsessive twat. Get it together. He said nothing more. He no longer looked at me, but marched out the front door, slamming it behind him. Sitting on the couch, I stared into empty space, feeling shell-shocked. Jack had never spoken to me that way. As strongly as I felt and as much as I wanted to follow it, I just couldn't. I couldn't afford to lose everything. I picked up my phone and sent a message to the investigator. Payment would be sent in full, but the job was over. I couldn't lose Jack. I couldn't lose my job. Mercy Connell would be the end of me, of my career. Check Chapter 13 The world looked different from the floor. Rose was staring down at her with a smile on her face. There you are. Can we eat already? She sat up and looked around. The dogs were at her feet, whining. What happened? Rose stood, pulling Mercy with her. I think you had a panic attack or something. You blacked out. Don't worry. I protected that pretty little head from hitting the floor. Why did I panic? She fought to remember what had happened. Rose leaned against the counter. I think you were getting emotional when I reminded you how many people actually cared about you. It's time for you to come to terms with life, Mercy. You can't keep shutting out the truth. I feel fine. A little weird, but fine. Shutting out the truth? What the hell was she talking about? Me? When Mercy turned her head toward the voice, she saw her doppelganger staring back at her. She looked at Rose. Do you see her? Rose shook her head. How many times do we have to do this? Yes, I can see Sylvia. No, she's not a ghost. She's not dead. She lives here with you. I don't understand. Sylvia was dead? Wasn't she? Sylvia approached. Mercy, I've been here the whole time. I was there when you had your miscarriage. I lived in the basement there like I do here. You see me, you ignore me. Act as if I'm a ghost or something. Hell, this was all your idea. My idea? Sylvia huffed. You came to me in the hospital. You and that nurse from the children's wing helped me fake my death. Nurse Wilson even helped me stock up on medications we might need along the way. You hid me in your basement. We were both in on killing that piece of shit that raped and damned near killed me, remember? I scared him and you stabbed him in the neck. Flashes of memory were keeping Mercy confused. Sylvia was there, hiding behind a dumpster. She jumped out and said, Boo! Distracting the man, while Mercy shoved an ice pick in his neck. It was Sylvia that got rid of the bloody glove in the hospital's biohazard disposal. Why had she shut everything out? Look. Sylvia picked up the plate with three steaks. Why did you buy three steaks? Because your subconscious knows I'm here but I'd bet my left breast you thought you cooked, too. Mercy put her hands on her head. How? Why? Rose put her hand on her shoulder. Sylvia said you were diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. They prescribed you Haldol. You'd begun to combine your, uh, what is it? Sylvia leaned against the counter, looking exhausted. You developed a second personality after your attack to help you cope. This is why you have blackouts. This is why you lose time. We have to beat this, Mercy. You have to fight. Mercy shook her head. That explains why I was never worried about the dogs when I left for a job. Sylvia laughed. Exactly. Because you knew I was here for them. You know I love them. I would do anything for you. For them. 
I cared for them in Michigan while you were in training. Rose taught me how to shoot, how to walk like you, talk like you. You were there for all of it. Mercy looked to Rose, then to Sylvia. Despite her craziness, they were there, unafraid. She had to trust them. She had no one else. I don't want to take the hall doll. It makes me feel ill. Sylvia shrugged. I don't care if you take it or not, but you have to fight. You have to get your head screwed on straight. I'm alive because of you. I don't live in fear, and that's because of you. You're so strong, Mercy. The other you. That other personality that takes over. She's unafraid. That's not a stranger. That's the strength in you that takes over when you feel you can't handle the situation. Just fight. She wanted to cry. She wanted to run back to her old, quiet life before Willie. Rose cracked her neck. How do you feel? Freaked out, but okay, I guess. Good, then let's eat. She followed Rose to the table and sat. Rose and Sylvia carried the food in and placed it on the table. There was an uneasy silence that was irritating her. Sorry for blacking out on you, she said in a low voice. Rose sat, scooting her chair in. It was nothing I haven't seen before. My brother used to black out like that. Your blood pressure rises, and your brain decides to take a vacation. No biggie. They ate dinner in silence. Rose was too absorbed in the home-cooked meal to talk, and Mercy felt embarrassed. What kind of assassin has panic attacks? What sort of person can convince herself another human in the house doesn't even exist? <laughs> she knew she'd suffered some brain damage from Willie's attack, but whatever her doctors told her evaded her. It was like she refused to listen. She had no idea how it had affected her, but she seemed to have all of her motor skills, so she tried not to worry. Still, blacking out was dangerous, especially in her new line of work. The more she tried to take control of her life, the more she realized control was a joke, a fallacy, a false notion that gave people false hope. She couldn't just give up. She had to keep moving forward. Rose leaned back in her chair, finished with her dinner. That was the bomb. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Mercy stood and began clearing the table. Sylvia excused herself to the basement, claiming she needed a hot bath. About this job, what, what's the deal? Why do you need my help? She shrugged as she put their plates in the dishwasher. Forget it. I'm going to pass. In a typical Rose move, she hopped up and sat on the countertop. Why? Ignoring the question, she opened the freezer and pulled out a bottle of Grey Goose. I've been saving this for you well for when you were here. Rose's lips spread into a wide smile. Mix up two, then spill about this case. Mercy dropped ice into two rocks glasses. She poured in the vodka. Public humiliation. They want him humiliated. Oh, interesting. No kill. Rose shook her head. I don't like it. Dead victims don't talk. Mercy nodded as she handed a drink to Rose. Let's go to my office. I'll show you the file. After Rose read everything Mercy had, she leaned forward, resting her elbows on her knees. So, let me see if I get this right. This guy rapes one of his college classmates, films it, posts it online, and gets, what, six months? Mercy nodded as she swallowed a mouthful of her drink. She swirled the ice around. Yep, six months, and he's suspected of more, but there's no evidence or not enough anyway. The family wants something done that will ruin him. A sinister laugh echoed through the room. He's in college. How hard can that be? Rose, this means he'll see my face. I mean, I have some disguises, latex applications for the face, but still. What if he goes to the police? She tilted her head, her dark brown eyes squinting as she smiled. Because he won't remember a thing. Come on, let's go. Go? Rose shot out of her chair. Yep, time to see my operation. The dogs, I can't leave them. She rolled her eyes. It's about 20 minutes away and they have Sylvia. Just trust me. Reluctantly, she followed her serial killer mentor out to her Monte Carlo and climbed in. The inside was remarkably clean, and it still smelled like new leather. She relaxed a little and stared out the passenger window.
They drove for exactly 20 minutes when they pulled into a small campground. Rose parked outside a huge diesel motorhome. Welcome to my humble commode. She lived in a motorhome? It was nice, really nice, but death for pay paid well. She unlocked the door, and Mercy followed her up the steps. The floors were marble, the couches were white leather. For some reason, Mercy expected a shithole apartment somewhere urban. This was unexpected. Rose knelt down in front of a couch and lifted the seat to expose a storage area underneath. She pulled out a large black tackle box and flipped it open. So, you know what a roofie is, right? Of course, Mercy said before she swallowed hard. This, she said as she picked up a pill bottle, is better. My own little concoction turns them into zombies. You can make them do anything you want, and the best part? The next day they have no memory. You can erase about 48 hours from their memory. He won't remember you what you had him do, nothing. Side effects? She shrugged. Feels like a hangover. I took it myself to test it out. Pharmaceuticals were no joke. Mercy thought about the long-term damage to the kid, but decided he'd earned it. Rape earned a death sentence, in her opinion. Right, wrong, or indifferent, he had to pay for his crime. The file said he likes to drug his victims, so we'll get him in a bar and dose him first. I'll be watching so you'll know if there's anything in your drink. I can give you a signal and you can order something different. Mercy's eyes widened. You'll go with me. She shrugged. You keep the money, of course. You gotta build that bankroll for when it's time to flee. But sure, I'll go with and watch your back. She pulled another box out of her storage area. This you put on your throat here. It'll disguise your voice for the recording so no one will be able to capture your true voice. The blue one makes you sound like a man. The pink makes your female voice different as well. Here. She put the blue one on and spoke. Ain't I manly? Mercy couldn't believe her ears. Rose sounded like a man with a deep voice. That will be helpful when we're recording him. So take the job and let's get to work. She slugged her in the arm as she hopped to her feet. This is really nice, Mercy said as she looked around. Only cost me half a million, Rose said with a wink. I have a trailer to pull my car, but it keeps me mobile. Can't have the authorities tracking me to one location. What a paradox they were. Rose was a nomad. Mercy grew roots in her new hometown. They couldn't be more opposite if they tried. But then again, Rose had been killing for years. Mercy was just getting started. Still, she preferred her home to have a foundation. After this, Rose said as she opened the refrigerator, I'm headed out west. I have to throw the FBI a curveball. That was the other marked difference between them. Rose loved toying with the FBI. Mercy just wanted them to go away. Rose was terrifying, even to Mercy. The two stood in Rosie's motorhome staring at each other in silence. What? Mercy let out a laugh. So, you're an art dealer, a chemist, an assassin. Is there anything you can't do? Rose leaned against the counter. Cook, make friends, stay in one place, or sleep, that's the list. She shrugged. My state-ordered therapist said I have antisocial something or other. There were so many unanswered questions about her mentor. The abuse she'd suffered as a child had done significant damage to her psyche. Losing her brother only compounded the situation. That was about all she knew. That and Rose was a well-trained and very successful assassin. She held out her hand to Mercy. Let's head back to the house. Chapter 14 I walked into the office to hear sex noises coming from my partner's computer. What in the hell are you watching? Shaw rolled his eyes and turned the laptop toward me. There was a college-aged young man humping a goat. His underwear was still on, thankfully. The kid kept laughing, talking about fucking a kid. It was disturbing. Shaw, really, turn that shit off. This young man doesn't remember anything. He claims he was drugged by an attractive woman at a bar. Revenge? I sat in my chair and spun it toward him. Start from the beginning. Ryan Swan, 22, served six months for the rape of a co-ed. He filmed and shared it on social media. Six months. This was clearly a plot for some vigilante justice. He hasn't been back to school since. Shaw shook his head and turned the video off. Serves him right. That girl's life will never be the same. 
Jack Shaw? He shot me a dirty look. Oh, hell, Murph, I'm sick of this. Michelangelo's victims, rapists and pedophiles, these vigilantes, their victims aren't exactly innocents. It's hard to care. Don't tell me for one minute you don't think deep in your head that these people deserve some form of punishment. I pondered his question for a moment. You know, it's not that they don't deserve punishment. It's that we can't allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry with a grudge to take matters into their own hands. The system will crumble. He turned away from me. His voice low, he mumbled. The system fails. I opened the file off the FBI server he was watching put on earphones, and began to do the investigative work he didn't seem to want. Whomever filmed the piece was careful about reflective surfaces. That male voice, I said to Shaw, even though he wasn't listening, sounds altered. The tech guys are on it. Said they're not sure what they can get out of it, if anything. They're pulling it apart frame by frame. But there are two. One filming, one talking, well, and the young man with the goat. Wait until the end. That's the most disturbing. He finally looked at me. Hope you skipped breakfast. The goat turned out to be male. The young man fellated it, then let it penetrate him anally. If that wasn't bad enough, he stuck three tampons in his bottom, followed by a toy car. He confessed to all sorts of things, including rape, peeping, and paying for male prostitutes. Memos in the case file indicated that he'd gone into hiding. His taped confession happened while he was obviously under the influence of something, so it would be inadmissible. But it was caused to reopen cases for local law enforcement. The most damning was the recorded rapes he had claimed to have stored. He handed a thumb drive over to whomever was recording him. There was no doubt in my mind those would be used against him. A kid with rich parents and a proclivity for sexual assault he was going to run. I wanted us to find this young man before they did. I entered his information into the system and had the addresses of his parents' properties, and there were many. Thanks to recent changes in Homeland Security, I was able to track down which properties' energy consumption had gone up since the kid had gone missing. After sending off a few emails, I secured a ride. Grab your things, we're headed to Chattanooga. I smiled at Shaw as I began packing up my laptop. He crossed his arms over his chest. Why? Mercy is in Alabama, Shaw. This is about this case, not her. Now let's go. I got us a ride on a FedEx plane. We need to head to the airport. Shaw sighed as he reached in his personal closet and pulled out his overnight bag. I sent a message off to Jesse and grabbed mine, slinging it over my shoulder. After a short drive to the airport, we were given a ride on a golf cart to the FedEx area. The pilot shook our hands and promised an easy flight. Sorry, we don't have any flight attendants, but you can stretch your legs. We followed him up the rolling stairs into the plane. Two rows of what I would call first-class seats were directly behind the bulkhead. This was the first ride we'd ever hitched with FedEx, but after a smooth takeoff and a lack of bitching passengers, I was sure I'd be contacting them again. Unlike commercial airliners, the pilots didn't need to be protected from the passengers. There wasn't even a door to the cockpit. He turned his head toward us. That small fridge against the bulkhead has sodas and water if you're thirsty. We'll be descending within 20 minutes, so if you need to get up, do it now. There was no need to stretch my legs. They were already comfortably stretched out in front of me. I'd secured a federal vehicle for us. It was going to be waiting outside the tarmac once we landed in Nashville. Ryan Swan was hiding in his parents' cabin in Chattanooga right off a lake. He'd be jumpy at best and having two folks show up in a rental car claiming to be FBI didn't seem to be the best approach. In no time, the plane had landed. A fellow agent handed us the keys to an SUV, and we were on our way to Chattanooga. Shaw chuckled. What? He looked at me and grinned. It was the first smile I'd received from him since coming back from my voluntary suspension. I was just thinking with the way you drive, flying FedEx was sort of unnecessary. We would have been there already. He laughed again and cracked his window. The desire to keep things lighthearted outweighed any smart-ass remark I had. Well, just look at it this way. It's fewer miles with me behind the wheel. Probably safer for the civilians. Not probably. Definitely. You warm? Want me to turn on the air? He reached over and patted my shoulder. You don't have to try so hard, Murph. 
We're still partners. I'm not mad at you anymore. I filled him in on my suspicions and research. What are we going to do once we find the kid? We can't arrest him. It's not our jurisdiction. My head bobbed as I thought. We'll tell him that. It'll settle his nerves. I just want to question him. See if anything suspicious has happened before or since the event. Leave the nerve settling to me. You do you. Just like always. The two-hour drive went by fast. It was early afternoon when we pulled up to the cabin on the lake. Music could be heard coming from inside. We approached the front door and rang the doorbell. We rang it three more times and still no one came. I peeked through the front windows. I'll go around back, Shaw said. I continued peeking through the windows. Despite the loud music, no one seemed to be moving inside. Had the lazy kids stepped out and left the music going? Murphy! Leaping over the railing, I ran around the house toward his voice with my weapon drawn. When I rounded the backside of the house, Shaw was leaning against the railing of the back deck. DB, he said, shaking his head. Dead body. We were too late. I gave him a questioning look, then peeked in the window. Swan was sitting on the couch, chin resting on his chest. A pool of dried blood stained the white rug at his feet. I'll call it in. You get in that door. He's not dead until pronounced dead. Pulling out my cell, I dialed 911 and called it in as Shaw kicked open the back door. I followed him inside. I felt for a pulse. His skin was cold to the touch. Lifeless. No need for an ambulance, I told the operator. Just send a bus to collect him and the sheriff. We're going to secure the scene. Spread out on the coffee table was an empty bottle of whiskey and several still photos that looked like they were captured from video. In every one, Swan appeared to be sexually assaulting a woman. Some looked like young teens making it difficult to beat charges of statutory rape at a minimum. There was no note, but several used tissues as if he'd been crying. The knife he apparently used had fallen to the floor. It was a sharp kitchen knife, probably the only way out of the situation, at least in his mind. I pulled a glove out of my pocket and picked up one of the photos. People don't print photos anymore, at least most people. I turned the photo over to see where it was developed, and the only thing on the back was a website for revengedru.com. Great. These assholes are virtual, too. I showed Shaw, and about the time we started discussing it, the police arrived. We showed them our credentials and gave statements. Jesus, God Almighty, would you look at these? The officer picked up a photo with no gloves on. I cringed. Officer. Jack intervened. Perhaps you should preserve the evidence. The cop huffed at him. This isn't a murder, son. It's a suicide. Clear as day. Judging by these photos, it's probably a good thing, too. I gave Shaw the most reassuring look I could muster. No need for us to stick around. We can't question him and we have no search warrant, so we'd best see what we can do to get back home tonight. Driving us back to the airport, I felt defeated. It was a long shot, but I was hoping to get some lead. Any lead would do. There was the website on the back of the card. I could give it to our analysts and see what they could find. We put the SUV in the federal holding area and checked in the keys. Shaw found us a flight home, but we'd wait for three hours before we could board, and we'd be stuck on the back of the plane. Sometimes travel was miserable. Excuse me? A man approached. He was in an expensive suit, hair buzzed short, though it was gray around the temples. Your federal agents? Shaw nodded. FBI. The man extended his hand. Secret Service, retired. He shook Shaw's hand. I own a private security firm now. I'm actually flying to Chicago now in a private jet. I could give you a lift. You'll be home before you can even board a flight here. Shaw asked some qualifying questions, and when we were satisfied he was who he said he was, we gladly accepted. The private jet was so extravagant inside I felt as if I'd died and gone to heaven. Plush leather couches lined each side of the hull. We were given a choice of seating. Shaw and I sat together. The gentleman who was giving us a ride had introduced himself as Sean Kingston. I'd heard the name before, but didn't know him. So, who was your protectee? I asked. He poured himself a drink of amber liquid from a decanter. A retired president and his family. 
I retired myself about 10 years ago. Protection was my way of life, so it seemed fitting that I start this company. It's been good to me, more exciting than my old job, but less stressful. He was charming, but the service never left him. He was still stiff. Shaw shook his head. Retirement sounds good about now. I have four more years to go. Don't mind my partner, it's just this case. I shot Shaw a look. And if you think I'm letting you leave me in four years, you've lost your mind. Imagining my life without him in it was awful. I wished he'd quit talking about separation. Sean leaned back in his seat, resting an ankle on the opposite knee. Rough case? He may be retired, but he was still a civilian. Divulging details about a case was not going to happen. Dead end after dead end. But we'll figure it out. His lips spread wide. As exhausted as you two look, I'd say the Bureau has you on something high profile. National, perhaps. After polishing off the remainder of his drink, he set the glass on the table next to him. Something that seems to have no answer. It has to be the vigilante killings that all the media is going about. My partner cleared his throat. I'm sorry, sir, but you know the rules. We can't talk about our cases. Sean nodded. Can't keep me from guessing either. When was this plane going to take off? Sure, we were in style, but this guy was making me uncomfortable. About the time I was ready to ask to leave the plane, we were being taxied down the runway. And I latched my seatbelt and leaned back on the couch, trying to appear comfortable. You can guess all you wish. We can entertain your hypothesis, but we cannot comment. The conversation paused as the plane sped down the runway and quickly climbed to cruising altitude. We seemed to climb much faster than a commercial plane would. Maybe it was just me. I was relieved when the plane seemed to level out. Thanks again for the lift. It'll be nice to get home at a reasonable time. Could I keep this conversation light? Maybe no conversation at all would be better. Usually, Shaw and I would discuss the case at this point, but with Sean so close, we'd have to wait. Sean reached in his briefcase and pulled out a newspaper, pulling it up to read and cover his face. Would you look at that? Of course, this was designed to make us inquire. I refused to play the game. Jack, what time are you coming in tomorrow? My partner, who knew me so well, just shrugged. He was never noncommittal, so it appeared he was catching my cue. I've been putting in the hours lately. I may wait until eight. Get a little extra shut-eye. Nine. Nine vigilante killings in the paper? That's quite a lot. And they're spread across the country. Do you think they're organized somehow? Sean's eyes could barely be seen above the paper, but I knew he was grinning. I'm not taking the bait, asshole. What do you think? I mean, with years in the Secret Service, a security firm now. What do your years of experience tell you? After neatly folding the paper and tucking it in his briefcase, he folded his hands. I think initially it was a small group of individuals who were highly organized. The hits were professional, at least according to what data I could find. But from the non-classified evidence I've seen, it's grown from there. Individuals are now taking matters into their own hands, inspired by the actions of a few. His gaze locked onto mine. I believe this started with your Michelangelo killer. He only targeted vile, disgusting people, turned their disgusting carcass into a replica of fine art. Do you ever wonder why he went to such great length to turn a pedophile into the creation of Adam? I mean, here's a man who allegedly raped or molested young boys, but the psychology behind turning him into a creation fresco? Do you ever sit and chew on that? I stared at him, refusing to answer. It was public knowledge I was lead on the Michelangelo case, and I'd failed to capture him thus far. It was a dark mark on my record and a mockery of my field. Sean Kingston's smile turned from a smirk into a soft smile of apathy. He knew. Seems you've followed the matter closely. Most of the victims were made into replicas of religious frescoes. Christian views of life, death, and creation. The very irony of committing murder, a serious sin against God, then using the victim to portray a religious sentiment. It's as if your killer says, this wasn't your purpose. You failed God. You failed at life. If you can't succeed in life, you will in death, because I will make sure others know. They'll know what you did and how you suffered. 
Now, why would your killer go to such great lengths to tell a story to a man who is already dead? Shaw leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. If you don't think the profilers have already suggested our killer was a victim of sexual abuse, then you're sadly mistaken. It was the first thing they said. Of course. Sean gave one firm nod. But this isn't just a person who has been abused by a person they trusted. This was most likely someone who was failed by the system. Maybe a foster kid or something similar. Unlike most serial killers, I believe yours has nothing left to lose. Remember, in my former life, we had to assess the situation in seconds. We had one, maybe two seconds to read a person. That's a skill, my friends. That doesn't go away. I said nothing. Shaw was intrigued, however. Sure. So, you looked at us, heard we were federal agents, and sized us up immediately. Sean Kingston took the challenge. You, sir, are too easygoing. It's important for you to be well-liked. You care less about respect and more about the fundamental need of acceptance. You're a total type B personality. Your home is more than likely clean but disorganized. Your car too, if you have one. You partnered up with her, a super control freak who is quite possibly the polar opposite. She cares more about respect than likability. She puts her head down and plows through the problem. A complex thinker, she probably remains quiet at inopportune times, leaving you to pick up the dead space. I bet her walls are bare. She doesn't have any animals. He squinted his eyes. And she takes her job personally. Gut instinct rules her world, and she's not one to ignore her gut, even if it causes friction. Shaw's mouth fell open. Sean Kingston just stared at me. I glared back. He never frowned, never glared. He kept his easy smile and his eyes locked on me. But that's where I stand. I think Michelangelo spawned this small but organized group. News spread across social media and it gave folks ideas. Now there's an epidemic. Guilty or innocent, it doesn't matter. People are going for revenge. It's a purge. You can't stop it. Local law enforcement and the courts just have to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. It will calm down. So there's no cutting the head off the snake then? Shaw's question made me cringe. He just confirmed it was our case. Sean's smile finally faded. Find Michelangelo. Stop the killing. Others will be afraid of receiving the same repercussions. Damn. Double damn. Like we haven't been trying to find our killer? We finally landed in Chicago, rented a car, and headed to Milwaukee. Shaw stared at the card in his hand. Murph, this guy's firm is legitimate. While you were on vacation a few months back, I lent a hand to Weston and Briggs. A family paid his firm a handsome sum of money to get their son back from Cuba. They went in, snatched him up, and returned him home. A cartel had been holding him for ransom. The Bureau isn't happy with him meddling in our business, but he has the protection of not one but two former presidents. Bureaucracy at its finest. Of course, he was going to give his opinion on our case. Problem was, I agreed with him on all points. Back to our dead co-ed. The back of the photos had a website I want our guys to check out. Maybe we can find out who owns it, who is involved. I'd like to get to the bottom of this. We need a win, Shaw. I tapped the steering wheel as I sped down I-94. He reclined his seat and closed his eyes. I say we focus on Michelangelo again. There's no way he just stopped. None. He liked the attention. We know these guys, Murph. They don't stop until someone stops them. Michelangelo. My arch nemesis. It was time to do a rundown. A note was written. A goodbye note. No previous communication was sent. Just a final goodbye. There had been months with no sign of him. Then one final killing. Was our killer sick and unable to go on? Was he injured? Were we getting close to stumbling onto something? The Maryland M.E. suggested it was a woman, which I found hard to swallow given the size and weight of the victims. Still, it was a possibility. Cause of death continued to be a mystery, meaning our killer was smart, even if a psychopath. The victims were always perpetrators of another heinous crime, at least in our killer's eyes. 
The killer didn't attack the innocent. Michelangelo didn't tear families apart. Was Kingston right? Did our Michelangelo have deep-seated issues? Trauma from childhood that carried into young adulthood, growing into something more sinister? Obviously, our artist assumed he or she was above the law, more efficient, better. He or she was judge, jury, and executioner. So, who hurt them and got away with it? I dropped Shaw off, then the car. It was getting late, so I headed home. In the morning, I'd hit up my favorite analyst and give him the details. I had an idea how to narrow the search. When I walked in the front door, Jesse had blueprints spread across the dining room table. Hey, I thought you said you wouldn't be home tonight. On a free night with me away, this man was hard at work. He wasn't at a bar pounding beer, sitting on the couch watching television, or out breaking my heart with some trollop. He was working. God, I loved this man. Dead end, I said as I kissed his cheek. He wrapped his arm around me and squeezed. I made chili, it's still on the stove. Chili in the middle of summer? With a soft laugh and a shrug, he confessed he ate chili dogs for dinner. But I know you don't like hot dogs, so there's some chili if you want some. Oh, a package arrived for you. It's in the living room. A package? I went into the living room. A FedEx envelope rested on the table. I tore it open and pulled out the contents. It was the surveillance on Mercy. I'd forgotten all about the guy I'd paid to tail her. Mm -hmm. This is the only woman she spent time with. I couldn't find anything on her. The plate on the car she drove belongs to a woman who is in a nursing home. The woman in the photo had short, spiky hair. She was talking on a flip phone. I tucked everything back in the envelope and tucked it in my briefcase. I didn't want this shit with Mercy to haunt me anymore. The director had made her point, and so had Shaw. Mercy was off limits. It was time for some lukewarm chili. Chapter 15 Tommy's payment had gone into her offshore account, which was building nicely. Mercy was a little troubled at how much Rose seemed to enjoy their little trip and humiliating that young man. The drugs worked wonders. He did and said whatever they suggested. The whole ordeal was live-streamed on social media with the kid's own cell phone. Mercy became nauseated when he went down on the animal. Bestiality was just disturbing. They didn't even tell him to do it. Rose just said, Do what you want, I'll record it so you have it forever. And that's when he got down on his hands and knees and began filleting the animal. She couldn't look. It took every ounce of strength not to rescue the animal from the disturbing event. This wasn't what she wanted. There was no question in her mind that she'd never take another job like it. She and Rose said their goodbyes, and Rose pulled out of the campground in her huge motorhome. Mercy had no idea if they'd ever meet again, but had conflicted feelings. Part of her had hoped to having a grounding effect on the woman. The other part was just terrified of her and was relieved by the distance. With files mounting, she had days' worth of work to catch up on. After spending some quality time with her girls in the morning, she sat at her desk. After cleaning up a few files, she decided to catch up on the news. There it was, the worst news possible. The pedophile she didn't kill was sentenced three lousy years. He would only get three measly years due to some loophole his lawyer found. Tears spilled over her cheeks. She'd packaged up all the evidence, had left it wrapped like a fucking gift for the authorities, and had four children still alive and back home with their families. It wasn't his first offense. He should have been locked away for good. The system was broken. The system failed. Only eight and a half percent of incarcerations were for sexual assault, the highest rate of incarcerations being drug-related offenses at over 46 percent. That was the priority of the justice system. They penalized people more for hurting themselves than for hurting others. It was ass-backward. Most victims fall into drugs to dull the pain of their trauma. Leaving more victims in jail than perpetrators, the sex offenders were creating the largest section the incarcerated populace. How could no one else see this? Rose suddenly made more sense. Mercy made more sense. They were the righteous, They'd free potential victims from harm's way by removing the vile and disgusting. It was a public damned service, 
and society should thank them for their contribution. Certainly they couldn't rely on the justice system to protect them. No, that system was expensive and proven to fail over and over again. People don't come out of prison better than they went in. Her chest heaved as the crying increased. Those poor babies. She promised them he'd go away and never hurt anyone again. She was supposed to be their catwoman. She failed them. Years as a legal secretary had twisted her mind into believing that the courts could handle the guilty. But how many times had she watched the guilty go free? He had those poor babies chained up in the basement like it was some medieval dungeon. They'd been forced to watch as he violated and abused them one at a time. He'd starved them, tortured them, babies. She thought of the little girl, Charlotte. She was so strong and motherly to the boys. She'd been the first to speak, the first to help. She remembered those innocent eyes staring into hers. Quickly, she logged onto her private system and hunted the girl down. She didn't live far from Clay. She made a mental note of the address. She made her way to the basement. Sylvia was reading a book on the couch. Hey. Sylvia looked up from the book. Well, it's nice to see you're still with me this time. I'm sorry for everything. I can't imagine how lonely it's been for you. I want to come up with some sort of plan or a way that when I start to shut you out, well, to combat that so it doesn't happen again. She put the book down and stood. She approached Mercy slowly, then wrapped her arms around her. I'm here for you. You're not alone. Just talk to me every day. Remember, I know everything. I know what you do. I cover for you always. There's no secrets. You don't have to be ashamed of anything either. We're in this thing together, a team of misfits, if you will. Mercy squeezed her back. Thank you for everything, your patience most of all. A small laugh shook Sylvia's chest. Mercy released her and looked at her face. What? Thank you. Because of you, I have a new identity. I have an income without cleaning up puke, blood, and shit. When this is all over, I can live a normal life. All over? There was a master plan? She'd have to think long and hard to figure out what she'd shut out. She wasn't going to crumble. Defeat was not an option. I'm going to take off for a few hours. There's something I need to look into. Do you need anything? Her body double shook her head. After a shower and some fresh clothes, she took off for the half-hour drive. She pulled up just in time to see Charlotte walking out of a small home, holding her mother's hand. Her poor little face looked tired. Despite the fact that she was clutching a teddy bear with her free arm, she could have been fifty years old with the weight of the world on her shoulder. She followed them to a large discount store. She left the jeep running with the air on, so her girls were comfortable and locked it up, hurrying so she didn't lose Charlotte and her family. When they stopped for the mother to look at clothes, the little girl became distracted and stared at a rack of costume jewelry. Mercy drew closer. Charlotte ran her fingers down a fake pearl necklace. She dropped her bear on the floor as she became enamored with the shiny things hanging on the rack. Her brown hair was neat, clean, and braided down her back. The bruises were gone. Still, she looked so sad. Not thinking, Mercy snatched the fallen bear from the floor. Excuse me, miss, you dropped your bear. Extended her arm, holding the stuffed animal out to the child. She didn't want to scare her, and certainly the little one had developed a fear of strangers by now. Charlotte sheepishly reached out. Thank you she said in a low voice. Then the girl did something odd. She sniffed Mercy's hand. Her sad eyes grew wider. Then she looked up at Mercy and smiled. Cat? What? She looked at the child, shocked. She'd just been made. By a child. Charlotte smiled. I'll never forget how you smelled. Oh my goodness, you're so pretty. Excuse me. Charlotte's mother was stomping toward them, brow furrowed. She snatched Charlotte's arm and pulled her back. Mercy fought back her anger. Charlotte shouldn't have to be manhandled like that. Apologies, ma'am. The little one dropped her bear. I was just giving it back. Are you cat? Charlotte asked again. 
She hated lying to such a sweet little thing. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Children shouldn't talk to strangers. You don't just go up to someone's kid. Charlotte's mom squinted her eyes at Mercy. As I said, she dropped her bear. I was just being nice. Charlotte's mother turned her back and started dragging the child away. When Charlotte looked over her shoulder at Mercy, the sad look in her eyes was more than she could take. Mercy lifted her hand and clawed into the air, giving Charlotte a wink for good measure. The little girl's eyes lit up. A smile spread across her face as she waved at Mercy. Adrenaline began to soar through her veins. It was time to leave. Surely this store had security cameras, and that little exchange could be her undoing. She had to be more careful. Walking as fast as she could, she avoided eye contact with anyone as she made her way out to her jeep. Mercy sped off, racing back toward home. That was stupid. It was reckless. She was going to get caught. When she returned home, she sat at the kitchen table trying to get a grip. Seeing Charlotte set her mind at ease about the girl, but she outed herself in the meantime. The girl literally caught her scent and knew who she was. She went to the bathroom, filled the jetted tub with hot water, stripped down, and lowered herself in. Tears stung her eyes, thinking of the innocence ripped away from Charlotte and the others. They'd never be the same. Meanwhile, Alfred the pedophile would be walking the streets again in three years. Mabel came into the bathroom and rested her chin at the edge of the tub. Mercy leaned over and kissed the top of her snout. No matter what, her girls knew when she was in pain. They'd always tried to comfort her. Bertha joined them, but laid on the floor. Would Rose understand her pain? The woman seemed to be without emotion. She thought about Freddy and how desperately she missed him. Salvador, Paul, the office. She'd had a good life before all of this. Content to go to work during the day, have the occasional meal with her neighbors, and settle in with a book. She'd spent her life helping people, even those that didn't deserve it. What did she get for her trouble? Scars, brain damage, panic attacks, nightmares. When the water cooled, she changed into a jogging suit and curled up on the couch. Feeling exhausted, she pulled the blanket off the back and draped it over her, closing her eyes. When she opened her eyes and sat up, she saw Sylvia sitting on the opposite couch, staring at her. Nightmare? Her bottom lip threatened to quiver. Always you? Sylvia nodded. That's PTSD for you. Are you... How are you? The trip was rough, but I'm okay. Good. Now let's start from the top. Again. Again? Sylvia sat on the coffee table and leaned in toward Mercy. Yes, we go over this every few months. And I know we went over this last night. But we're going to do it again. You have dissociative identity disorder. This means you've developed a split identity. We were making progress integrating, then you backslid. I am Sylvia McDermott. You helped me fake my teeth and get a new identity. Holy shit, holy shit, you mean every time I thought I was hallucinating, you were standing there? Of memory startled her. She remembered shopping with Sylvia, who was wearing a disguise. They bought the furniture together, moved together. When Freddy came to visit, Sylvia hid in the basement. It was Sylvia who stayed with the dogs and made public appearances while Mercy was out on a job. It all came flooding back. I'm doing the medical transcription, you're doing the legal. Remember? Her head tilted. Rose is the only person aside from my mother who knows I'm alive. The words Rose spoke that Mercy refused to hear came flooding in. And you have Sylvia who trusts you with her life. That was what she'd said that caused Mercy to black out. So, I can go around murdering people, but I can't deal with you? That makes no sense. Sylvia stood and walked toward the kitchen. The Haldol makes you dizzy and edgy. You hate taking it so you often quit before you're ready. It's not until you accept all of this that you can integrate fully. We made great progress before. She poured two glasses of wine and carried them back. Now listen, you have to fight this. You need to think about me. 
I think this whole plan was concocted by your subconscious or altar or something. My altar, what is my altar like? She shrugged and sipped at her wine. Confident, edgy, volatile. I thought she was going to come out during your miscarriage, but she didn't. How do you know about that? She bit her lip. She hadn't told anyone but Freddy. Sylvia rubbed her head. I was there, Mercy. I helped you to the bathroom. I helped you take off your blood-soaked clothing. I gave you medicine I stole from the hospital. I helped clean you in the shower. You really don't remember any of this? She shook her head. In my head, I was alone. Look, DID is rare. I mean, sure they put it in soap operas, but really, it's rare. Between your physical and emotional trauma, your mind is just trying to find a way to cope. But honestly, you can control this. You don't have to take meds. You don't even have to take them now. But you don't seem to see me or acknowledge me as anything more than your ghost. I'm a human being and I'm extremely lonely hiding in the basement. Oh my God. Put her head in her hand. I'm insane. Sylvia gave a soft laugh. We both are, but that's okay. After what we've been through, we're bound to have issues. They spent the next several hours getting Mercy up to speed. Sylvia and Mercy came up with a plan to keep Mercy in one state of mind. In the end, she felt better knowing she wasn't alone. But she was also deeply disturbed to feel like someone else had control of her at times. Well, something else. That had to stop. The realization that this had gone on for months was devastating. She felt horrible for Sylvia. Horrible for herself. Control. It had to be... Chapter 16 I beat Shaw into the office by a good hour. He wasn't kidding about getting some extra shut eye. A short visit to my favorite analyst would hopefully bring me some information. I shredded the file from the private investigator. There wasn't much there besides the stranger who was seen with mercy anyway. I certainly didn't want to piss off Shaw or Nightwell. After pouring a steaming cup of dark roast... I began combing through our Michelangelo files again. We'd had two sets of fresh opinions on the matter. The M.E. who thought the culprit was female, and our Secret Service friend who had insight into the psyche of the killer. Either one of them, or both, could be dead wrong. But with the external data, I was looking at the evidence with fresh eyes. We had no real forensic evidence as our killer was more than careful. The note had been scrutinized 18 different ways. After five years, we had to have something we weren't seeing. Agent Morgan? My intercom blasted. Yes? Can you please come to the lab? Be right there, I said as I tossed a file onto my desk. Shaw was just headed into our office. Not so fast. Lab has something. His sleepy eyes lit up. He ran in, topped off his cup with some coffee and followed me. What case? He asked. I have no idea. Let's go find out. We took the elevator to the third floor. The lab handled everything from digital analysis to DNA. We were escorted to a smaller lab in the back. Agents, Edinsa Shaw and Murphy, I'm Jackie. I started here last month. I've been going over the video we were given by your office. The perpetrators were careful about reflective surfaces, but they weren't careful about their shadows. Here, let me show you. She started playing the video in slow motion then paused. After a few clicks, she enhanced a shadow. You see this? This is not the physique of another man, or buddy filming. This is a woman with short hair. Look at the slope of the neck and shoulder here. That's very feminine. Now let me just get to the next part. Here. She paused again and zoomed in on the kid's eye. What is that? Jackie smiled. The human eye doesn't just capture light. It reflects it as well. That, that is an image of the person holding the cell phone that is recording. I can't enhance it enough to be clear, but it's a woman with short hair. But look in his right eye, she said as she zoomed in on the right side. That is another woman with long hair in a dress. Shaw and I glanced at each other. That's really good, Jackie. But still not helpful. If the images couldn't be enhanced anymore, they might as well be shadows. I've run it through the databases, but there just aren't enough points of reference. I'm going to keep digging through the video. Now, Stephen has something for you, too. She leaned out the door and yelled, Steve! 
A thin guy with glasses and dark hair pulled into a ponytail peeked out of his office. Yes, yes, send them in. We stepped into his office. So, I have been digging into that web address you gave. It's owned by a dummy corporation, of course, but that same corporation has been funneling money to several offshore accounts. I have a list of the recipients, as best as we can tell anyway. Most of these people are smart enough to use an alias. Some aren't, though. He printed off a sheet of paper and handed it to Shaw. A hundred grand, fifty, two hundred. These are large sums of money. Shaw handed me the list. We don't have evidence yet, but it looks like payments for services rendered. Hit men, if you will. He looked down at his computer and tapped a few buttons. A large screen behind us lit up. If you coincide the payments with the dates of your open cases, they're very close in days. A 30-year-old male is shot from a distance with a high-powered rifle in Bethesda. 48 hours later, a hundred grand is deposited into an account ending in 5408. A 42-year-old man is found slain in his apartment. 24 hours later, 50 grand is wired into account ending in 7219. I've emailed you both the files. You can look for yourself. Thank you. Excellent work. That's not all. The photo you gave the analyst downstairs was sent up here. I've run it through the database and guess what? She's not anywhere to be found. Not on BMV records, passports, foreign sites, nothing. Shaw looked at me, then at Stephen. Photo? Heat rose up my neck and threatened to scorch my face. The guy put the photo on screen. I think she's had surgical alteration of her face. It's too symmetrical. No one has a purely symmetrical face. Everyone has some sort of anomaly, but if you cut her face in half and transpose it, there are no differences. When I say no, one is perfect, I mean it. Our eyes aren't level. One nostril is bigger than the other, but not with this girl. This girl doesn't want to be recognized. She's totally off-grid. So, Mercy's new friend is off the grid and has been surgically altered. Interesting. Broaden the search, she still has to have some of her original features. The computers might catch it. Thank you, Stephen, for all your hard work. Jackie came back in looking rather nervous. Agents Shaw and Morgan, the director wants to see you in her office. I could feel my partner's glare before I even looked at him. Stop looking at me like that. I didn't do anything. I was with you, remember? I turned, not wanting an argument in front of the techs, and headed toward the elevator. Shaw stood next to me as the doors closed. Murphy Morgan, so help me. Jack Shaw. I was just as lost and puzzled as he was. I have no idea why we're being summoned, so just spare me your judgment. The elevator doors opened and we made our way down two hallways until we reached her office. I paused to take a deep breath before knocking on her door. When I opened it, I found her with an analyst staring at a still image captured from security footage. Mercy Connell was talking with a child. Shaw crossed his arms over his chest and glared at me. Come in, you two. Close the door. She waved and turned back to the screen. I closed the door and stepped around my partner who was doing his best impression of the Great Wall. Ma'am? I spoke up. Shaw may not have believed me, but I let off Mercy after my career and partnership were threatened. She had her hair in a French twist, the gray strands on the edge of her face stood straight out as if she'd been holding her head in her hands, messing up her nice hairstyle. Nightwell gave a firm nod to the analyst. Frank, please tell the agents what you told me. He pointed at Mercy. This woman, as you know, is none other than Mercy Connell. This little girl. He pointed to a small child with long braided hair. And three young boys were rescued recently from a man that had them chained up in a basement. The kids had been raped, starved, beaten, you name it. They wouldn't tell anyone anything about their rescuer other than the name Catwoman. In order to gain my partner's good graces, I had to defend her first. Mercy is hardly a Catwoman, Frank. With a shit-eating grin, he clicked a device in his hand and the photo changed. Mercy was holding her hand up like a claw, and the little girl was positively beaming. I could hear the air rushing out of Shaw's lungs. This caused me to do a little digging. 
across the street from the bar where our girl, Mercy, subdued a serial killer was a bank. We gained access to that bank's security footage. Now watch. There it was on the big screen, Mercy's takedown of a much larger man. This was serious hand-to-hand -hand combat training. She was using moves I've only seen used by our nation's Secret Service and the Russian Special Forces. Where in the hell did she get Sistema training? Nightwell asked. Do you followed her for months? I laced my hands behind my back and stood as tall as I could muster. With all due respect, ma'am, it was always in an unofficial capacity. I was never allowed to surveil her. There is a six-month time span where I didn't see her at all. Nightwell sat hard in her chair. That'll be all, Frank. You two, sit. After Frank left and we took our seats, she put her hand on the side of her head. This is very delicate. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. The evidence is circumstantial at best. There's no evidence Mercy Connell rescued those children. But I don't believe in coincidences, especially when they start stacking up. I'm a fool, ma'am. I'm afraid I overstepped in order to smooth things over after Mercy discovered the troopers outside her house and sent a care package to her. Shaw hung his head. I even called to check up on her. Perhaps I'm not the appropriate choice for this case. Clearly, my judgment has failed. Nightwell's lips spread into a thin line. Agent Shaw, you're a valuable member of this team and integral to Agent Murphy's unusual manner of accomplishing her task. You just can't have one without the other. You smooth out her rough edges, and she plows through the bullshit to get to the truth. She's got an iron gut and an iron will. You? You're the guy who gets folks to open up. Both of you have had inappropriate contact with the suspect, but both of you have also established a relationship with her. We need to expound on that. So here's what I propose. Let her sit for a week, let her get comfortable, cozy, sloppy, then take a trip to Alabama and question her. Shaw looked like he could cry. I nearly wanted to throw up. My nerves were just destroyed. Murphy, I owe you an apology. It seems while you saw this coming, the rest of us just thought you were being obsessive for personal reasons. For that, I apologize. She reached across the desk in an act of solidarity. I shook her hand. Before you apologize, know that prior to getting myself in trouble with you, I paid a private investigator. While he didn't find much, he did manage to capture photos of a woman with mercy. That's quite suspect. She's completely off-grid, and the plate to the car she was driving is registered to a disabled woman who resides in a nursing home. I turned everything in upstairs. The lab and the analysts are working on it. Good work, she said as she stood. Now go with my blessing this time and know how sorry I am for being so utterly wrong. We left her office. Feeling numb and confused, I looked to my partner whose eyes had darkened. What was bothering him the most? Was it being wrong about mercy or attacking me for following her in the first place? Was it bitterness or humility painted on his face? I couldn't tell. When we reached our office, he looked utterly defeated. Get your head in the game, Jack. I need you. His eyes looked heavy as they met mine. How could you not scream at me right now? My heart broke for him. Because having you speak to me that way ripped my heart in half. I don't want to do that to you. You're my longest and most successful relationship, Jack. I need you. The thought of not having you in my life is just sickening. Plus, you don't deserve it. It looked like what it did, and I don't blame you for being angry at the time. He shook his heed. You realize in the field, I'm Shaw, but in personal discussions, you call me Jack? I poured a cup of coffee and slid it across his desk. That's the difference between business and personal discussions. Jack's my friend. Shaw's my partner. Haven't you realized I compartmentalize every single damned thing in my life? After refilling my own cup, I sat at my desk. A heavy feeling took hold. Honestly, I wish I was wrong. Let's face it, Mercy Connell went through hell. She has suffered. That much is fact. And now she thinks she's superwoman? He stared at his cup. The system is broken, Shaw. You know it. I know it. It was a backroom deal that is going to set William Jacoby free in a matter of months. It's those sorts of deals that put violent criminals back on the streets. She probably rationalizes her actions because of how flawed the system is. But we still have to fight it. 
Fight her. It's the job. His head bobbed up and down as I spoke. He took a sip of his coffee and opened his laptop. Let's get to work. I'm going to forward that file to Nightwell that the lab sent us and show her I'm on board. Poor Shaw. First Sean Kingston calls him out on the plane, then this. Diving into work might be what he needed, so I left him alone. Sistema. It was serious business, and not many people were privy to Sistema training. But I happen to know a retired Secret Service agent. Shaw? You still have that card from Sean Kingston? He opened his old-school Rolodex and pulled out the card, handing it over, then went back to work. I dialed the number on the card. Kingston Security. A light female voice answered. Special Agent Murphy Morgan for Sean Kingston, please. I waited. Either my credentials would get me through or get me hung up on. One moment, please. I watched the timer on my phone. At the two-minute mark, I was ready to hang up when he finally came on the line. Special Agent Morgan, to what do I owe the pleasure? I closed my eyes and steadied my nerves. Actually, I am looking for intel. I was wondering if I could grab a moment of your time this afternoon. I know you're busy. Nonsense. I've spent my entire adult life serving my country, Agent Morgan. When do you think you'll arrive? This was too easy. Nothing came this easy for me. A glance at the clock and his address and some quick calculating, and I made a tentative appointment with him at one in the afternoon. Shaw looked up from his laptop. You go. I'll stay. That guy just rubbed me the wrong way. As much as I disliked separating, I didn't need Shaw to smooth over the situation. Kingston had read me like a book. He was still willing to talk to me. Great. We can hit this from two angles. Call me if anything comes up. Standing from my desk, I looked at him. I hadn't seen him this dedicated and determined in ages. We all had our ups and downs. Shaw was usually level, he was stable. This whole situation had him digging in harder than ever. It's great to know I can rely on you, Jack. You always have my back. His eyes never left the screen. And you have mine. Now go so you can get ahead of traffic. 94 is a bitch this time of day. I grabbed keys to an Impala and headed out. During the drive, I chose to listen to music, something I never did when Shaw was with me, but it helped me sort things out in my mind. It was as if I could think more clearly if I was focused on more than one thing at a time. Weird, I know, but that's just me. The interstate was a mess, of course. There was always construction and traffic, but I managed to pull up outside his firm with 15 minutes to spare. When I entered, I expected to have to check in, but an assistant was waiting for me. She was of good height, about 5'9", short dark hair kept tight at the sides. Her steely blue eyes peered out behind dark framed glasses. You're here to see Sean? I tried to remember my partner's good manners. Yes, ma'am. Right this way, she said as she spun on her heel. Kingston's building was nice, but the marble and bulletproof glass and other security measures told me just how lucrative his business was, if not extremely dangerous. I didn't miss the sidearm on the assistant, nor the receptionist who sat slightly to the right, indicating a possible shotgun mounted beneath her desk. When she opened the door to Kingston's office, I was impressed. He had nine screens, all of them busy with footage except one which had stock values. Please sit. Would you like something to drink? Coffee would be great. I took a seat while Kingston nodded to the assistant. She's a great field agent and extremely helpful here. She can shoot a rifle and doesn't mind extending hospitality to our guests. Of course, I reward her with a handsome paycheck. The man looked proud. His demeanor was slightly different than in the plane. Maybe he was more on edge than he let on. So, what brings you here? He reclaimed his seat and scooted in close to his desk. His assistant set a tray on the edge of the desk with a small white pot, two cups, sugar and cream. She didn't even wait for a thank you before she turned and headed out of the office. Thank you, I called over my shoulder. After fixing my coffee, I sat back in my chair and looked at Kingston. I'm looking for information that may or may not be information that is classified. I understand if it is and you cannot answer, but I appreciate any insight you can give me. Sean poured a cup of coffee and drank it black. 
He placed his cup in the accompanying saucer. Anything you need that I can provide is yours. No need to drag this out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but part of your training in the Secret Service includes hand-to-hand -hand combat training that includes numerous forms of martial arts, including Sistema. That's correct. Much of what we learned was Sistema, and it was not limited to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Weapons training and knife wielding were included as well. I was on the right track at least. Could a civilian with no prior training become proficient in less than six months? His brows drew together. Give me a moment. He sipped at his coffee and I sat in uncomfortable silence. Remembering that, for the most part, people don't go straight into the Secret Service. They start out generally in the military and move up. I don't really think it's plausible. Okay, well this is just another dead end. A wasted trip. A dead end. Story of my career. I said it wasn't plausible. Not that it wasn't possible. What the hell? Care to elaborate? He nodded as he began. I asked for a moment to think, because I'm going back some years to recall my training. The most difficult aspect, and what takes so long to learn, is to stay calm. For all intents and purposes, we're trained to be sociopaths. I'm sorry, what? Listen, sociopaths don't feel, right? Well, that's an integral part of the training. Do you trust me? What? No. He smiled. Do you believe I'd harm you? Well, no, but I hardly know you. When he stood from his desk, I had to blink for my brain to register what just happened. I was staring down the barrel of a handgun that was so close I couldn't tell what kind it was. My stomach clenched, my neck tightened, and my heart raced. Immediately, sweat began forming in the nooks and crannies of my body. I didn't see him pull it. I didn't see much. I blinked, and a gun was in my face. What do you feel, Agent Morgan? Nervous, scared, and I'm a little pissed at the moment. He pulled the gun away and put it back under his desk. I don't feel those things. If you stood and drew your weapon right now, my heart rate wouldn't rise. Adrenaline wouldn't flow. I'd simply assess the situation and think of the six easiest ways to turn the tables. That's it. That quality isn't easy to acquire. It takes time and a ton of training. The only way one could successfully master Sistema in six months is if they were damaged goods to begin with. Like a serial killer? Our girl had some trauma, some brain damage, but the last I knew she was a ball of emotions. Sociopaths are very good at reading others, emulating emotion, but they don't feel Agent Morgan. They simply mimic Sean put his fingertips together, pulled them apart, and put them together again, tapping them against each other. If your killer has learned the art of Sistema, you're dealing with a very dangerous person. They can disarm you physically and psychologically. They can blend into a crowd when they want, or stand out like a lighthouse on a dark night. Figures. Hypothetically speaking, would a sociopath feel the need to perpetuate vigilante justice? That wouldn't fit into their psyche, right? I'm no shrink, but I think the mental health community does a terrible job with this. It's all or nothing with them. I think every mental illness is specific to the person. We have no idea what motivates these people. Think about yourself. What motivates you? Now, ask yourself if that's changed over time. We all evolve and change. You and I are no different from them, but they see the world through their own eyes judge with their own experiences. I picked up my coffee and sipped at it as I thought. So, if I were a civilian, and I really wanted to learn this and quick, how would I find a teacher? Sean smiled at me again and leaned back in his chair. That's the wrong question. How did the teacher find the student? That's the question. You have to understand, they'd have to see inherent qualities in a subject and recruit them, carefully shaping and moulding them. A true instructor of this special art isn't going to waste his time on someone who is lazy or won't follow the rules. The absurdity made me laugh. So they search out a sociopath with a decent set of morals and values, do some recon to make sure the person is authentic, and then put them in some grueling training program. He nodded. Most likely they have scouts who refer possibilities. That would be my guess. Sounds like an educated guess. 
when his big shoulders rose and fell into a shrug, I knew it wasn't a guess. My job was to protect the most important man in the country. Don't think for one moment we weren't concerned about those who had the same skill set. We kept tabs. There are three instructors stateside and an unknown number outside. One has been crippled for almost a decade. He needs a cane to walk, so I doubt he's taking students. One is under heavy surveillance from the CIA and the other, well, he's almost 84 by now. He changed his focus to his computer. Do you have a card with your secure email address? I reached in my pocket, grabbed my card and slid it across the desk. I'm sending you everything I have. None of this is classified. It's what I've been able to reproduce in my private business. I can't believe how gracious you're being, thank you. A smirk twitched on half his face. Everyone in this building is retired. We have Army, Navy, Special Forces, CIA, FBI, and even one MI6 agent. We've all served this country and will continue to do so. I meant what I said. Anything I have is yours. Any way we can help, we will. We acquire several federal contracts each year. We don't mind lending a hand when it's needed. Shaw told me about his government contracts. Kingston's crew did the nation's dirty work. They also interfered in kidnapping and ransom cases. It was a fine line to walk. Still, there was a lot of experience and expertise in that building, and I wasn't going to discount any of it. Do you finally have a suspect in this case? He asked. Off the record, yes. Since you're consulting on this case, I was wondering if you would look at some camera footage we were shown this morning. When he agreed, I dug my laptop out of my briefcase and showed him the footage of Mercy outside the bar. Impressive submission. You think this woman learned all of this in six months? His left brow rose toward his hairline. What I'm about to tell you is a matter of public record, to be clear. I ran through Mercy's ordeal, her life before, and how she'd managed since. So, you see, there was only six months that are unaccounted for. We know for certain that she took a beginner's self-defense class mere months after her injuries, this is a long way from beginner's self-defense. Then there's this woman, I said as I displayed the photo the private investigator found. She's been seen with the subject recently, which wouldn't be odd except for facial recognition software picked up nothing. She has no BMV or arrest records. There's nothing. Experts suggested she's had plastic surgery because her face is too symmetrical. Sean reached in his desk and pulled out a form signing at the bottom. This is our confidentiality form. This protects both of us so that you can discuss details of this case with me without violating your oath. In turn, you're offered strict confidentiality. As you can see from the top, it was drafted by the Department of Justice. I read over the document and signed it. Very good. I'm going to scan this photo and get my people on it. We have better tech than the FBI, no offense, but our budget is more elastic. In other words, he spent money the way he wanted without any oversight. Convenient. He stood from his chair and extended his hand. I'll contact you, should we find anything. And the charges? Pro bono, of course. I offered to help. After thanking him, I packed my things and headed out. This was the first time I'd looked outside the bureau for help. I hope... Chapter 17 Tommy's latest assignment was going to require some tech support. She sent a plane ticket to Freddy and had a rental car waiting for him. She went over the file again and again. An investment banker had pilfered millions from the elderly. There was a $200,000 reward for getting the money back. They didn't request his death, just the money back in their accounts. This would require, once again, working up close and personal with the target. She preferred the long-range kills where she was safer from discovery. This job, though, required much less in the way of emotional investment. The guy was a dirtball, of course, but once his victims had their money back, they'd be okay. She closed the file out and headed to the kitchen, filling a decanter of coffee and carrying it downstairs. She and Sylvia had begun starting each day with coffee and conversation to keep Mercy's head on straight and Sylvia feeling like she mattered. It was also important because the more Mercy accepted her situation, 
the more that had been hiding in the shadows came to fruition. There was a plan in place for escape, for Sylvia, and for Mercy. It was a hard pill to swallow, but Mercy was playing chess, planning ahead, manipulating several situations when her other personality had taken over. The plan was smart, yet sinister. Still, there was an air of justice to her plan that was undeniable. Mercy put her cup on the table and leaned in towards Sylvia. Listen, there's been so many lies, so much subterfuge, I think I should let Freddy know about you. He's helped me, even though what I'm doing isn't exactly up to par. Sylvia gave her a soft smile. You've suggested this before, but never followed through. The words stung. How many promises had she made that she didn't keep? That was about to end. Well, his plane landed an hour ago. He should be here soon. I will rip off the band-aid and just do it. If he freaks on me, then I'll deal with it. She shrugged. We both have deep feelings for each other. I don't think he's going to be a problem. Sylvia laughed. He's head over heels for you. That's obvious. Who else would come running every time you called? It was time. Time to open up. And open up she did. The last case is just killing me. I shouldn't have let that asshole go. Now he'll be out in three years. Sylvia pulled her hair back into a ponytail, pulled the elastic off her wrist, and secured it behind her head. You're a smart girl. Make it right. Barking upstairs had set Mercy to her feet. Showtime. She raced up the stairs and opened the door for Freddy. You're a sight for sore eyes. He wrapped an arm around her and squeezed as he gave her a peck on the forehead. She closed the door behind him. I'm so glad to see you, but before we get down to business, I need to show you something. He put his large bag on the floor. I'm all yours. Nervously, she descended the stairs with Freddy behind her. When they reached the bottom, Sylvia gave them a smile and wave. Who, who is that, and why does she have your face? Percy grabbed his hand. Sylvia McDermott, Freddy Young. Sylv, the dead nurse? Turns out I'm not dead. Sylvia gave a nervous laugh and approached with her hand extended. He slowly shook her hand as he looked back and forth between them. You look like twins. Mercy shrugged. Turns out we're probably related. Our mothers were both abandoned in a grocery store. Both of them were one of a set of twins. They looked identical. They were separated and adopted by different families. We're not a hundred percent sure, but that's what we've been able to piece together. Holy crap, and you both. What are the odds? He knew her story and Mercy's. Mercy squeezed his hand. Listen, we're both trusting you with our lives here, but if you and I are going to be partners, then you need to know the whole truth. His head bobbed up and down. My lips are sealed. Man, you hid this so well. I had no idea. Sylvia shooed them off. You two go get to work. I have things to do. They went to her office, and she showed him the file. He pulled out his own laptop and connected to the secure network he set up for Mercy. So, this is his building. There are security cameras everywhere. First I'll have to record a few hours of their footage, then loop it back into the system seamlessly. That'll give us cover. Here, he said as he zoomed in on the blueprint, is an RFID chip reader. That's how we get into his office. Don't worry, they're fairly easy to hack for me. I'll get us in, then the rest is up to you. You have to get his passwords out of him. He probably has a fingerprint scanner on his system, or some other biometrics. We won't know until we get in there. How long do you need to prepare? He shrugged. Two, maybe three days. I'll need your help, of course. That'll work. The fee, as you saw, is 200000 I'll split it with you. I can't do this without you. I don't know the tech that well. Don't get me wrong. I have some cool gadgets thanks to some less-than-savory friends. But I couldn't get into this building or return the money without you. But I also wouldn't trust anyone else with this job. I mean, I am asking you to break the law here. So that has to be worth at least half. Stop. He held his hand up. What you're doing is noble, Mercy. You're not running around hurting innocent people. You need to understand that innocent people could get hurt. I might have to subdue someone. I may even need to, you know. She hated admitting she killed people to Freddy. He always saw the best in her. All he did was nod. He knew. Are you... 
Better now? She hadn't prepared for this. She told him she couldn't have a relationship while her head was screwed up. That wasn't a lie. She didn't want to hurt him. I'm getting there. I finally had a breakthrough, but I still have some things to work through. I meant what I said. I'm not going to pull you into a mess. It's not fair to you. He looked at the floor, lacing his fingers together. You can't protect everyone, Mercy. It made her heart ache. We can talk about this after the job is done. We can't afford any distractions. I don't want either one of us going to jail. No jail for me, thanks. Let's pack up and head out. Miami is a bit of a drive. Freddy, her wonderful friend, would walk into a pit of fire for her, and that might be what he was doing right this very moment. The one thing she was taught in training was not to get caught, but to accept that fact that it could happen. She had resigned herself to the very real possibility of incarceration. It wasn't an easy pill to swallow. Sometimes, a murder rap carried the death penalty. It just depended on which state you were tried in. She had come to terms with it. Freddy had not. He relied on her to get them out of there, without getting caught. They said goodbye to Sylvia. She kissed her girls both goodbye and loaded up into the spare jeep heading south. The drive would take about 11 hours. That was a long time to be trapped together in a car. She registered them in a mid-level hotel under an alias. They wore disguises until they were safely in the room, then took turns in the shower. He came out of the bathroom in a pair of boxer shorts set low on his hips. She swore it was designed to catch her attention. No distractions. Trying to sleep next to him in bed was difficult, but when she woke she realized two things. The first was that she'd slept through the night without any nightmares. The second that she was overheated due to the bulky hacker spooned up behind her. After edging out of bed, she grabbed fresh clothes and hurried to the bathroom. She stared at her face while brushing her teeth. While she hated the heat and itchiness of the latex applications, she needed to be certain that if their faces were caught on camera, that they wouldn't be recognizable. A city the size of Miami certainly had everything from traffic to security cameras. And when she went to gather the case of makeup and disguises, Freddie was sitting up in bed, rubbing his eyes. Good morning. She started the in-room coffee pot. Good morning. Need the bathroom? After a sleepy nod, he crawled out of bed and padded to the bathroom, closing the door behind him. Kneeling down in front of the case, she sorted through latex applications for them. There were plenty to get them through the next few days. When he exited the bathroom, he poured a cup of coffee and sat on the floor next to her. Those don't look comfortable. She smiled at him. They're not, but consider it your lifeline. No matter what camera catches you, facial recognition software won't match your new face to your Freddy face. You're too handsome for prison. Thanks, he said as he shook his head. I think. You'll need to shave. I need a smooth surface. After coffee. Please, please let me have some coffee. She laughed before getting off the floor and pouring her own cup. You can have coffee and breakfast. It's still early. Mercy's burner phone rang. It was Sylvia. Is everything okay? Mercy, they're here, the feds. You know what to do. Stay calm. Sylvia stared at the monitors as she called Mercy. An SUV was barreling down the road toward their house. When she hung up with Mercy, she ran to her bedroom, reached under the mattress, and pulled out a Ziploc bag full of cat hair. Damn, this is going to suck. She opened the bag and inhaled deeply. Then she pulled out a small tuft of hair and rubbed it on her face. The sneezing starting immediately, as did the itching. She ran to the bathroom and grabbed a tissue blowing and wiping her nose furiously. She scratched at her face, making it red. A light tone indicated that the SUV had pulled in the end of the driveway and the dogs began barking like crazy. Sylvia grabbed a huge wad of toilet paper and rushed up the stairs. Agents Morgan and Shaw had just exited their vehicle. Sylvia jumped over the edge of the couch and laid down, trying to steady her breath in the midst of the sneezing. When they knocked, she slowly rose from the couch and trudged to the door. I'm sorry, I've caught a bug. Come on in. 
Her heart thundered in her chest. This was the first time she'd posed as Mercy in front of people that knew her. Morgan was a bitch who had already crawled so far up Mercy's ass, Sylvia wondered what her obsession was. Agent Shaw shook his head. Your nose is so red. Another round of sneezes attacked her. I know. I just took some Benadryl. You'll have to excuse me, I'm a bit fuzzy. She wiped at her nose. <laughs> she led them to the living room and curled up on the couch. Looks like that leg is bothering you. Murphy pointed at Sylvia's damaged leg. Damned mercy for her strength. It's aching today. Maybe it's this virus. I'm aching all over. What can I do for you? Agent Morgan pulled the briefcase off her shoulder and dug out a still image. Mercy was in Walmart talking with a little girl. Care to tell us what this was about? What? I don't understand. The post-nasal drip was now scratching her throat. She began coughing wildly into a blanket. I'm so sorry, I'm a mess. What are you asking? Agent Morgan clenched her jaw. Bitch. I'm asking what you're doing talking to this little girl. Sylvia's blood began to boil, despite the allergy attack she was suffering. Morgan had been ruthless with Mercy, even after everything she'd been through. Look, I've had enough of your bullshit. I don't know what kind of game you two are playing at, but this is mental. First, you stalk me. Send other people to stalk me. Then he sends me a goddamned care package. This has to be the worst good cop, bad cop routine in history. I've been nothing but nice, hospitable, and cordial with you two. I always cooperate with authorities no matter what. I've spent years in the legal system playing by the rules. Even after that piece of shit cut a deal with your office, I was still respectful. But now, I've had enough. She had more hatred to spew, but another round of sneezing took her breath away. Have you? Shaw growled. What now? The good cop is going to get shitty? Yes. Yes, I have. Now please leave. The next time you come to my property, you'd better have a warrant. I'm done playing nice. Fuck the both of you! Mercy would have kept control. Mercy would have offered them coffee. But Sylvia was done playing nice. They didn't stand. I'm asking questions about a crime. Now why are you talking to this little girl? Because I'm nice, that's what I do. She looked sad, so I talked to her. Her mother couldn't be bothered to keep an eye on her own kid. That's it. You'll let me know when that becomes a crime. The dogs were getting antsy, pacing around. They hadn't seen Sylvia mad before. Now I'm sure you can show yourselves to the door. We're not leaving. Sylvia blew her nose again. Her eyes were watering so bad it seemed as if she were crying. Girls? The dogs both looked at her. Guard. Both dogs immediately lunged at Morgan and Shaw, barking and snarling. Morgan pulled out her gun and aimed it at Bertha. Sylvia's heart hit the floor. She reached under the couch and pulled out the shotgun. Shoot them, I shoot you. Right now you're nothing but trespassers. Mercy! Shaw held up his hands. Let's all calm down, you don't want to shoot us? Get the fuck out of my house, she screamed. She was no sharpshooter. But at this range, she didn't have to be. She had two rounds of buckshot that would do some damage. Agent Morgan's shocked expression told her she had the upper hand. Aiming a gun at federal agents isn't the smartest move, Mercy. You should know better. Sylvia nodded. Agent, I suffer from PTSD, nightmares, hallucinations, panic attacks. Nothing about my life is smart anymore. I ran hundreds of miles from the violence and you just won't leave me in peace. I've done nothing. Nothing. Yet you harass me nonstop. Just leave me in peace. Morgan lowered her weapon. Sylvia did the same. What happened next happened in a flash. Morgan leapt over the table and tackled Sylvia to the floor, punching her in the face. Bertha and Mabel sprang into action, each taking a bite out of the agent's backside. Sylvia scooted back, fast as she could until she was against the fireplace. Agent Morgan was screaming, and Agent Shaw was pulling on Bertha's collar. The dogs. Surely they'd kill them now. Come! They immediately let go and raced to her side. They sat, but they growled at the agents. This went horribly wrong.
They were all going to die. Shaw helped Morgan to her feet. He picked up her briefcase and headed to the door. After helping her in the passenger seat, he came back, barging right in the house. Despite the warning from the dogs, he stood over Sylvia with his finger in her face. I swear on my sister's grave, if you're doing what I think you're doing, I won't rest until you get your lethal injection. Do you understand me? Tears streamed down her face. Just leave me alone. The minute the SUV pulled out of the drive, Sylvia sprang into action. She rushed to the kitchen, opened the drawer and pulled out a pre-filled syringe, giving herself a Benadryl shot. Then she sent a quick text to Mercy. She hoped she hadn't screwed everything. Chapter 18 My ass and thighs were bleeding. A mixture of throbbing pain and fire consumed me. Shaw pulled up outside a clinic and helped me inside. Whoa, looks like you got tore up good, the nurse said, looking at my pants. Not Shaw flashed his badge and barked at her to get me some help. She ran and grabbed a gurney. I climbed on it, face down, and tried not to cry as I was wheeled into an exam room. Scissors were used to cut through my pants. Shaw saw parts of me I never wanted him to see. But even the doctor couldn't get him to leave, and they hung an IV and stabbed it into my arm. Immediately after, I felt drowsy. This is gonna sting a little, the nurse said. They began cleaning my wounds. Whatever they used felt like acid on my skin. I focused on my breathing with each wipe. At some point, whatever they gave me took hold, and I fell asleep. When I woke, Shaw was sitting in a chair next to my bed. Good, you're awake. They said you can go home whenever you want. I have no pants, I cried. Shaw leaned in and smiled. Murphy, you brought an overnight bag. Remember? I brought it in. You might want to choose pajamas, though. Not sure you want the fabric tight around your wounds. I nodded and tried to climb off the bed. I was a bit woozy from whatever pain medication they gave me. Shaw put his arm under mine to offer support and tossed the bag on the bed. I reached in and grabbed a pair of track pants. Then I looked in his eyes. Don't look. I wasn't planning on it. I'll close my eyes. You lean on me as much as you need to. Once his eyes were closed, I pulled the pants on. Open your eyes. I'll sit down to put the shirt on. After dressing, I signed the papers. A nurse wheeled me out to the SUV. My head swung around like I was drunk. Whatever they had me on made me extremely loopy. I climbed in the passenger side of the SUV and sat down carefully, sliding my ass to the edge of the seat. I dozed in and out while Shaw drove. Shaw never drove. We should have arrested her. He shook his head. We can't. We violated her rights. We should have left when she asked us to leave. None of this would have happened if we followed the rules. I stared at the side of his head. Shit. He nodded. She has an excellent self-defense claim. Her lawyer is already all over this. I called Nightwell and she's on damage control already. Her lawyer? Bill Jones from Chicago. He's filed a restraining order against the FBI. Shaw chuckled. He cited emotional distress. And, well, it's a matter of record that Mercy suffers from PTSD and panic attacks. It's in two separate police reports. And the trial of William Jacoby. Right now we look like a bunch of bullies. Well played on her part. That manipulative little bitch. I sat, fuming mad. My backside felt like hamburger meat and nothing was going to happen to her. Murphy? When I looked at him, his brow was furrowed. Something is bugging me. Are you sober enough yet to think critically? I think my anger burned up the rest of whatever they gave me. I just feel tired. You remember that video outside the bar? Of course I do. What the hell was he getting at? How skilled she was at taking down a much larger man. Get to the point, Jack. He glanced sideways at me. You football tackled her, punched her in the face, and she did nothing. It was like she had no idea how to defend herself. I looked down at the ring on my finger. Quick, I need an evidence bag. Jeez, Murphy, your briefcase is right next to your feet. Leaning forward put pressure on my stitches. Still, I cringed and reached inside the side pocket and retrieved a bag, then pulled the ring off my finger and slid it inside. Uh, what are you doing? Having a moment of clarity. I laughed and shook my head. Why didn't I see this before? He eased onto an off-ramp. 
Care to share with the class? Well, Shaw, you know I might be high as a kite, but there's a dead nurse who happens to be a dead ringer for Mercy Connell. That dead nurse's body went missing. The mother never cashed the life insurance check. What if I didn't punch Mercy Connell in the face? What if the woman who cussed and swore at us was none other than the dead nurse? Ah. Jack pulled into a gas station and turned the engine off. That's a bit of a stretch, but it would explain some things. He clutched the wheel. Look, we went to question her, but we didn't have probable cause. We didn't have a warrant. She asked us to leave and we refused. But why on earth did you pull your piece on the dogs? Supposing that was Mercy, we know how emotional she is over those dogs. They're all she has. I had no answer. Then to jump on her after she lowered her weapon? That was totally out of character. We're trained to de-escalate the situation. For the first time in my career, I was in shock. This was difficult to admit. Honestly, I don't remember doing it. I was really angry, and she kept coughing and sneezing. Then she started swearing at us and acting like we were crazy. It was all over the place, and then, that gun, she actually said she'd shoot us. I just, I failed. Is that what's going in your report? Probably a carefully worded version. Yes, I can't lie out of this, and I wouldn't want to. That place is wired with security cameras. The footage is probably going to get me suspended. Shaw shook his head and climbed out, fueling up the SUV. When he climbed back in, he handed me a Coke. Water would be better, but I know you. You need the caffeine about now. Where are we going? I asked as he headed in the wrong direction. We're going to talk to that little girl. That put a smile on my face. If we were already in trouble, best get yelled at all at once. The drive didn't take long. When we approached, Shaw flashed his badge and explained I'd just been attacked by a dog. I showed my credentials to the parents. We entered a small but clean home. The parents retrieved the little girl, Charlotte. I could hear her whining from her room. Mommy, you said I don't have to talk to the police anymore. They're not police, baby. They're FBI. You don't have to talk about that bad man at all, okay? Shaw and I gave each other knowing looks. Neither of us wanted to make the child relive her ordeal. The little girl was clutching a stuffed bear as she followed her mother into the room. Sorry for my clothes, Charlotte. I have an injury on my bottom so I can't wear a suit. Is it okay if we talk to you? She brushed hair away from her face. Do we have to talk about the bad man? Not at all, Shaw said in a soft voice. I bet you've talked about that enough, huh? She nodded. The policeman asked me the same questions over and over. It was like he wasn't even listening. My heart dropped into my stomach, imagining the poor thing having to retell her horrific story over and over. Then there was the doctor lady. Jeez, she's so worried about feelings and nightmares, that's all she talks about. I gave her the nicest smile I could. I just have one question for you. May I show you a photo? Charlotte looked to her mother, who nodded. I guess. Is it bad? Shaking my head, I pulled out the photo of her and Mercy in the store. Do you know this woman? Her mother looked at the photo, then at us. What's this about? Mommy! Shh! She held her little finger over her mouth. Shaw kept his voice easy and steady. We're looking for her. It appears your daughter might know who she is. The little girl hugged her teddy bear to her chest and tightened her mouth shut. She wasn't going to talk. I'm sorry, but I think you should go. I don't want her getting upset again. She was so mad at the way I talked to the woman. Mommy, stop talking or I will never talk to you again. I'll go live with Nana and forget you exist. We had our answer. Charlotte, thank you for your time. You're a very strong little girl. I looked at her mother. Sorry for the intrusion. When the doors to the SUV were shut, we looked at each other beaming from our small victory. With a laugh, I shook my head. Catwoman has been identified. He tilted his head. Now it's not evidence, but it's a small victory to put in our report. The more evidence we gather, the better. Let's get home.
Chapter 19 Three days they scouted the place. Mercy tried hard not to let Sylvia's ordeal with the feds distract her. Instead, she called a favor into Bill. He was all over it. They'd checked in to the Vizcane, securing a room in the North Tower under the target. Freddy hacked into the system and looped the feed. He looked at her with nervous eyes. Ninety minutes, Max. Let's go. Inside the elevator, she hit the button for the penthouse. Freddy used some sort of device to get past the security key, and the elevator ascended without stopping. When they reached the top floor, a shocked security guard turned in time for Mercy to hit him with a taser. She pulled a roll of duct tape off her belt and secured his mouth closed before draping a pillowcase over his head. Using zip ties, she secured his hands behind him and his feet together. When it was clear, Freddy used the same device to unlock the door. There stood Matthew Brankovich with his back turned toward them. He was too comfortable and too cozy feeling safe and secure in his penthouse. Busy staring at a phone he didn't see her coming. She leaped in the air, dropping an elbow to the spine where the brainstem entered, dropping him in an instant. You've been a naughty little boy, Matthew. Unable to move, his eyes were wide as he stared at her in horror. She secured his hands and feet. Let's have a little chat, shall we? She grabbed his collar and dragged him to his desk. Seems you stole quite a lot of money recently and people are pissed. See, they're so pissed they sent me. She looked over her shoulder at an open door leading to a balcony. That's a nice balcony, so here's the deal. You have two options. Option one, put the money back in their account. Option two, take a swan dive off the balcony. What'll it be, Matthew? Freddy sat at his computer and began typing. He inserted a thumb drive. 30 seconds. See if my friend has to pull the money out, he's going to take it all, every last dime. If you do it, you can just put the money back you stole, and all will be well. She shrugged. Either way is fine with me. I didn't steal. They made deals that went bad. That's all. She shook her head, then punched him in the nose. Blood began pouring out of it. He rolled over as he began choking on it. Wrong, I saw the files. You're as filthy as it comes. Freddy cleared his throat. I'm in. No, don't take it all, Matthew cried. Don't leave me penniless. Where's the money, Matthew? He sobbed. Blood and snot ran down his face. I labeled it merger. Freddy searched for the file, linked it to an offshore account, and began the transfer. Two minutes, Max. Good boy, let's get you some fresh air. She took a knife and cut the zip tie from around his ankles. Come on, it's okay, you did the right thing. He looked at her with fear in his eyes. Come on, the fresh air will help dry that bloody nose. Tugging on his jacket, she managed to get him out to the balcony. She glanced at Freddy's screen. She could see the bar was almost at the end. Turning her attention back to Matthew, she held up her knife. Don't worry, I'm just going to let your wrists go, okay? He shook his head. No! She forced a smile. Now, Matthew, if I wanted to stab you, I would have done it already. Let's get those off. His hands shook as he lifted them up. He turned his face away and closed his eyes. The shock on his face when he opened his eyes almost made her laugh. See, that wasn't so bad. Freddy was now at the elevator, holding the door. Now, I do need to know that you learned your lesson about stealing. After wiping his bloody face on his shirt, he shook his head. Who are you? She took two steps toward the balcony door. My name is Mercy, but you shouldn't expect any from me. With that, she spun, kicking Matthew Brankovich off the balcony. She then went to his computer, pulled up a fresh Word document, and using her gloved hand, typed, I'm so sorry, I can't do this anymore. She quickly ran to the elevator. Once inside, she pulled off her gloves and belt, turning one pocket out that converted the belt into what looked like a large purse. She tucked the gloves, zip ties, the duct tape, and pillowcase off the guard inside, then zipped it closed. They went all the way to the lobby and made a quick exit. A fake argument about Freddy looking at some woman gave others a reason not to question why they were distracted from the chaos. They hurried two blocks away. 
Screams could be heard from those that witnessed Brockovich's body hit the ground. Once they reached the jeep, they sped out of town. You didn't have to kill him. She clutched the wheel and took a deep breath. He saw our faces, Freddy. Even with the disguises, I couldn't risk it. Besides, he'd steal from the less fortunate again. They always do. Still, it bothered her that he was there to witness it. This was who she was now. If it was too much for him, it was best she know now. He couldn't turn her in. He was her accomplice. I'm sorry, I've never, never been there when a life ended. He was bothered. Her conscience was clear. But then again, it wasn't her first kill. He pilfers the poor and desperate. He was a lowlife. He'd gotten away with it for years. Do you know how many of his victims died? Ten. Eight by suicide. Two by heart attack from the stress. That's ten devastated families thanks to him. She shook her head. I never kill the innocent, Freddy. After an exhausting 11-hour drive, they finally pulled up to the back of her property. After stowing the spare jeep, they carefully made their way to the house, stopping and listening. Sylvia had an awful run-in with Shaw and Morgan. It was just a matter of time before they were back with a search warrant if Bill hadn't been successful with his restraining order. When they made it inside the house, Mercy finally relaxed. Where's Sylvia? Where are the dogs? Hiding, she gasped as she plopped on the couch. Hiding? Where? Her lips spread into a wide smile. Freddy hadn't turned on her, even after killing that man. You're going to love this. He looked exhausted, worried, and confused. Love what? Come with me. She pried her exhausted body off the couch. He followed her to the basement. Mercy approached a bookshelf, pulled out one of the molding pieces, then swung open the bookshelf to reveal an entrance to a cave. Once they were on the other side of the bookshelf, she pulled it closed and twisted a knob, securing it. Well, that's some real cloak and dagger shit, he said with a laugh. McClooney Cave was open to the public until the 40s or 50s, I think. Then it closed as it was owned by private citizens. The government used it as a fallout shelter during the Cold War, but it's long since been forgotten. They continued walking down the narrow path until they reached a larger opening with a small waterfall. Pew, it stinks in here. He covered his mouth and nose. Sulfur, it's the only room that smells like that. They continued following the path which was getting wider. Voices could be heard in the distance. It was a television. They finally entered what could only be described as living quarters. Electricity powered a small television. A small fireplace was put strategically under part of the cave where it opened to the sky, making a natural chimney. A wooden riser kept the carpeted area elevated from the moist rock. Two full-sized beds rested in the corner. A small kitchen rested against one rock wall. God, I'm glad you're home. Sylvia was only beat by the dogs in getting to Mercy. The two embraced. I'm so sorry about everything. But I think your lawyer handled it. I haven't heard a thing. She shrugged. Don't worry about it. It's time they stop stalking me. Hang on. Freddy interrupted. This is insane. How'd you do all of this? Mercy smiled at him. I didn't. The former owner did. He was very gracious about the property sale, and so long as I allow him hunting privileges and access to this cave, he's happy. He could no longer afford to keep the property up and was happy to see it go to me. Of course, I paid off the taxes and cut him a check for his trouble after I started up my businesses. Why does he want access to the cave so bad? Freddie asked. Sylvia laughed. Moonshine. He makes it here. He walked over to a large tank next to the kitchen. This is amazing. He installed a sand water filtration system that cleans itself. He followed the tubing. And a recirculator. I'm impressed. Mercy hugged Mabel. Heard you got some ass? She giggled. That's not funny, Mercy. I was scared she'd shoot them. It had to have been horrifying for Sylvia. Listen, you did a fine job. Try not to worry. I'll take the dogs back up to the house. When I know we're safe, I'll let you know. She looked at Sylvia's lip. She really got you good, damn. 
If I didn't hate her before, I certainly do now. Sylvia shook her head. I wish I could have taken her down. Instead of swaying her mind, Mercy apologized once more and took the dogs and Freddy back to the house. She went straight to her office and checked her account. Once she confirmed the deposit was there, she transferred half to Freddy's account set up with the same Swiss bank. It's all done. The money is in your account. She closed the window and turned the chair. Freddy was leaning against the wall, staring at the floor. Something wrong? His eyes looked heavy as his gaze slowly trailed up to hers. Returning the money feels good, Mercy. But what you did back there. I'm not judging, but how do you do it? How do you live with yourself? A lump formed in her throat as she searched for the words. I don't know, Freddy. Something snapped in me after what, after Chicago. There's no real justice in this world. We lock up people forever for stupid crimes, but the real assholes get away with their crimes. Every other case I've taken has been a real shitbag who had it coming. The drug dealer probably would have gotten lead poisoning from someone else if it weren't me. I mean, he had already killed a woman, and the minute he got out, he was standing on the street corner peddling death. But this guy in Miami? Did he really deserve to die? She turned her back to him. It's done now. He can't hurt anyone else. The chair jerked as Freddy spun her back around. Her eyes grew wide as she looked at him in shock. Don't you dare shut me out. Not me. Not today, Mercy. I've been good to you. I've kept your secrets and done things for you I'd never do for anyone else. I'm just trying to understand. Moisture pooled in his lower lids. I promised you I'd wait. I promised you everything. I just need some clarity. She chewed her bottom lip as her heart threatened to leap from her chest. I am broken, Freddy. After a job, I finally get sleep, no nightmares. I feel more at ease knowing there's one less Willie out there. I don't know what to tell you. If I didn't kill him, he could have identified us. I couldn't let you go to jail. Me? His mouth fell open. What about you? Her shoulders sagged. I'm not afraid of jail. What about a death sentence? She shrugged. At least I could get some rest. His hands fisted in his hair for a moment before he finally let go. I'm in love with a maniac. Maybe you shouldn't be. She knew he was in love with her. He'd confessed as much. But she also knew what the future held. And for him, it wasn't so bright. A rest was in her future. A trial. Death was a possibility. Like I have a choice. Chapter 20 With my ass finally healed from those damned dogs, I was able to sit in my office chair pain-free. Shaw and I pored over files, reports, and what little forensic evidence we had on the Michelangelo case. The vigilante killings had slowed, so the FBI stepped back to allow the state and local law enforcement agencies to handle the cases on an individual basis. There were few cases that evaded us like our Michelangelo. There was the Zodiac killer, but that case was closed when the killing stopped. The theories surrounding that case ranged from karma to illness, but the fact remained that killers kill, they don't stop, and the more they do it, the more they have to. It's a compulsion. Still, it bothered me. It bothered me that our friend sent us a note to say goodbye. It bothered me that he or she was still walking free because they were just that good. Michelangelo had lives to account for. We couldn't just let them walk away from the carnage. Lila, an assistant at the bureau, knocked on the door jam. Agents Shaw and Murphy. We looked at each other, puzzled. We had no meetings. Yes, I answered. She smiled back at me. When she tilted her head, her black ponytail peeked out from behind her. There's a Sean Kingston waiting for you in conference room five. Hoping he had something good for us, I sprang out of my chair. We'll be right there. Please make him comfortable. With a nod, she spun on her heel and headed toward the conference room. Shaw's petrified look was almost entertaining. The mystery girl seen with Ms. Connell. Kingston was going to have his people analyze the photo. Don't worry, partner. I doubt he's going to pick you apart again. Off your ass, on your feet, let's go. In all the years I knew Jack Shaw, I'd never seen him dawdle, but that's exactly what he did. I didn't need a psychology degree to know he was making Kingston wait. 
To that point, I took no issue. But he was making me wait too, and that drove me crazy. With my arms crossed over my chest, I lifted my brow. Three seconds and I'm leaving you behind. Fine. He grumbled as he refilled his coffee mug. When we finally reached the office, Jocelyn Nightwell was waiting with Kingston. She didn't look pleased with the wait, either. Shaw's face was red. I stepped toward Kingston with purpose and extended my hand. It's a pleasure to see you again. His head dipped for a split second. Pleasure is all mine, ma'am. I was just telling your director that we've been working on this photo for you. Shaw sat at the table without uttering a word as if it was to say, I don't give a shit if you like me. Our specialists use software to change the face ever so slightly. This will adjust for aging, change in facial structure due to accidents or surgery. We've narrowed your woman down to two possibilities. The first, he turned on the large screen in the room, is Carolyn Ann Fry. The bone structure around the forehead, and yes, they are the same, as is the width between the eyes. Carolyn is a 38-year-old wife and mother who lives in Colorado. She has a terrible driving record and can't balance a checkbook to save her life. But other than that, she's clean. I jotted her name down anyway. The second possibility is a woman named Clacinda Roseland Newland. The bone structure around the nose, chin, and brows are different. However, the shape of the eyes is identical. There are up to 80 points of reference that match on this subject, depending on the algorithm used. Now here's the fun part. He pressed a button on his laptop and a photo of a young teen popped up next to the photo I'd given him. Newland hasn't been seen in almost 20 years, and her past is full of violence and misery. She started really getting into trouble after her brother died of an overdose, and then she vanished. Recruited to learn how to kill was my bet. Shaw put his hand on his head. So, this girl vanishes two decades ago and turns up visiting with a woman of interest in another missing person's case? I could see the stress building. He'd questioned my suspicion of mercy so hard and fought me tooth and nail about her. Now, evidence was mounting that something bigger was at play than a simple victim of circumstance. The realization was now smacking him right in the face. Nightwell folded her hands and looked down at the table. While this may be suspicious, it still is not enough justification for a warrant. Keep digging. Our director had her own ass chewed for my actions at Mercy's home. Attorney Jones had done what many others had tried and failed to accomplish. He was awarded a protective order. We were barred from approaching Mercy Connell unless the same judge issued us a search warrant or warrant for her arrest. We weren't allowed to question her approach her or perform any sort of surveillance whatsoever where Mercy Connell was concerned. Checkmate. Still, I had one more card to play, but it had to be played strategically. Kingston handed us a thumb drive with his findings. Shaw was the first to leave the room. Jocelyn noticed she watched him as he hurried from the conference room. She turned to me, brows drawn in. What's with him? Mr. Kingston profiled him. He isn't taking it well. I shrugged. When our director turned to Kingston, she shook his hand, thanked him for his contribution, and excused herself from the conference room. As she said, I began as I shook his hand, thank you for your help. Our staff is buried in cases, and this one is a bit time sensitive. He released my hand and closed his laptop in one smooth movement. It was interesting watching him move. It was so fluid. One hand scooped the laptop off the table while the other opened the satchel, while the laptop was gently tucked inside. Someone disappears for a few decades. You ask about Sistema and show me a video of someone who supposedly learned such skill in mere months. If these two are tied and they've both been recruited for less than savory occupations, you might find yourself over your head, Agent Morgan. His face was expressionless as he gazed at me. It was almost as if he didn't want to influence my reaction. Did he want my absolute objectivity? What makes you say that? He pulled out a chair and sat, pulling himself forward and folding his hands on the table. I stood like a fool until I realized he was waiting for me to follow suit. When I was finally seated, he continued. I mentioned one of the instructors was disabled. You recall? Yes. He flattened his hands on the table. Matthew. His name is Matthew. He began in the Russian Special Forces, but immigrated to the States under... 
unusual circumstances. He's well-connected, Agent Morgan. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? This Matthew had either worked for our government handling their dirty work or was still connected to high-ranking officials due to some shady backroom deal. Either way, this was a warning. I'm guessing I don't have the necessary security clearance to dig into him. Kingston finally smiled. Neither does the director. I can't say more about that matter, but I urge you to keep an open mind about this case. Matthew loves subterfuge. He loves games. Gets off on them. I'm not surprised he's recruiting women. My mind raced as I fought to decipher his words. Why is that? Again, his lips spread into an easy smile. How many times have you been underestimated in your career? We are trained to think of women as weaker, both physically and mentally. Yet it's women who hold families together while holding careers, managing households and the finances. It's women who carry around a 30-pound toddler while carrying an 8-pound infant in their womb, oftentimes while performing another task. Put a man in that pressure cooker, they crack. Well, most of them. That's the biggest dose of reverse misogyny I think I've ever swallowed. I leaned back in my chair and digested what I could. Kingston stood, slung his satchel over his shoulder, and gave me a firm nod. Get your partner's head screwed on straight. He needs to watch your back. Rising from my chair, I bit my lip. Shaw was fine. He just couldn't stand Kingston. Thank you, again. When he left, I closed the door to the conference room and returned to the table. In the stillness and quiet of the conference room, I could see the picture coming together. The blur of chaos removed. My mind focused and the answers began to arrive. I knew how this was going to end. Mercy on the stand, a jury of her peers judging her. She'd done so well at Jacoby's trial. She was strong, poised, empathetic. She hit them right where it hurt, when it counted. She did all of this while suffering from trauma. What could she do when the ball was in her court and she was prepared?
Chapter 21 It had been a month without harassment from the FBI. Sylvia and Mercy were beginning to relax. The dictation was caught up, and they decided to take a few weeks off. She'd yet to touch the offshore account. One job early on was for cash. That cash was tucked away and used for expenses she didn't want tracked, such as the spare Jeep, and any money spent on her business trips. Daily expenses, taxes, insurance, groceries, was all traceable and trackable, meaning the dictation work had to bring in enough money to cover those bills. Between Freddie's software and both Sylvia and Mercy editing the documents, there was a nice, legitimate income. But the Miami job had been over a month ago, and the nightmares plagued her sleep. Restless and edgy, she tried to keep busy. She'd play with the dogs, work in the garden, clean, anything to keep her mind off her troubles. The rushing water sound threatened to rip her from reality as her mind tried to protect itself from the stress with an alter ego. Mercy didn't want to lose herself again, lose Sylvia. Instead, she fought it. Every morning started with the two of them having coffee and talking about something. Anything, really. Sometimes they repeated discussions just so Mercy could be sure she had the details right. They went over their emergency action plan, what each would do if the police came for her. But Freddie left on a sour note. She knew she'd disappointed and scared him. Who could blame her? She was a murderer, plain and simple. She finally sat down at her computer and rang Freddy on the private network. Hey, Mercy. His smile wasn't as wide as usual. There were bags under his eyes. Freddy? She gasped. You look awful. What's wrong? He averted his gaze from the webcam. Can't sleep. Was he having nightmares of her throwing that piece of crap off the building? I was worried about that. Calling was a mistake. I just can't, I can't stand the distance, he confessed. Between us? No, to the coffee shop. Of course, between us. I'm trying to give you the space you need, but honestly, Mercy, it hurts. Still, he wasn't looking into the camera. It was a knife to the chest. She never thought she'd find romantic love, never even wanted it. But slowly, through loyalty and understanding, he'd won her heart. Maybe I could come to Chicago and see you. Going to Chicago was not ideal. It was full of horrid memories. She watched as his shoulders rose and fell as he took a deep breath. No, just do what you need to do. I will be okay. Just know that waking up next to you was the happiest moment in my life. I'd like to feel that way again. He ended the call without saying goodbye. Feeling more miserable than ever, she put her head on the desk and fought back the tears. That's when a message popped up from Tommy. The file was labeled, Just Your Style. She opened the file and read about an abused wife who tried to leave her husband numerous times. Photos of bruises were attached. The bounty was fifty grand, but the destination was New Orleans. I could use a vacation. She quickly dialed Tommy. I received your file. He looked at her through his computer. Jesus, you look like shit. She shrugged. Nightmares. You know, his release isn't that far off. Have you considered putting an end to your nightmare? No, never. The thought of killing Willie had never entered her mind. I'm fine. Tell the client I'll take the work. He squinted his eyes. You're sure this connection is secure? She nodded back at him. I trust the person who designed it. If your laptop is being watched, the feed is being scrambled. They're more than likely getting some weird porn or slaughterhouse footage. Tommy laughed and stroked his full red beard. Well, the client wants to meet you beforehand. Her husband is out of town on business until Sunday. I suggest you get on it. Make it quick and clean and get out. She'd never met with a client before. How would she handle it? Fine. With one firm nod and a stroke of his beard, he closed the chat window. Little did he know the speaker was still on. You're making quite a bit of money off this one, a voice said in the background. I don't recall asking your opinion. Tommy's voice was rough, irritated. 
Never would have imagined it is all I'm saying. Finally, she recognized the voice. It was the man she disarmed to prove herself to Tommy. Again, Tommy gave a hearty laugh. Oh, we can agree on that. But she's good, she's honest. I don't have to chase her around to be sure she's doing her damn job. Speaking of, shouldn't you be doing something? She felt bad eavesdropping and severed the connection. Still, she had an idea. She ran out of her office and down to the basement. Pack your bags. Sylvia's eyes widened as fear struck her face. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's happening. Mercy grabbed her arms. I have a trip I'm going to take you with. First, I have to secure a sitter for the house and dogs. I'll be back. A trip into town and to her favorite bartender gave her the name and address of a trustworthy, dog-loving young woman in need of some money. Her name was Rachel, and she was eager and willing to take the job at the last minute. Just give me five minutes, the twenty-something yelled up a set of stairs. Mama, I got a sitting job. I'll be back in a few days. Good, a female voice yelled. Get your ass out there and make some money. Rachel gave Mercy a sheepish look. Mercy smiled back at her. Thank you for taking it on such short notice. I'll be out in my jeep waiting. Once in the jeep, she made plans with Sylvia to meet at the cave's entrance so that Rachel didn't see her. Five minutes later, the young woman climbed in with a small bag. Mercy drove her to the house, showed her around, and introduced her to the girls. I'll take care of them. Mabel was in love. She was on her back getting belly scratches from Rachel. Look, they don't need much. The dog door has a lock on it if you need to leave. Just keep them fed and watered. Help yourself to whatever food or drinks you want. Just please clean up after yourself. I have a ton of movies in that cabinet over there and books around the corner in the closet. Rachel jumped up and down. Just the silence. That's all I want. Our house is so noisy all the damn time. Mama likes to holler. Are you 21? Rachel beamed. 23 and a half. What an odd answer. There's a wine rack in the kitchen. Help yourself. I suggest a glass of wine and filling the tub in the downstairs bathroom. It's huge. You can soak, drink, read, relax. The only warning is that the girls have no idea about privacy. They'll sit and stare at you. Rachel laughed. I got this. Go. She came highly recommended, but Mercy had difficulty leaving. But Sylvia was waiting. So she went to her closet, grabbed her suitcase, which was already packed, and headed out. When she spotted Sylvia, she barely recognized her. She had long, flowing red hair under a big sun hat. A fake nose had changed her face, too. It seemed longer and thinner. Sylvia had a gift with the latex and makeup applications. She'd picked it up so fast she ended up teaching Mercy. They swapped jeeps and started the drive to New Orleans. While they drove, Sylvia secured a bed and breakfast just outside the French Quarter. Seemed the hottest part of the year wasn't necessarily the busiest. Five hours later, they finally arrived at a beautiful large home on Royal Street and checked in. The hosts were so gracious and kind, Mercy thought she never wanted to leave. It was like being home. Still, she needed to explore the area, and Sylvia was dying to get out. They were first given a map by the owner who had different areas of interest in the quarter, including a jelly bean shape he drew on, indicating it as the Fruit Loop or Gay Friendly Area. There were numerous recommendations for food and entertainment. He ended by handing them business cards for a taxi service that he recommended. If you get too drunk, just tell them the Royal Courtyard or hand them this card. They'll bring you right here. He gave us a smile and a wave as we left. Mercy wondered if people really got so drunk they couldn't even speak and had to resort to handing business cards out to make it home. Making their way by foot, they stopped just inside the quarter for some food. Sylvia was beautiful in her disguise. After being locked up in basements for months, she was finally out among a crowd. It suited her. She had a big, bright smile and an infectious laugh. Mercy could almost forget that this wasn't a vacation. After dinner, they caught a walking tour. Other tours passed on the crowded streets and sidewalks. Something the tour guide said caught Mercy's attention. The river is 2,300 feet wide and 200 feet deep. 
the average life expectancy, should you fall in, is five seconds. But the current isn't what is so deadly. Because if the current doesn't get you, a bull shark or a gator is gonna make you their dinner. With over a hundred unsolved murder cases each year, it's not hard to guess what happened to the body. Sylvia leaned over and whispered in Mercy's ear, Is this guy really telling us how to kill each other? Mercy gave a sinister smile. Just how to dispose of the body. With the tour over, they did the touristy thing to do and grabbed drinks at different bars. When they finally reached the room, they were both ready to pass out. I have work to do tomorrow, but I have an idea. Mercy forced her sleepy eyes open. Sylvia pulled the fake nose off. Shopping? Mercy nodded. I'll give you the card. Get us some clothes, maybe some decorations for home. If you find something for the dogs, get it. I'd like to bring them a present. So I go as us tomorrow, and you'll go as someone else? Yeah, I'll be the imposter. The two of them laughed sleepily. Fully clothed and a little tipsy, Mercy allowed her mind to let go. Nightmares be damned. Mercy followed the GPS to a house that set right on the Mississippi. She had to shake her head, knowing that she had an easy way to dispose of the body. She parked almost a mile away and doubled back. She knocked at the door. When the door opened, a short woman answered. Her hair, nails, brows, everything was perfect. Her makeup was flawless. Lipstick. Flawless. Catherine? Yes? Mercy swallowed. I'm here about your problem. Come inside, the woman flagged. No, ma'am, do you have a back porch? The woman's eyes narrowed. Outside. It's hot as Hades outside. Mercy stood her ground. Fine. She closed the door behind her and led Mercy to a back porch. Despite her skin sweating under the latex, Mercy felt as if discussing business inside a personal home was prime territory for a setup. Frank's a real bastard. Hits me all the time. He likes the bottle, you see. She lit a cigarette she was holding, then blew out the smoke. So how do you do it? No, she was not answering questions. Tell me more about Frank. Well, he never touches me anymore except to hit me, of course. Mercy nodded. Something felt off. Are there any children? Please. Does this body look like it's carried children? Arrogant, rude, not the signs of a victim. That's good. We don't want little ones involved. Now, how long has this been going on? The fake waterworks started, and Mercy wanted to leave right then. Six months or so. The file said three years. There were too many inconsistencies. Do you have a photo of him? The woman reached inside the pocket of her dress and pulled out a cell phone. After tapping it a few times, she showed Mercy a picture. The background stood out. Thank you, that's all. Be sure you have an alibi between Sunday and Tuesday. Mercy stood and resisted the urge to sprint to her truck. This guy was not hitting his wife. Whatever reasons she had for wanting him dead were her problem. She was not doing the job. You're just leaving? The woman balked. Mercy stomped the four steps back to the woman, stopping an inch away from her face. Then she pulled her lips up in a forced smile. Exactly how much time do you want to spend with a killer? Catherine started to shake before taking a step back and looking down at the ground. When Mercy was satisfied the woman was scared, she made her way down the street. The latex started to pull away from her chin. Damn this heat. She pushed it back on and held it until she got to her vehicle, then cranked the air conditioning. She pulled out the map the owner of the bed and breakfast gave her. The owner of the bed and breakfast was gay had introduced them to his husband, and probably assumed Mercy and Sylvia were a couple as well. It didn't matter. She'd seen the background of Frank's photo and was certain she could find the same background in the area on the map. So after making her way back and parking the car outside the B&B, &B, she hurried to the French Quarter. With a little navigating, she began to see rainbow flags. She kept her eyes peeled, peeking inside each club as she walked. There was one particular decor on her agenda. 
After ten more buildings, she finally spotted the wall she was looking for. A tie-dyed colored wall with large vinyl cutouts of bare-chested men with boas. This was the bar. Mercy took a deep breath before entering the bar. She spotted Frank within seconds, sitting in the corner, holding hands with another man. This was Catherine's motive. What can I get you? The bartender asked. Mercy turned toward him. He had a wide smile and dark curly hair. Can you make me a martini something fruity, please? Oh, honey, you say please in this bar. You don't even need to tip. He picked up a martini shaker and spun it in his hand. You here alone? She had no idea where Sylvia was. I lost my girlfriend to shopping. I just need a drink. The bartender grinned as he shook the canister. He strained the pink drink into a chilled martini glass. Twelve bucks. She gladly slid the amount plus tip across the bar. A Cosmo. He'd mixed a Cosmo. Not really what she had in mind, but she knocked back half of it immediately. With a glance toward Frank, she knew she had to get information. Ah, oh, would you look at them? She nodded toward Frank and his friend. The bartender rolled his eyes. They're a new item. A few months now, I think. Lovey, dovey, gag me. He laughed. Honestly, I'm just jealous. They are adorable together. So they were a new item. Mercy's guess was that Frank either came out and asked for a divorce, or she'd caught him. Either way, it didn't warrant a death sentence. After ordering a second drink, she grabbed up her glass and headed to their table. Oh no, honey. We're not looking for some hillbilly threesome. Frank's partner shook his head and finger at her. Relax, I'm not here for that. She sat at their table, and Frank's friend gasped. She turned to Frank. Is your name Frank Weinhold? His mouth fell slightly. Yes, and you are? Here with bad news. Mercy was taking a huge risk. Frank looked at the man with him. Yeah, if you haven't known him long, I'd suggest you request a few moments of privacy. His friend gasped a second. You are not getting rid of me for a woman. Not again. I shrugged. What I'm about to say is going to shake your world, so if he knows everything about you, then he can stay. If not, it's your choice. Frank nodded. He can stay. She had to muster the courage to do the right thing. Very well, then. Do not go back to that house. Catherine has put a bounty on your head. The air rushed out of his lungs as tears began spilling down his cheeks. She has a bullshit story about you beating her. He has never hit her. Philip, it's okay. Frank put his hand on the man's arm. I didn't think she had it in her. I don't know why she just won't sign the divorce papers already. Shouting and commotion broke out just outside the bar. People were rushing to see what was going on. Mercy could not help herself. She sprang into action, sprinting outside. Two large young men wearing college shirts were shoving a smaller man back and forth between them. Come on, faggot. Do something. That's enough, Mercy said as she stepped between the smaller man and the guy pushing him. You a faggot too? The guy stood about six foot three. His blonde hair was slicked back. His breath reeked of beer and smoke. His shirt wasn't a university shirt as she'd first thought. It said, University of Pussy. Something happened inside her. She'd sparred for months in training, but it wasn't something she ever looked forward to. It was a means to an end. But this asshole, this asshole made her want to hit. Yes, yes, I am a faggot. I'm a big, giant, flaming homoer, she yelled. The crowd cheered. You're in the Fruit Loop, boys, Mercy said with a laugh. You need to go back to Straightville. It's that way, she pointed down the street. Faggot or not, I don't hit bitches. His buddy shoved the young man again, and he bumped into Mercy. She put two gentle hands on his arms and walked him toward the bar. Stay here. She returned and squared off with the pair. Time to go, boys. The tall guy's buddy was shorter, but stocky. This must be a tranny. That's why it wants to fight. Last warning, move along. She'd had about all the hateful slurs she was going to take. 
she turned her attention to the taller man. While she was focused on him, short and stocky grabbed her hair. Mercy swung her arm up and turned toward him, bringing it down, locking his arm under hers. In one fluid movement, she hit him in the throat, then released him. As he was gasping for air, she turned to Toll and Stinky. In an odd and unexpected move, he attempted to kick her between the legs. She checked his kick with her shin. You idiots really think I'm a guy? He threw an uppercut, which she avoided by leaning back quickly. While his arm was on the rise, she punched him in the kidney three times. He dropped to the ground and vomited. Once again, the crowd cheered. It was time to go. She jogged a block, found a taxi, and took it to the B&B. &B. This day had not gone as planned. She ran to the room, which was filled with bags and packages, but no Sylvia. Her heart raced. Where was Sylvia? Mercy ran down the stairs. Joining your girlfriend in the hot tub? The owner's husband stood in the office looking at her in the hall. Oh, God, thank you. I thought I'd lost her. Turning on her heel, she walked down the hall to the back door and onto the patio. Sylvia was in the hot tub with a large drink that looked like a hand grenade with a spout on top. You should try this. It's awful, but it's strong. Out of the tub, Mercy said, waving her out. What? No. Liquor and hot water are a bad combination. Please get out of the hot tub. Mercy grabbed her hand. I got you. Please, please step out. She helped Sylvia out of the water, dried her off, then begged her to go to the room. She finally complied. Mercy struggled to keep the woman upright. Sylvia was so drunk she could hardly walk. Trying not to panic, she finally reached the top of the stairs and unlocked the door. Sylvia stumbled inside and fell on the bed. God damn it! She looked at the packages and bags and scooped all she could up. After five trips with purchases, she had them loaded up in the jeep. Sylvia was passed out, snoring like a bear. Mercy pulled pajamas out of the luggage and pulled them on over her wet bathing suit. With her friend dressed, Mercy carried out the luggage, stopping at the office. We have an emergency at home, so I need to settle up. The man frowned. I'll have to charge for the day. Oh, I fully understand. Please add 20% for the cleaning lady. I can't imagine what she deals with. Oh my goodness, it's her. Two men stood in the entryway. Shit, shit, shit. The man behind the desk looked at them, then at Mercy. Who? Her? She's the one who took down those two thugs. They were pushing Kent around, threatening to beat him up. She kicked their asses. She gave the innkeeper a weak smile. Just doing my civic duty. Kent is my friend, he said as he held her credit card. He pressed a button, canceling the transaction. The room is free. Thank you for standing up. The whole community is talking about this. There was no time for this. Really, it's my father. I have to go. What about your friend? He asked. Mercy shook her head. I'll carry her like a baby if I have to. The two men who recognized her offered to help. No need for anyone to get hurt. Just show us the way. Having two strangers put their hands on Sylvia was less than desirable, but she had to get out of New Orleans. Who knew how many cameras had snapped a photo of her? She led the men to the room. Both seemed respectful as they gently lifted Sylvia off the bed and carefully carried her down the stairs. Once she was secured in the Jeep, Mercy thanked them for their help. It was nothing. What you did, that was brave. We take a very passive stance to the drunk tourists because they keep our economy going. The guy shrugged. But it was nice to have someone stand up for us. She didn't know what to say. It was an honor. With a wave, she climbed in the jeep and drove. The whole thing with Catherine had her blood boiling. Then the two douchebags outside the bar who were going to beat up one small man because they could. Because they thought they had the right, just because the guy was gay. She realized where she was, in Catherine's neighborhood. She stopped a few blocks away and cut the engine. It was dark. Most homes were darkened as people were sleeping. 
Slowly, she climbed out of the jeep, then locked a very unconscious Sylvia inside. Careful to avoid the hue of the streetlights, she made her way to Catherine's home. She peeked inside the living room window. The woman was standing behind the living room in a small kitchen, smoking a joint. Mercy crept around the side of the house to the back door and tested the door. It wasn't locked. She slowly pushed the door open to hear the sound of someone searching a refrigerator. Peeking around the corner, she made sure they were alone. Hello, Catherine. The woman shot up straight and spun around. What are you doing here? Mercy took a step toward her. You're a liar. How dare you? Catherine stepped toward the sink and pulled a large butcher's knife out of a block of wood. How dare I? You were going to kill a man simply because he didn't want to be with you. Worse yet, you wanted me to do it for you. The woman swiped at Mercy with a knife. Mercy stepped back and laughed. The next time you won't be so lucky. See, I told Frank you hired me to kill him. Catherine reached in her pocket and pulled out her phone. I'm calling the police. Mercy spread her feet shoulder width apart, arms straight at her side. Please, please call them. She dropped the phone back in her pocket and lifted the knife. Leave now, and I won't have to use this. With a shake of her head, Mercy taunted her. Why kill him? Money? This shit shack? The crazy woman started to laugh. Because he walked away from me for a man. Didn't that stupid shit know he was gay? Why'd he even marry me? You almost had me kill him, Mercy growled at the woman. He deserves to die. He's a stupid, weak, fucking queer. She dove at Mercy with the knife again. This time, she grabbed the woman's wrist and turned it, impaling her with her own blade. I told you that you wouldn't be so lucky a second time. Catherine's blue eyes grew very wide as the realization of her impending death hit her. Blood poured from her wound. Mercy grabbed her and pulled her out the door, off the porch and onto the dock. Catherine stood with the knife still in her stomach. Help me, please, she cried. Now you want to beg and plead? She fell to her knees. Who are you? Mercy bent down so that they were eye to eye. My name is Mercy, but you shouldn't expect any from me. With that, she kicked the woman off the dock into the Mississippi. She was swept under immediately. Running back into the house, Mercy blew the pilot lights out on the stove and turned the burners up all the way. Then she wiggled the plug loose from the fridge into the wall. She locked the back door as she left. I Sticking to the shadows, she made her way back to the jeep. Sylvia was still fast asleep inside. It was time to go home. Tommy was... Chapter 22 DNA evidence was conclusive. My ring was embedded with flesh from Sylvia McDermott's face. The nurse was alive. With that evidence, a judge issued a warrant for the arrest of Sylvia McDermott for faking her own death. As we approached the house, my nerves grew jumpy. How would Mercy react? How would the nurse? There were too many unknown factors. Did the nurse also learn to shoot and fight during this time? How the hell did she stay hidden so well for so long? When we pulled into the drive, we noticed that Mercy's Jeep was gone, but two old pickup trucks sat in the drive instead. We had local police with us to serve the warrant in an effort to forego jurisdictional pissing matches. They pulled up behind us. When Shaw and I exited the SUV, three men ran out of the cabin with rifles. FBI, drop your weapon. Drop yours, you filthy fed. The guy spit on the ground. He looked like he was straight out of deliverance. You ain't got no business here. Now, Virgil, the local officer yelled. These fine folks are here looking for a woman named Sylvia McDermott. They got a warrant. Ain't no one by that name here. Virgil pulled his rifle up tighter. Just my girl watching some dogs. You go on now. Shaw looked at me. McDermott's father is deceased, right? I nodded. Sir, we have a warrant, I yelled. We have no quarrel with you. The guy to his right fired his gun into the air. These ain't rubber bullets, ma'am. We said there ain't no one here. Finally, the third guy lowered his gun. If you have a warrant for her arrest, but not a search warrant, then you have to leave. You have three law-abiding citizens armed because we know our rights. You have to leave. 
They don't own this property, I said to the local. Neither do you. I say you come back some other time. He climbed in his car and started to back out, and I looked to Shaw. We could shoot it out. He shook his head. Then we have dead civilians and no suspect. Let's go. We can come back when the trucks are gone. But now they'd know we were here. Trying to remain calm, I called out. Is Mercy home? Virgil laughed and dropped his rifle slightly. Boy, you feds are dumber than a box of rocks. Now why would my girl be babysitting some dogs if their damned owner were here? He looked to the guy on his right. Bobby Joe, you ever seen feds before? No, Virgil, but I'm not impressed. Shaw and I gave up and packed it in. Sure, we could start a shooting match, but if McDermott wasn't on the premises, then we were simply violating the restraining order. As we backed out of the drive, I silently cursed. This was our way in, and it went sideways. We drove a few miles away and grabbed a hotel room in the only place we could find. There was no way in hell I was sleeping on the bed, but it was at least somewhere we could regroup. Shaw called into Nightwell, asking for direction. Could they have been tipped off? Mercy never left home. She lived the life of a hermit to anyone who was watching. But suddenly she was gone long enough to need someone to care for her dogs? I quickly pulled out my cell and called in, asking to speak to any analyst available. I need a list of assassinations and murders within a ten-hour drive. Just send me an email. The analyst on the phone groaned. The bureau had been working them hard as of late. Still, I thanked her for her help as I cracked open my laptop, connecting to the hotel's spotty internet. Nightwell said to go back tomorrow to serve the warrant. Shaw shook his head. But if the trucks are there, we are to move on. Tomorrow. Tomorrow meant sleeping in the nasty hotel. The bed looked like it had been there since the 80s. Those people were awfully protective of that property for someone just house-sitting. I rubbed my forehead. To draw weapons on federal agents is a bit ballsy, don't you think? Shawhaft. We're in the gut-toting South, Murph. These people are all about protecting their rights. They're certainly not big on government. I'm not surprised at all. Across the street was the bar where Mercy had subdued the serial killer. Suddenly, I felt like a burger. Let's eat. Shaw didn't argue. We locked up our room and headed across the street. When we entered, the place grew quiet. The woman behind the bar suggested we seat ourselves. A waitress brought menus. Can I get you something to drink? She failed to smile or make eye contact. This was treatment we were used to. We made people uncomfortable, and in a small community, everyone knew everyone else. Not only were we strangers, we were feds. The shit stuck to the bottom of their shoe. Shaw cranked up the charm. I'll take a sweet tea, please. He smiled, though she didn't notice. And for you, ma'am? She stood staring at her pad, pen at the ready. Coke, thank you. It's like we didn't shower or something, I complained as I looked at the menu. She returned with our drinks. Ready to order? There was a woman standing behind the bar staring at us. She'd wiped the same spot so many times I was sure she was wearing off the finish. I'll take a cheeseburger. Shaw ordered a BLT. We waited. Finally, the woman behind the bar walked out to us. Everything okay with the service? I left this up to Shaw. It was his department. He smiled and folded his hands in his lap. Yep, we had our beverages right away and she immediately took our order. She's doing a fine job. I love the decor in here. The 50s diner thing really hits home with me, makes me nostalgic. The woman's lips curved into smile. Thank you. I decorated it myself. Do you mind if I ask what y'all are doing in this neck of the woods? I reached in my jacket and pulled out the photo of Sylvia McDermott. We're looking for this woman. Her eyes grew wide. Mercy, why on earth are you looking for Mercy? That's not Mercy Connell. Her name is Sylvia McDermott. I waited to see how she reacted. Her brows pulled together. Now my eyes are pretty good, ma'am. And that's Mercy. And she's sweet as pie. She's worked hard to earn the respect of this community. I can't imagine she's done anything to gain the interest of the federal government. I mean, you're feds, right? FBI, CIA, or something. Maybe Homeland Security. I held in the laugh that threatened to escape. The black suits give us away, huh? 
She nodded. Anyway, Mercy's gone on vacation for a few weeks. Somewhere north, she said, to get out of the heat. My partner scooted over. Please have a seat. I'm sure standing all day is hard on the feet. After she scooted in next to him, he started. So, Mercy has been a good member of the community? She's done so much, helped so many people since she arrived. People these days just don't know how to be good neighbors. She reminds me of the time when I was growing up. My mama used to do the washing for our neighbor after she broke her hip. Five years my mama washed, dried, ironed, and folded all their clothes. Her only payment was the Lord's blessing. My mama died a happy woman surrounded by love. Mercy is that way. She does for others all the time, paints barns, rearranges kitchens for the crippled, fixes vehicles for those who are too poor to do it themselves. She's just a gem. Shaw and I shot each other glances. That, that right there was why we were greeted with firearms. She wasn't just one of them. She was their savior. Well, this isn't Mercy. The woman looks an awful lot like Mercy, but she was a nurse in Chicago. We thought she was dead. But it turns out she's very much alive. I pointed at the photo. So, you're sure you've only seen Mercy? Honey, does Mercy have a twin sister? Because no two people look and sound exactly the same, unless they're twins. And even then, there's differences. She shook her head. I ain't saying y'all are dumb. Clearly, you wouldn't have the jobs you had if you were foolish. But I think someone gave you a bad piece of information. When the waitress arrived with the food, the woman left us to eat. A few weeks? There was no way I could get Shaw to stay in the heat and humidity for a few weeks without good reason. We'd have to get a better hotel so I could sleep without fear of bedbugs and cockroaches crawling on me. When we finished eating, we left a hefty tip and went back to our room. The door stood open. We glanced at each other and pulled our weapons. Shaw pushed the door open with his foot. We cleared the room, the bathroom, and the closet. Everything had been tossed. My laptop had been smashed into a thousand pieces. Protocol dictated we call in the locals. But that would have been a waste of time. We reported the break into the front desk. What do you want me to do? The clerk filed her nails and shrugged. You were the only one with a key other than the maid and she left hours ago. Returning to the room, I scooped up my laptop, what was left of it, to secure the hard drive, and we loaded up in the SUV. I don't think we're welcome here, Murph. Maybe we need to drive a little further. Shaw leaned his seat back and fanned his face, and we should have known better. But it had been many years since a community let us know we weren't welcome. Birmingham. It's a decent-sized city. I'm sure we can find a nicer hotel there anyway. After checking in at a Holiday Inn Express, Shaw let me use his laptop to access my email. None of the murders seemed to fit the modus operandi that I thought fit Mercy's alleged group. There was a missing woman in New Orleans whose house mysteriously exploded. A frat boy in Atlanta was shot after a bar fight. Two hit and runs, which would leave forensic evidence exposing the killers, and the list went on. We were running out of options.
Chapter 23 Sylvia's massive hangover made her difficult to deal with. Mercy dropped her at the cave entrance, swapped jeeps, and headed to the house. Two old, rusted-out Ford trucks were blocking her parking space. Rachel came highly recommended. So, who was in her house? Reaching under the seat, she grabbed a forty-five and tucked it in the back of her pants before getting out of the jeep. As she approached the door, it jerked open. Virgil, Rachel's father, stood with a rifle. Welcome home, Missy. Seems you got yourself a little problem. What kind of problem? She looked over his shoulder to see Rachel sitting on the couch, rocking herself. You got fed sniffing around here looking for someone. He stood blocking the door. Mind if I come in my house, Virgil? He stepped aside, but stayed close as she entered. Now why are the feds here looking for someone while you're gone? He tapped the butt of his gun with his fingers. <laughs> Mercy noted the shaken girl looking as if she would come unraveled. Rachel, are you okay? I thought they were going to kill my family, she sniffed. Where's the dogs? She asked, noting that they weren't barking, nor were they running to greet her. I had to lock them in your bedroom. They tried to bite my brother. She looked like she was going to cry. Locking the dogs away was not part of the deal. Sitting on the couch next to Rachel, Mercy looked up at Virgil. I'm so sorry, sir. I honestly thought I'd gotten rid of them. My lawyer got a restraining order. They're not supposed to harass me anymore. Sylvia was waiting in the cave. Mercy had to get these people out of her house. They said they weren't looking for you, he said as he shook his head. You got someone else here. She shrugged. That makes no sense. It's just me and the dogs. Reaching in her bag, she pulled out her wallet and handed Rachel a wad of twenties. Thank you for watching, my girls. It means a lot. I'm so sorry you and your family got mixed up in this, but I'm so relieved no one was hurt. Why the hell was her father at her house and who owned the other truck? The brother? Where was he? That's a lot of money, Mercy, Rachel said as she stared at the wad of cash. Just thank the nice woman for her generosity, girl. Don't you know nothing? Virgil grabbed her arm. Mercy fought the urge to elbow him in the nuts. Get on out of the tub, boy. It's time to go. Tub? He was soaking in her tub? What kind of person soaked in another's tub while they were gone? A few moments later, another man zipped up his pants as he rounded the corner. Rachel's brother smiled and waved at Mercy. Thanks for the bath. Ours ain't that nice or that deep. In an effort to get them the hell out, Mercy gritted her teeth and waved him off. I'm glad you enjoyed it. What was the FBI playing at, claiming they were looking for someone else? There was no way they knew about Sylvia. When Rachel and her family finally left, Mercy opened the door to the cave, then raced upstairs to free the dogs. Just as she happily greeted her girls, her cell phone rang. Mercy, it's Betty. She scratched Bertha behind the ears. Hi, Betty, what's up? Girl, you have a problem. The feds were here. They have a picture of you, and they said it was a photo of a woman they're looking for. Sylvia something or other. Mercy's heart felt as if it had stopped. I think I bought you some time. They headed out of town toward Birmingham, but they're coming back. Betty was quiet for a moment. You're not in any trouble, are you? Mercy walked into her office and hit the button wiping the hard drives. Not that I know of, but thank you for the call. I need to call my lawyer. The FBI is supposed to stay away from me. She hung up with Betty and grabbed a bag. She ran downstairs and grabbed Sylvia by the shoulders. Hung over or not, get your ass in gear. The feds know you're alive and they were here looking for you. It's time to go. Now, grab your shit. Sylvia's eyes were filled with terror. No, no, I can't go to jail. We have a plan. Remember, we have a full action plan. Now get your things and move quickly. I'll take the girls with me. You take the spare jeep. I'll meet you at the other place. Just go, fast as you can. Mercy's heart was thundering as she ran back to her room. She'd planned for this, but didn't expect it to happen so soon. Slinging the bag over her shoulder, she called the girls. The three of them ran outside to the jeep. Once they were loaded inside, Mercy sped out of the drive.
Her eyes darted between the windshield and the rear view in search of anyone following. She prayed Silva made it. She prayed she'd get out of this alive. Their meeting point was a small cabin that Mercy rented on a lake in Chattanooga, but Sylvia was hung over with barely five hours to sleep it off. The rule was to turn the cell phones completely off until they were close to the destination. Checking on Sylvia was not a possibility now. Hopefully, she could make the two-hour drive without trouble. While exterminating the guilty, she never felt scared. Adrenaline didn't soar through her veins. She'd remained calm each time. But now, now that it was her life, her family, her stomach ached. Her shoulders throbbed with tension. Anxiety caused her jaw to clench as she fisted the steering wheel. Beads of sweat caused her shirt to cling to her, despite the fact the air conditioning was blowing frigid air in the vehicle. She desperately wanted to call Freddy, who no doubt received some sort of electronic notification that the system he built was completely wiped. He'd know. He'd know she was in trouble and on the run. This was exactly why she couldn't allow the relationship to go any further. There was no way she could drag anyone else down with her. Everything felt as if it were crashing in. But the girls in the back seat were depending on her to hold it together. Their lives depended on hers. Sylvia depended on her. There was no way she could allow an alter ego to make her decisions. She had to be in control of her faculties. Sylvia is alive. We live together, she said aloud. We have coffee together every morning. We just took a vacation together. She is depending on you. Keep it together, Mercy. Thankfully, they had a whole pile of money and a plan in place. They could do this, if only Mercy could hold it together. Rose's motorhome seemed like a great idea now. Stay mobile. Don't settle. Maybe it was better to travel the countryside, seeing all it had to offer. That just wasn't her style. Her heart ached. She loved her house. It was perfect. Now she had to abandon it. She had to abandon the people she spent months getting to know. Twice. Twice she left her life behind. What did she have left? Chapter 24, Murphy I'd expected a week's stay in Birmingham, maybe longer. But the next day when we went back, there were no vehicles in the drive. Shaw and I approached the house armed with a warrant. Weapons drawn, we approached the house. I knocked. Monday. Special Agent Murphy Morgan, I have a warrant for the arrest of Sylvia McDermott. I yelled out as I tested the doorknob. It was unlocked. We went inside, clearing the house room by room. I checked the bedroom and the office. Both were clear. Clear! Shaw called out. Murph, you gotta see this. I kept my weapon drawn as I followed his voice to the basement. What? Look, he said, pointing at the floor. What am I looking at? He knelt down. I followed suit. Look at this tuft of dog hair. It was moving as a breeze blew over it. You smell that? Taking a deep breath in, I detected moisture, sulfur, and something I couldn't put my finger on. That isn't a bookshelf. It's a door. He grinned. Now why would our girl need a secret hiding spot if she were so innocent? We went back upstairs. I went to access the computer to look at Google Earth. The screen was blackened out. When I went to turn on the CPU, a DOS prompt blinked. It's been wiped. I couldn't help but smile. Mercy was a formidable opponent. Shaw tapped his cell phone. When I realized he was calling the judge to get clearance to get a team in, I wanted to leap for joy. It was about time we had a break in the case. We continued searching the house as we waited for the team. The secondary bedroom in the basement was decorated in sugar skulls, completely different from the rest of the house. There was a set of scrubs laying on the floor of the closet, clothing spilled out of drawers and they'd left in a hurry, tipped off by the gun-toting rednecks they'd encountered, or the bartender who was all too fond of their suspect. The town historian unrolled a topographical map on the dining room table. This property houses the old McClooney Cave. It was discovered in 1840 but wasn't opened to the public until 1927, but was shut down the same year. The public didn't lay eyes on it again until the 60s when a new owner tried to turn it into a profitable tourist center. It closed in the late 60s and has been closed since. 
An agent from the Birmingham office approached. Agent Shaw and Morgan. The carpenter has the entrance opened. We quickly made our way to the basement. The bookshelf was pulled open just like a door. A narrow path twisted around jagged rock. We entered and followed the trail which forked off in numerous places. I chose to follow the conduit above head. They'd need electricity for a hiding spot. The path began to widen until we reached a small waterfall. The pungent odor of sulfur invaded my nostrils. The rotten egg stench dissipated as we followed the path away. When finally, the cave opened into a giant room. To say it was majestic would have been an understatement. There was a riser where living quarters rested. From the entertainment system to the furniture, it was quaint. There was even a fireplace that rested under a tunnel that opened straight up toward the sky. A small kitchenette and water filtration system lined one rocky wall. This is amazing. I couldn't have agreed more, but I wasn't there to sightsee. There's a pile of vomit over here. One of the agents called out, and so one of them was sick, that would slow them down. Does anyone here smoke? I called out, anyone? Finally, one of the agents raised his hand. Would you please light up for me? I stood and waited as he lit his cigarette and watched the smoke. Murph? Shaw nudged. Why are we watching him smoke? The cloud of smoke he blew out rose and shifted behind us. That way, I said, pointing in the opposite direction. We followed another narrow hall that wound around. As I looked at the floor, I noticed numerous foot and paw prints in the dirt. We were close. Finally, we reached the end of the cave as it opened up to a grassy area, heavy with tire tracks. This had been their getaway, the whole thing planned for an escape. The perfect property, I gasped. We'd lost them. Mercy had won again. But I had a warrant for the arrest of Sylvia McDermott. Once that was plastered on the news, I'd find those girls. They had a lot to answer for. This has been Broken a Vigilante Series, Book One Written by Kim Mulliken and Anita Cox Published by Sin Publishing and produced using Eleven Labs by Kim Mulliken No part of this audiobook may be reproduced without written permission. All rights reserved. We hope you've enjoyed this book.